Okay, hi. Good morning, everyone. Oh, so lovely to see you all, yeah. A big smile comes on my face. And today and tomorrow, two days, we are having this face-to-face -face marathon revision for CA final paper one FR. And we'll be completing all the chapters, all NDAs, whichever are there in our syllabus. So nothing will be left out. Now, coverage, how we are going to do is, we'll have all the theories, the concepts which are there and all important questions, whichever are there in your material, which you have marked it, they are also to be covered over here. Now, those people, anyone who has not studied from me, who has referred some other book, okay, fine. So, whichever material you referred, I'll request you to keep that material only with you. So you don't have to go for a new material of mine or revision material of mine. You just keep the material which you have referred. And those people who have studied from me, you keep our material which you have referred, that only open. Now, over here, I have a separate revision material. But that is nothing but your material cut short into something. Like few questions which I don't want to cover in class. So rather than scrolling, I've just deleted it. It's like nothing different. So it's not like you need to have that revision material. If you want, it's there in the same Google Drive link. Uh, if you go to our Telegram channel, I've given you a Google Drive link of the material. In that link, you will find the revision material also there. But absolutely not required. It's the same material what you are having. Few questions which I don't want to cover today that are just deleted from it. Any queries from your side before starting? And I hope your preparations are going full-fledged. And any doubts, anybody, uh, online people, are you able to hear me properly? Am I audible, visible properly? Just tell me, yes, we have 70 people who have joined online also. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I move ahead, a mandatory bit marketing, I'll just <laughs> cover up that. Uh, see, we are starting a new way of coming out in Unacademy, like we are having now the subject by subscription available. So many of you are knowing, like currently we used to have only that whole group subscription. Now it's subject by subscription, which will be available. The lectures now will be high quality studio recording, like we used to have earlier when we used to sell pen drive and Google drive, the same format we are moving. But we'll have a dedicated live doubt solving sessions, which will be there on a regular basis. So every weekly, a live dedicated doubt solving sessions will be conducted. Plus, we'll have lots of revisions, etc., which will be conducted over here. Uh, printed material will be available. We have two types of subscription. One is plus and iconic. Uh, iconic, we give a printed material. As of now, the problem in iconic was the rate of plus class and iconic was too huge difference. But now in this, when we come to Iconic, it's just the material cost which is actually being added. So this becomes a good deal for the students. And individual sub uh, subject, if anybody wanted to take, that becomes always better. So this is basically the features, latest studio recording, live doubt solving sessions, evaluated test series, printed books, and we have a Discord doubt solving. Discord is nothing but one type of social media other than this Telegram. Okay. Shalom, let's move ahead. We go to... The index. Now, what are the topics which we are going to cover today? I'm just marking that so that we are able to understand this is what we are covering today. Remaining portion all will be done tomorrow. This index is same as ICI index. Our material, I use the same index. So, today we are going to finish this chapter number 2. That is NDS 1, NDS 34, NDS 7. Chapter 2 will be done. Chapter number 5, that is NDS 20 and NDS 102. Then we will finish up chapter number 7. That is your NDS2, NDS16, 116, 23, 36, 38, 40, 105. Probably 116 might be pending. Yeah, this might be done tomorrow, probably. I feel we might not be able to complete this. And then we will be doing chapter 13, business combination. Chapter 14, consolidated financial statements. Chapter 15, Analysis of Financial Statement, 16, Integrated Reporting, 17, Corporate Social Responsibility. The target today is Chapter 2, Chapter 5, Chapter 7, and then 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This is for today. All remaining chapters will be done tomorrow. Let's begin. So, be excited. Keep on replying. Keep on shouting. Be at home. Okay. Now, I'm starting with, first of all, introduction to NDAs. Whenever we started the subject, this was the first thing which I actually started with. The same thing will be going in the same sequence, which we generally did in class. Okay. Now, see, companies have started raising money world over. Like, 
we know reliance has raised money from uh, basically your facebook reliance has raised money from other international investors so we need a global standards which becomes comparable for everybody like when someone sees reliance ke account they want to compare not just with the companies in india they want to compare it to the world other companies which are also there in the similar line so we needed a global standard for that global standard this basically ifrs was there now ifrs is set up by whom so there is a international accounting standard board now earlier it was basically a iasc international accounting standard committee which was a london based group they came out with some international accounting standard now iasc was restructured and they are renamed as of now to iasb the international accounting standard board is there and they are coming out with international accounting standards now the thing is once they are restructured they came out with some further standards so iasc came out with international accounting standard once they are restructured they came out with some further standards which are known as ifrs so my question with ifrs coming is the old international accounting standard gone or they are still there they are still there so old international accounting standards are still there as well as ifrs are the new standards additional which are issued uh, if it is the same topic the old standard has been removed so if you see old standard now usme name was ias 1 to ias 41 but if you find in that ias 1 to 41 few are missing reason few are missing is with the introduction of basically ifrs on the same topic that ias was basically removed okay so this is basically the thing we have today ifrs as well as your ias both are prevalent today now when we use the word ifrs it means the ifrs which are issued by iasb it in means also includes your ias which were issued by iasc and the interpretations which are issued related to both fine now we understood for this global standard this ifrs came up so can i say every country we want global so every country has to follow it so every country has to move towards ifrs two options one we directly adopt ifrs whatever they do we directly take it second option is we come out with our set of standards which are based on ifrs that we call it as convergence yeah that we call it as convergence what india has done we have converged to ifrs so we came out with our set of standards which are based on ifrs which we call it as indas so if i just go down if you see the definition of indas indas are nothing but ifrs converged standards which are issued by central government of india under the supervision and control of accounting standard board of ici and in consultation with nafra clear so there are total ias 1 to 41 and there are ifrs 1 to 16 now in india we use the word indas so we have indas 1 to 41 same way now we can't have basically ifrs waha pe there was a different word so we have for ifrs indas 101 to 116 so our place we are having in ds1 to 41 and then we have in ds101 to 116 theek hai now the word carbon carve out this is important the definition was important and now this carbon carve out what is this carbon carve out see we have converged to ifrs so can i say we are trying to have some changes which might be required based on our country scenario so we have taken okay we have taken the base of ifrs but bit bit modification is done as per the indian context and that modification what we do now that's basically the carbon carve out okay so now what is carve out something what is there in ifrs we changed it if they give one treatment but we are giving some other treatment that is known as carve out simple example uh, like suppose we have a gain on business combination so gain on bargain purchase which is there under business combination we take it in capital reserve they take it in pnl so can i say that's a difference so what they have we changed it that's basically carve out what is carve in we added something like we have accounting for ccbc common control business combination they don't have so they don't have only if you open up ifrs you not find only that appendix related to ccbc we added what we added is known as carve so something which they have we changed it is carve out something which they don't have but we added that is carve in now sometimes they have two options and we removed one option imagine ifrs is giving two options of accounting treatment and we removed one of the options so is that a carve out no the removal of option is not a carve out because still what we are following is what's given in if okay they gave two but still one is what we are following is of them only that's why that's not carve out understood carve out carve in okay next this is the road map for implementation how basically this indas starts so we know that it came up first of all for companies other than banks nbfcs insurance companies so for normal companies it started 
it was voluntarily from 1415 onwards 1415 onwards it was just voluntary basis 1416 onwards it became mandatory for whom listed as well as unlisted having a net worth 500 crores or more if you see here listed net worth 500 crores or more unlisted net worth 500 crores or more this is 1416 and if it applies to you if suppose a company has a net worth 500 crores or more if it applies to them it also applies to their parent to their subsidiary to their associate to their j now remember if it applies to me it is my parent my subsidiary my associate my j i'll come to this again now this was 1416 onwards now 1417 onwards it became applicable to all listed as of today all listed company even a net worth of 1 rupee or negative net worth they have to follow in days but unlisted way it is now the net worth 250 crores or as of today, it is all listed and net worth 250 crores or more for unlisted ones. And if it applies to you, it applies to your parent, subsidiary, associate, chief. That's my question. If I am covered under NDAs, my subsidiary has to follow NDAs? Okay, question. My subsidiary is subsidiary. Is it my subsidiary? Yeah, subsidiary, subsidiary is also your subsidiary. Though your subsidiary, subsidiary also has to follow NDAs. Okay, but now. If you are covered, your subsidiary has to follow in days. Now, subsidiary's associate, not your associate, subsidiary ka associate. Do they need to follow in days? As per the roadmap, answer is no. Because as per the roadmap, the clearly word written is, if it applies to you, it is you, your parent, your subsidiary, your associate, your J. Not my subsidiary's associate, or not my JV's associate, or not my associate ka associate. To them, practically, is different thing but uh, roadmap wise it doesn't apply but problem kya hoga? can i say they all fall under one group if they all fall under one group problem will be whenever the consolidated financial statements are to be prepared there will be a problem so what they can do so like subsidiaries associate for their sfs purpose for their sfs purpose they can follow the normal accounting standard but for the purpose of cfs they will be required to give the figures which are as per in days. So either they maintain a dual set of financial statement or they voluntarily follow in days. So either they have to have two sets maintained. SFS ke liye they are following basically the normal accounting standard and for CFS because their, their parent, I told you no, they are my subsidiaries, so unke liye they have to give figures which will be as per in days. So either dual set or voluntarily they will also follow in days. So practically subsidiaries associate, I am telling you practically subsidiaries associate will also be following in days because otherwise they have to maintain dual sets any doubts anybody till now fine okay now those companies which are not covered in the list above they continue to follow the normal accounting standard uh, if you are listed on sme exchange small and medium enterprise exchange for you in days doesn't apply the listed may the sme exchange is not covered okay just one minute i need to close this window okay then, uh, if you are applying in days, in days has to be applied to your standalone as well as consolidated both. I cannot have my standalone financial statement as per AS and consolidated as per in days. It has to be for everything. Uh, so, part AS, part in days, few in days I follow, few in days I don't follow, that is not allowed. You have to make an explicit, unreserved statement that you are complying with in days. Achha, whenever we shift to in days, now they say 1416 onwards, it became mandatory for 500 crores and above. But problem is, whenever I am preparing our financial statement, we know one year comparative is to be given. So even though I am starting from 1416, can I say 16, 17? But comparative will be, can I say 15, 16? Comparative also has to be as per in days. So indirectly, if it is applicable to me from 1416, effectively it gets applied from 1450. Clear? Okay. Once applicable, always applicable. This is important. So once in days becomes applicable to you, it's lifetime applicable. Imagine my parent was covered under in days. My parent, you can I say if they are covered, subsidiary also has to follow in days. So I was also following in days. But now, now I'm no longer their subsidiary. If I'm no longer their subsidiary, still I need to follow in days because once applicable, lifetime applicable. TK, if you fulfill the net worth or listing criteria, it doesn't apply just to you, your parent, your subsidiary, associate, JV. We discussed all this. Now I have a question. There's a company in India, they have a net worth more than 250 crores. Can I say India supplies? Okay, they have a parent in US. Now, 
NDA applies to you. I told you it is applicable to your parent, your subsidiary, your associate, your JV. But problem is your parent is where? US. So whether that US parent will also follow NDAs? No. So normally it applies to your parent, your subsidiary, your associate, your JV. But if a parent is overseas, to them it doesn't apply. Yeah, the clear? Now question. Uh, there's a company in India. To them, India is applicable. There's a company in India. India is applicable. They have a subsidiary in US. Okay. So can I say when it's applicable to me, it's applicable to my subsidiary also. But now subsidies, can they file NDAs wale financials with SEC? Wahan pe they have Security Exchange Commission. No. So for their purpose, what they will do? They will follow the rules and regulations of their country. But for the purpose of consolidation, they will give me financial statement which will be based on India. So can I say they have to maintain dual set. So if parent is in India, they are covered under India subsidiary abroad. They have to maintain dual set. Okay. Subsidiary is in India which is covered under India parent abroad. They don't have to maintain dual set. Reason. Subsidiary is in India. Subsidiary don't have to consolidate. Now where to consolidate? Parent, parent abroad hai, unke liye it doesn't matter. So now dual set would not be required. Clear? Okay. This is done. This is done. NDAs does not apply to foreign parent. Okay, this was for a normal company. Now coming to our MPFCs. Now banks and insurance companies still today are not covered under your NDAs. So they came out with basically a notification that NDAs doesn't apply to banks as well as insurance company till the time it is further announced. So NBFC clearly it has came up. Now NBFC, how it is applicable? One for 18 onwards, the same way it was listed 500 crores or more, unlisted 500 crores or more. And one for 19 onwards, all listed, unlisted is 250 crores or more. Similar way, but just the dates are different. Upper it was 16 and 17, here it is 18 and 19. Yeah. Voluntary adoption for bank insurance companies, NBFCs is not allowed. For them, there is no option of voluntary adoption. So, sir, NBFC wanted to adopt NDAs from one for 16 only. Can they do it? NPFC wanted to adopt NDAs from 1 for 16 only. Can they do it? Answer was no. Voluntary adoption is not there for them. Fine. Now, there is a company which is covered under Section 8. Okay. Section 8 company. Now, Section 8 company. First of all, do they need to follow accounting standards? Yes. Accounting standards. Leave NDAs. Yes. Okay. Now, Section 129 of your Companies Act. Section 129 of Companies Act says the financial statement shall comply with accounting standards. And for you, if your net worth is 250 crores or more, can I say you will be covered under your NDAs? So for you, NDAs will be applicable. So whether Section 8 companies are required to follow NDAs, answer is yes, if they fulfill the criteria. If criteria is fulfilled, to them it is applicable. So here we have to explain Section 129, then we have to explain roadmap, and then we need to give a conclusion. This question has already came. Okay, now, uh, this parent is P, they have three subsidiaries, A, B, C, Achha, actually C is associate of JV, C is associate of JV. Now, that is, A has a subsidiary X, A has an associate Y, and B has a subsidiary Z. Okay, if out of all this, they are telling, A meets the criteria. Okay, so A is listed, or A has a net worth 250 crores, or others don't have it. But now question, if it applies to you, it applies to whom? Your parent. So can I say now P has to follow? Okay, then to your subsidiary, your associate JV. So can I say it applies to X, it applies to Y. So can I say this B and C, they are not my subsidiary, they are my parent ka subsidiary, parent ka associate. If it applies to me, it applies to my parent, my subsidiary, my associate my JV. So, can I say to this three, it doesn't apply? As per road map, it doesn't apply. But the problem will be, can I say ultimate parent, they are following NDAs. If ultimate parent are following NDAs, so they will be preparing a consolidated financial statement for the entire group based on NDAs. So, now if this three people, B limited, C limited, Z limited, don't prepare, the problem kya hoga? For standalone purpose, they can follow normal AS. But for consolidation, they have to give data as per NDAs. Either they maintain a dual set or they voluntarily follow in this. Clear with this? So, B, C, Z as such not required, but practically they will also be following. Otherwise, they have to maintain dual set. Okay, next is computation of net worth. Now, they told you na, net worth 500 crores or more, net worth 250 crores or more. Question comes from which date net worth we need to see. 
See, applicability started from 16 and 17. 1416, 1417. So they are telling you see a network as at 31st March 14. Which date's net worth? 31st March 14. How to calculate net worth? It's basically your capital plus your reserves minus your fictitious assets. Reserves may don't take revaluation reserve. Which reserve is not to be taken? Revaluation reserve is not to be taken. Otherwise, it's basically the same way we calculate. So that way we have to calculate the net worth 31st March 14. 31st March 14, if your net worth is 250 crores or more, it will be applicable from 1417 onwards. If 31st March 14, the net worth is 500 crores or more, it will be applicable from 1416. Now question, sir, my net worth is only 100 crores on 31st March 14. So can I say I don't fall under phase 1, phase 2? But now later on, today, 2022, in 2022, my net worth has crossed. So, if you are not covered on March 14, then you have to check your net worth at every year end. And the year in which the net worth has crossed 250 crores, the next year onwards, the index becomes applicable. The simple example, we have this year currently over March 14, uh, sorry, March 22. So, 21, 22 year got over. 21, 22, our net worth is 300 crores. So, can I say now we crossed? Earlier, we had not crossed. So, now 1422 onwards, that's 22, 23. 21, 22 we crossed, so 22, 23 onwards, now we have to follow index. Play with this. Okay, this was net worth. Now, division 2 of schedule 3, we know schedule 3 is divided into 3 parts. Division 1 applicable for companies following AS, division 2 applicable for companies following NDS, division 3 is for NBFCs which are following index. Done. Okay, let's go to your chapter number 5, unit number 2, that is share based payment. Enjoying? We'll cover everything. Don't worry. All concepts, everything will be covered with all important questions also. Okay, now going to chapter 5, unit number 2, share based payment, India is 102. Now, what do you mean by the word share based payment? It's payment based on price or value of share. It doesn't mean I give shares. If I give you cash which is based on price of share, that is also covered under share based payment. Now, how do we have the share based payment? So, mostly the share based payment is given to employees, ESOPs. Uh, it can also be to others. Imagine I purchase a goods and I am paying by shares. Possible. So, that is also covered under your share based payment. Anywhere, anywhere you give shares or you make payment based on price of shares, both are covered under the word share based payment. Now, how do we account? Uh, see, accounting standard, the normal one, there is no standard relating to basically share based payment, but our NDS, we are having NDS 102. So, this chapter you had in inter, how are you accounting? Guidance note. So, there was a guidance note which is issued by ICAI, based on that the accounting was done, but now we will not account by guidance note. If NDS is applicable, accounting has to be done as per NDS 102. What is the difference between that guidance note and NDS? I will come to it. Now, the definition share based payment arrangement is important. It is an agreement between entity or a group entity. Now, here the group means only a parent and subsidiary. Group covers only parent subsidiary. Associate JV are not covered in group. It is an agreement between entity or a group entity and another party, which entitles another party to receive. Which entitles another party to receive what? Cash or asset, which is based on price of equity instrument. Or they get the equity instrument. So either I give them shares, mine or my group entity. So can I say I can give my shares or my parent shares or my subsidiary shares. So other party is entitled to receive equity instrument of me or my group entity. Or other party is entitled to receive cash or asset. But the amount which I pay is based on price of shares. So either you are giving shares or you are giving cash based on price of shares. Clear with this? This is a share based payment arrangement. Now the word share based payment transaction. Arrangement kya tha? where we are paying like this. That is the arrangement between you and some other party. Now, what is a transaction? Can I say in a transaction, you there will be some goods or services. I buy some goods or I get some services. So, what is a transaction? It is a transaction in which the entity, you, you receive the goods or services and you are paying buy shares or you are giving cash based on price of share. It is a transaction in which entity receives goods or services in a share based payment arrangement or you do not get the goods or services, your parent or your 
subsidiary. Can I say group entity receives the goods or services? Group entity is receiving goods or services, but you have an obligation to sell. So my parent receives goods, I am paying. Or my subsidiary receives goods, I am paying. And how I am paying? By shares or by cash based on price of shares. So either you receive goods or services or you incur an obligation to settle where a group entity receives goods or services. Clear? Okay. Now, uh, they say it has to be an agreement. If you see the definition of share-based payment arrangement, it's an agreement between entity, group entity or other party. So if at all the terms are not yet finalized, can I say there is no agreement? If there's no agreement, can I say there's no share-based payment arrangement till now? So it is not covered under 1-0. So imagine ESOPs, we have planned the ESOPs, the terms are decided, not yet communicated to employee. So can I say it will not be covered under 1-0. Okay, now, we are services, we are giving shares or cash based on price of shares. Is it mandatory that what goods we are getting, the fair value of goods and the shares what we are giving, the fair value of shares should match? Not necessary. The fair value of goods or services received and fair value of shares which are issued might not match. If the goods or services are 100 and fair value of shares is 80, don't think that I'm giving only 80. There is something. If there is no matching, you assume there is some un, uh, basically the word is unidentified goods or services. So goods are of 100 and shares are of 120. So think there is 20 rupees something else intangible also which is received by. Simplest example is whenever I give my shares as charity. Okay, if shares are given as Charity, the people say, sir, what is the goods or services we got? When you do charity, can I say there is some kind of uh, market when news comes that this company gave this much for charity. So that's creating a brand image for you. Can I say indirectly some unidentified thing is received that way? Okay, fine. Now what is not covered under India's 102? Uh, transaction with shareholder in capacity as a shareholder. Okay, so I have my shareholders. To them, I come out with the right issue. If I come out with the right issue, they will be giving me cash, I'll be giving them shares. But this is not covered. So, transaction with shareholder in capacity as shareholder is not. But imagine from a shareholder, I'm buying goods. Is it possible my shareholder can be my supplier? Yeah, it might be in related party wala thing, but shareholder can be a supplier. If I bought goods from my shareholder and against the goods, I'm giving him shares. Is that covered under 102? Yeah, that is covered because that is not in capacity as shareholder, that is in capacity as a supplier. Clear with this? Okay. Then whenever we go for business combination, we acquire some entity, can I say we give them shares, we take over your assets and liabilities, I'm giving them shares. That is actually covered under share-based payment, oh, share-based payment, but accounting will not be done as per 102, accounting will be done as per 103, that's excluded from 102. Third one, contract to buy or sell non-financial items. Now, what is a non-financial items? See, uh, financial item, we have a definition which was covered under your 109. The financial items may financial asset, if I want to say, the financial asset is basically something we as is cash, investment in equity shares or a contractual right to receive cash or cash equal. So, when I have a contractual right to receive cash or cash equal and that's a financial item. Now, I have this air condition. Do I have a contractual right to receive cash from this AC? No, it can give me cool air. <laughs> I can use the air and I cannot basically get cash from it. Huh? So the thing is debtors I have, so debtors I have a contractual right to get cash. Loan I have given to someone, I have a contractual right to get cash. So they are basically contractual right to get cash. Sometimes if I have given a deposit to someone, upon the contract will be over, the deposit will be paid back in cash. The deposit is going to be paid back in cash. That's a financial asset. But my PP, my intangibles, my inventory. Can I say till the inventory is sold, I don't have a contractual right to receive cash. Once it is sold, it's not an inventory only. Then it becomes that is Till it is sold, I don't have a contractual right to receive cash from anyone. So that PP, intangibles, inventory, they are all my non-financial items. Now imagine you have a contract to buy or sell non-financial item. Now, there was a contract done. I'll purchase some goods from you. I'll give you shares. I'll purchase some goods from you. I'll give you shares. Is it covered under 102? I'll purchase goods. I'll give you shares. Yeah, as such, yes. But the thing is, goods will come. I will give shares. That is covered. But imagine the contract is not to be settled by getting goods, paying shares. It is just to be settled in net amount in between. Like imagine goods ka price went up. You pay me the differential amount. Shares ke price went up. I pay you the because I was to get goods, 
If goods ka price went up, it should favor me. You were to get shares. If shares ka price went up, it is favorable to you. So if goods price went up, you don't give me goods, I don't give you shares. The difference you give me in cash. If shares price went up, difference I give you in cash. If that type of thing is there, then it is not covered under 102, then it will be covered under 1. So normally goods will come in, shares are to be given, that's covered. But if that is contract which is to be settled in net amount, then that is not. We have this. Fine, perfect. Next. Now, recognition. See, there's a word recognition date. There's a word measurement date. See, what is recognition date? Is Recognition date is the date on which we record the transaction. Date on which we record. When do I make a journal entry for it? So, suppose I entered into ESOPs. I entered into contract with employees that I'll be giving you shares after three years. Should I pass any entry today? I entered into a contract that I'll give you shares after three years. You have to work for three years, I'll give you shares after three years. Do I need to pass any entry today? No. No. Recognition date is the date when you are getting goods or service. So day one, I have not got service. Now, employees have to give me service over three years. And that's why the ESOP expense is recognized over three years. So, day one, I won't be, be making entry because the recognition is when the goods or services are received. Did you understood? Goods or services are received. Take it. Now, I understood I have to record when goods or services are received. If goods are received, goods debit. If fixed asset is received, fixed asset debit. If services are received, like employees key service, the employee benefit, expense debit. Question, what should I credit? What should I credit now? If I am going to give you shares, if it is equity settled, then it will be to SBPR. But if it is to be cash settled, then I will be crediting SBPL. SBPL is a liability. The corresponding increase in equity, when do I have a corresponding increase in equity? If it is a equity set. Uh, corresponding increase in liability, the employee benefit expense debit to SBPR, yeah, to SBPL depends on whether it is equity settled or cash settled. Now question, when do I say it is equity settled? When do I say it's equity settled? If I'm going to give you shares, is it only equity settled? Fixed number of shares. Okay, now fine. See, if I'm going to give you shares, okay, that is fine. Second thing, if I don't have a obligation to settle, still it is equity settled for. Imagine subsidiary getting employee service, parent is going to give them shares. Who is going to give them shares? Imagine parent is going to give them cash based on price of shares. The parent is going to give them cash based on price of shares for subsidiary still it is considered as equity settled. Reason? Subsidiary does not have a obligation to settle. So when do I say, when do I say it is equity settled? Either, either you are giving your own equity instrument, either you are giving your own equity instrument or you do not have an obligation to settle. I repeat, subsidiary, employees are working with subsidiary. Who is going to give the shares? Parent. If parent gives shares or even if parent gives cash also, na, still for subsidiary, it will be equity set. Ha. Parent ke liye, parent is giving own equity instrument, parent gives shares, equity set. Parent gives cash, for parent it will be cash set. It is possible, subsidiary accounts it like equity settled, parent accounts it like cash set. Did you understood? So, what is equity settled? If you are giving either your own equity instrument or you do not have an obligation to set. Fine. Now, corresponding increase in liability, if it is a cash settle, that is fine. Okay. Now, uh, thing is, whenever we are going to give you equity, imagine, so I am getting goods or services, I am going to give you shares. They say that you should record it. We understood recognition date is when I am getting goods or services. Now, question at what amount? Can I say now measurement? Aagya? So, value. Value will be what? The value will be fair value of goods or services received or fair value of the shares which are given. I repeat, I am getting fixed asset, I am giving them shares. Question is, at what value should I record? Fixed asset to equity share capital, whatever it is. It's fair value of fixed asset received or fair value of shares which are issued. It's fair value of goods or services received. I repeat, it's fair value of goods or services received. So for equity settled, you should measure Pele word tha, recognize. This was recognized. This is measure. Did you understood? So, record kap karna hai when you are getting goods or services. At what value to record? 
it is you should measure the goods or services received at the fair value of goods or services received unless that fair value cannot be determined properly then you can take the fair value of shares which are to be given but if it is equity in a cash settled if it is cash settled it will be measured at the fair value of liability then it is measured at fair value of liability jo mujhe cash pay karna hai that is the value at which i should record clear if it's equity settled it's fair value of goods or services received fine now uh whenever basically it's a equity settled whatever measurement value we have taken it is not to be remeasured again and again because equity ka value shares value keep on changing so we don't remeasure it again and again but if it is a liability settled it has to be remeasured the liability will always be brought to its current value so if you remember esops mein we don't remeasure but if it's sar stock appreciation rights we used to remeasure the fair value of sar which was determined on graph chart fine now one more thing uh, this was measurement ka value now i take measurement date okay they say value should be of goods ka ya shares ka if it is equity settled its fair value of goods but which date fair value okay fair value of goods but which date when i am receiving that goods so if i am getting goods or services if i am getting goods or services and i am giving them my shares i have to record when when i am getting goods or service at what value fair value of goods or service which date fair value the day when i receive okay but suppose if it's esops employee can i say i'll be giving them shares after 3 years and employees are giving me service now in that case can i say 3 years service which i am getting i'm not able to determine properly the fair value of service so in case of esops the fair value of service cannot be determined that's why if you see yahan pe word written was unless that fair value cannot be estimated you will take what the fair value of shares okay so esops may the fair value of services cannot be determined i'll be taking fair value of shares question which dates fair value grant date so waha pe it is not like you are getting service in first year second year third year so you will not record like that waha pe it is grant date clear with this there's a new question which is added by ici which they are asking one is called uh, basically recognition date and second is called measurement date the recognition date is date when you should record when you are getting goods or services measurement date is the date whose value you should take if you are getting goods or services the measurement date will be the date when you are getting goods but if it is esops now the measurement date will be of grant date for esops the measurement date is grant date. clear with this okay Okay, now what do you mean by the word grant date? Grant date is a date when you come to an agreement. जब आपने agree किया, that's basically your grant date. If agreement is subject to approval, then in that case the grant date will be the date of approval. Imagine we board came out with some ESOPs. It was communicated to employee. Employee agreed, but it is subject to approval of shareholder. Then in that case it will be once the shareholder approves. Then next is employee share based payment. employee share based payment now employee share based payment we have three types so share based payment to employees are of three types one is called esop second is called as sar and third is espp three things okay now under esops are we giving shares now or in future future so we will be giving shares to the employees in future at a fixed rate the so fixed rate pay i'll be giving you shares but not today in future that's basically your esops okay what is esp pp espp may be a giving shares to employees right now you know whenever ipo comes if any company comes out with a ipo they have a employee quota so in that employee quota all employees can basically fill in it's not like you should have worked for 3 years you should have worked for 5 years esop may there's some wasting condition you stay for 3 years then you can get the shares espp may it is part of ipo or company completed 25 years they're very happy and they're giving shares to all employees 100 shares at a discounted rate so espp means the shares are given now only there is no wasting period the difference between esop and espp esop may there is a wasting period espp there is no wasting period sar sar may the we are not giving shares to employees will be giving cash based on price of shares so whatever is the price above 150 after 3 years whatever is the price above 150 after 3 years that much i'll give you in cash if price is 200 i'll give you 50 rupees in cash if price is 300 i'll give you 115 cash so that is basically your s now how do we account for esop we go to accounting for esop
Okay, this one question again, I take it. Uh, sir, how do we get this material? I'm telling you, whatever material you referred, keep that only. This material is the same. But uh, whatever questions I did not want to discuss today, I just skipped it. Otherwise, this material, the material which you are having is absolutely same. Still, if anybody wants this material, you have our uh, Telegram channel. In that Telegram channel, wherever I have given you the link for material, you go to link for material, you go to FR, in that revision material, you'll find this. Thing. Now, ESOPs. Uh, under ESOPs, the shares are to be given to employees when? In future, at a specified rate. So, on grant date, suppose we came to agreement on 1st April 21. They have to stay for 3 years. And I'll be giving them shares at 20 rupees. Exercise price is the price at which we will give them. Okay. Today, the price is 50. Today. Today, price is 50. I'm not going to give them today. I'm going to give them after 3 years. So, now, question. Is employee really getting a benefit of 30 rupees? Today, price is 50. I'm going to give them at 20. Are they really getting a benefit of 20? Answer is no. Because they're not getting today. Nah. They'll be getting after the actual benefit to employ will be what will be the market price when they are taking exercise so it's market price on the date of exercise minus exercise price that's the actual benefit to employ and whatever is actual benefit to employ can i say it's my loss so the loss is my expense which i have to book it and now see i book it over the period remember recognition date was when we are getting goods or services so i have to book a loss over the wasting period now, the thing is, they will work for me for three years. The actual loss will be known in fourth year when they actually exercise. So, the thing is, I have to record over three years, but I don't have the actual expense in three years. The actual expense will be known in fourth year. So, sir, how do I account? How do I account? So, over here, in day says, see, actually two options are there. One is called intrinsic value of an option. Other is called fair value of an option. But our intrinsic value of an option is not available under NPS 102. In your guidance note, both the things were there. In your guidance note, which you are accounting in IPCC intermediate, that both options were there. But under NPS 102, they have only fair value of an option. Now, so what is intrinsic value of an option? You see today, as they close, intrinsic value of an option is price minus what rate work we are going to give. If I want to have intrinsic value of option on grand date, grand date price minus what rate I will be giving. Them. The intrinsic value is price minus what rate I am going to give. Them. Intrinsic value kaun se din ka, which date. So, if I say intrinsic value of grand date, grand date market price 50, I am going to give them at 20. So, intrinsic value on grand date is 30. The one you record 30 rupees over 3 years. Second, Second is you try to figure out what will be the market price in future because that's the actual loss. What will be the market price in future we are trying to estimate. When we are trying to estimate, suppose I feel the market price in future will be say 100 rupees and I am going to give you at 20. So, can I say indirectly you will be getting a benefit of 80. Now, 80 can I say what benefit is? That's the fair value of the option. You have a right to buy something at 20 rupees. So, a right is worth how much? The right is worth 80 rupees. 80 rupees is not the fair value of shares. 80 rupees is not fair value of shares. 80 rupees is the fair value of right which you are having. The right is worth 80 rupees today. So, this fair value of option will be determined on which date? Grand date. So either you take intrinsic value of grand date or you take fair value of option of grand date. Now, in days 102 does not allow you. Intrinsic value, you have to mandatory use the fair value of option on grant. Clear with this? Okay. Now, someone asked me, sir, we thought market price will be 100. We are going to give them at 20 rupees. So, we booked 80 over a period of 3 years. We booked 80 over a period of 3 years. Now, fourth year when they are taking the market price was not 100. Market price was 150. The actual benefit was not 80. Actual benefit was 130. Would we account that extra 50 benefit? You understood? I repeat my question. We pehle we thought the price will be 100 after 3 years. We are going to give them at 20 rupees. The fair value of option on grand date was 80. And that 80 rupee was recorded as expense over a period of 3 years. But now when 3 years are over, they are actually exercising. The market price is 150. So 150, but they are paying us only 20 rupees. So can I say they got an actual benefit 130, but we recorded expense only 80. Would we record another 50? Answer is no 
we are not concerned with the actual market price at the time of exercise reason the exercise today today morning they exercised at 130 now after one second only the price would have changed you know yesterday how the markets basically reacted we have india and nifty indian nifty is also listed in singapore stock exchange we call it as sgx yesterday there was an inflation data of us the inflation data was come it came a bit higher side the inflation data came our nifty sgx nifty because inflation data us mein aaya wo raat mein tha at night so sgx nifty started and it fall by 300 points immediately after half an hour it went up by 500 points so imagine the num price movement which would have came so when i say that actual price was 130 later on it's 130 is at that moment after one second again it will be 130.5 it might be 129.9 it will be different the so actual market price we are not concerned what we are concerned is we accounted how we booked the expense 80 rupees over three years plus we got 20 so we think that 20 we have got 80 is the expense which you booked so we are basically having a total of 100 rupees the shares are treated to be issued at 100. shares are treated to be issued at 100. and the fair value of option which we decided on the grand date is not to be remeasured under equity settle but if it was a cash settle it will be remeasured okay with this so, sir, why are we not concerned with the actual market price? Dear, it keeps on fluctuating every second. There is no point basically sticking to that. What you have basically thought of, 80 is expense, what we are booking, what you estimated, 80 expense plus 20. So, 100 rupees is the price at which you are issuing shares. Fine. Guidance note gives you both the option. In days 102 allows only the fair value of an option. Journal entries. Now, now, journal entries. First of all, when I grant the option, can I say I have not yet got the goods or services they will be giving me in future? So, there is no entry. Okay. Now, every year, first year they gave me some service. Second year they gave me some service. I will book an expense. Now, how do I book an expense? The fair value of an option which I had basically taken, that is to be booked. Suppose it was 80 for 3 years, so probably divided by 3 kind of. So, I am booking expense, employee benefit expense debit. And if I am going to give you shares, can I say it is equity settled? So, I will write 2 SBPR bracket equity. Where this will appear? SBP other equity. This will appear under other equity. It will not appear under liability. It will appear under other equity. Fine. Now, every year end, the expense which your book goes to PNL. But whenever we are passing entries, for exam purpose, ICAI does not pass entry for transferring the expense to PNL. We will also not be transferring. Well, the exam angle will not be there. Practically, always the expense will go to PNL. Okay. Now, <coughs> So, we have done an expense to SBPR. We have done expense to SBPR. Expense went to PNL. What happens to SBPR? It appears under other equity. Kab tak? Till the time they are exercised or lapsed. Okay. If they are exercised later, can I say SBPR will get converted into capital? Okay. If at all, future may the employees are not exercising. If employees are not exercising, can I say they are lapsed? We booked the expense. We booked the expense. Now, expense is not coming. So, we had already booked it. The opposite effect was given in SBPR. Expense has gone to PNL. After three years, if employees are not taking shares, can I say we do reverse? Now, reversal will not go in PNL. Reason? Because reversal is not one year ka expense. Right? It's how many years? Past three years. Ka if I'm reversing now, and if I give it in this year, it will give a huge impact. The reversal will always go in retained earnings. Retained earnings is again a part of other. Okay, this is done. Now, when options are exercised in future, okay. Whenever options are exercised in future, so suppose if employees are exercising, we have booked 80 rupee, we are getting 20. Bank debit is the amount which you are receiving from employee. SBPR you had credited earlier. Can I say now shares are given to them? So SBPR will get converted into capital. The SBPR is debited. That loss borne by company that is a fair value of an option we would have booked. Two, equity share capital is face value, securities premium is the premium. And I told you, we are not concerned with the actual market price which is going on today because it keeps on fluctuating. We are just concerned with how much we are receiving and what was the loss which was book price. The shares are treated to be issued at amount received from employee plus the loss bond price. Okay, if the employees are not taking up the shares. Now see, there are two words. One is called as unwasted option getting lapsed. Second is called as wasted option getting lapsed. Now see, expense which we are booking, the expense which you book will be based on the latest estimate and the latest information available. I repeat, 
the expense which you book will be based on latest estimate and the latest information which is available now sir what is this latest estimate now tell me one thing day when i granted option there are 500 employees do you think all 500 will stay for three years no so should i book expense for all 500 or i should book expense for the number of employees we are expected to fulfill the wasting condition expected to fulfill and uh, do I have to book expense on basically day one or I have to book first year end, second year end, third year end? Okay, the first year end, second year, third year end. The first year end when I'm booking, so can I say I already know the actual how many left in first year? But uh, I'm in first year end. So second and third year, how many are going to leave? I need to estimate. So use latest information. First year ka actual available, use that. And for second and third use, estimate. And then you find out number of employees who are expected to fulfill that three years condition. But uh, when I come to second year end, can I say now actual of second year is also known? So first year we know, second year we know, but third year how many will go? We use estimated. Yeah, that clear? <coughs> okay. Now, if unwasted option, if employee leaves in between only, so can I say if employee leaves in between only, our estimate how many will fulfill wasting condition will change in between? So can I say it gets automatically covered while booking subsequent expense? So if employee leaves in between during that three years only, unwasted option getting lapsed it is automatically covered while booking subsequent expense but if wasted option gets lapsed he was there for three years full expense is booked and now he doesn't take it then i have to pass a reversal entry reversal entry will be sbpr debit to retained earnings okay next Just. now the word types of condition now what is this types of condition uh, we give shares to the employees, but they have to fulfill certain conditions. Now, conditions are divided in two parts. One is called as wasting, other is called as non-wasting. Okay, first of all, what do you mean by the word wasting condition? Wasting conditions are further divided in two parts. Wasting, non-wasting. Wasting are divided in two parts. Service condition, performance. If they have to stay for three years, it's called as service condition. Now, second word is performance. Now, performance is again divided in two parts. Which are the two parts? Performance is divided. Market non-market related okay if i say that if i say that whenever share price of our company or share price of our parent or share price of our subsidiary when share price reaches 100 rupees you will be getting the shares so this is based on what share price share price is known as market related but if it is based on your internal performance like whenever your production reaches this level or whenever your sales reaches this level or whenever your ebitda or whenever your profit profit they are all internal if it is internal performance condition they are known as non-market now tell me one thing which you can predict better market or non-market non, -market? non -market. see market nobody can predict yeah see even if company is doing well covid came up when covid came up can you say market slashed by 40 percent so our share price also went down by 40 percent see tata motors was available at 60 rupees today tata motors is what 400 rupees so even though the tata motors was doing fine but the thing is due to covid everything went down we cannot predict that things so whenever it's a market when it's a market related performance condition they say whenever share price will reach 100 you will get the shares okay whenever share price will reach 100 can i say i'll estimate so which date i'll estimate which date i'll estimate when my share price will reach 100 Ma i'll be estimating on grant so day one grant date call estimate when my market price will reach 100 say for example i estimated after five years okay would i review the estimate every year no for market related performance condition, don't basically reassess the total wasting period which you have estimated on. Reason is there is not in your hand, you can't predict the market properly. So why break your head into something which is we can't do? So if it is market related performance condition, we try to estimate the total wasting period on grant date, it will not be remeasured. But if it's a non market internal performance, how is our sales doing? How is our production doing? Can I say that we know? what steps we are taking for that, that is all in our hand. So that will be remeasured every year. If I ask you a question, the wasting period will vary. The wasting period will vary. When? If it's a market related performance condition or non-market related? Non-market. So for market related performance condition, it will not be varied. We, whatever we decided on day one will keep same. Now someone asked me, sir, we thought five years ke baad price will be 100. What if price became 100 in three years? Can I say you are booking one fifth every year? Okay, the first year you book one fifth, second year you will book one fifth. Now it reached hundred in third year. Remaining expense you book it in. Third. Now, sir, what if price becomes hundred after eight years? 
You booked over how many years? Five. Now, sixth year, seventh year, there is no expense. Sixth year, seventh year, there is no expense. But uh, the shares have, well, the options have not lapsed. I just said that whenever price reach 100, so options are not lapsed. So don't reverse the SBPR. Keep it. Sixth year, no expense will be booked. Seventh year, no expense will be booked. Ah, eighth year, they are wasted now. Eighth year, the SBPR gets converted into capital. But uh, if I say, if market price at the end of fifth year is 100, then the options are given to you. If market price at the end of fifth year, then the thing is I have to see the market price at the end of fifth year. If it is not 100, then it gets lapsed. You see, there are two different things. Whenever price reaching 100 and fifth year end, the price reaching 100. Did you understood difference? If it is whenever price reaching 100, fifth year end, don't reverse the expense. Whatever you booked in five years, keep it. SBPR is there. Sixth, seventh year, no expense will come. Eighth year, it gets converted into capital. But if question says fifth year end, it should be 100. So fifth year end, if it is not 100, then you reverse it. Did you understood? Because that's one of the important questions. Okay, the so wasting was divided as service and performance. Performance was divided again into two parts. That was market related, non market. Non market related will remeasure the wasting period every year. Okay, now coming to the non wasting condition. Now, sir, what is non wasting condition? They are all the other conditions which are also to be fulfilled in order for other party to get the share based payment. If other party wants a share based payment, they also have to fulfill that other. So, this non-wasting condition they are other than service and performance condition they are other than service and performance for example i tell you when inflation problem is inflation nowadays if inflation becomes less than five percent okay if inflation index becomes less than five percent okay is it based on share price no is it based on your internal performance no so can i say it is other than wasting yeah, this will fall under non waste so, this will fall under non wasting whenever inflation becomes less than 5%. Now, again, are you a good person to predict inflation every time? Is it there in your hand? So, again, when inflation will become less than 5%, I'll estimate on granting. Okay, would I remeasure that estimate? No. So, can I say this treatment is similar to the market based performance condition? The non market condition, non wasting condition, the accounting treatment is similar to market based performance condition. We don't have to remeasure it because wahan pe again we can't break the head into something which is not there in our head. Okay, let's move ahead. Variation wasting period we already did. This is basically only when it is a non-market related performance condition, there will be a variation wasting period. If it's a market related performance condition, there won't be a variation in wasting period. Fine. Now, question. <coughs> this all questions are there in your material. Few selected I'm covering over here. Ankita holding INC, 100 shares to 500 employees. Uh, waste as first year if earning increases by 12%. Second year, if earning is not more than 20%, the word will be 20% or more. We have changed in our class. So, 20% or more, so it will waste in second year. And if earning is more than 22%, 22% or more, then it will waste in third. So, see, it will waste in first year if the earning is 12%. If it is not 12, can I say now it is not wasting in first year? Can I say now wasting period may be 2 years, maybe 3 years, depending on how will be the income for next year. Let's see the question. Okay, first year earning is only 10%. So can I say it did not waste in first year? So now wasting period, we know. When we are in first year, I know wasting period is not one year. It can be two, it can be three. Depends on what we are expecting in next. If you see, they have clearly given the company expect a similar rate of earning in next year. So you earn 10, you are again earning 10. So can I say total became 20. So now company expects the shares will waste at the end of second year. Okay, so now when we are doing our sum, when we are doing our sum, we have the table created. Uske andar, the total wasting period. When we are booking expense for first year, I should take the total wasting period as two years. So, in the first year, when I am booking the total well, the expense, the total wasting period will be taken as two years. Half needs to be booked in first year. But when I actually came to second year, the earning did not increase by 10%. Total was only 18. It did not become 20. So, can I say now I understood wasting period is not two years. Now I understood it will be 
three years. So when I was booking expense for first year, my estimate was wasting period will be two years. The total wasting period taken was two years. But when I came to second year, now my total wasting period is not two years. It became three years. Did you understood? Shall I move ahead? Okay. Same way, uh, if I just go to number of employees who are expected to fulfill wasting condition, 29 left in first year. And we are expecting additional 31 to leave in second year. So when we were in first year, what is the total wasting period? Two years. Okay, two years. Out of out of 500 already left is 29. And I'm expecting in second year, 31 will leave. Because when I was in first year, the total wasting period was only two years. So I have to just see how much already left and how many are going to leave in next year. But when I came to third year, Sorry, when I came to second year, I understood now wasting period is not two years, wasting period is three years. So now when I came to the second year, second year end, so I know how many actual left in first, how many actual left in second and I will take estimate of third. But when I come to third year, now I have the actual of third. So then I will take actual of all these. Fine. Next. Uh, next question, uh, NTTP issued a share based payment plan based on the following detail, number of options are 100, fair value is 25, market condition, whenever share price reach 30, what is the word used, whenever share price reach 30 and you should be there, huh? it should be if you leave the organization, it's gone, but uh, you should be there whenever the share price reach 30, just one more thing, uh, see, whenever it's a wasting condition, uh, performance, whether it's an internal or market related performance, service condition is always linked. What is linked? Uh, price reaching this much or profit reaching this much, but you should be there with us. But for a non-market related, non-wasting condition, for non-wasting condition, the service condition is not. For example, if I tell you, you have to stay for two years, you have to stay for, and third year, if the profit reaches this much, you will be getting shares. So can I say you'll be getting shares when third year end? I said, did you have to stay for three years? If you leave after two years also, and if profit of third year is this much, still you will get it. Still you will get it. So now it's not known as a basically your non-market related performance condition. Now it will be known as non-wasting condition. For a performance condition, service condition is linked. If service condition is not linked, then we will not call it as performance. We will call it as non-wasting non condition. Okay. But here they are telling whenever share price is 30. Okay. Now, we expected when the share price will become 30? 4 years. This is we expected when? Grand date. On grand date, we determine that our share price will become 30 after 4 years. So, can I say we have taken a total wasting period 4 years? Okay, are we going to check it again, again, again? No. Reason? Market based performance condition. We are not going to remeasure it again and again. Now, suppose the condition is fulfilled in 3rd year only. So, 1st year we would have booked 1 fourth kind of, 2nd year we would have booked 1 fourth kind of, 3rd year it is fulfilled. So, now book the remaining expense in third year okay suppose it gets fulfilled in fifth year if it gets fulfilled in fifth year can you still will book the expense over fifth year there won't be any expense but a fifth year condition is satisfied so now sbpr gets converted into capital clear next modification to esop now uh, many times what happens is I granted you ESOFs but afterwards I feel that market may the rates have gone down. I told you I will give you shares at the price of 20 rupees. But imagine market may shares are available at 20. Would you buy from me? No. If market may prices became 15, would you buy at 20? No. So can I say now to change my exercise price? I told you I will give you at 20 but now market may rates have gone down. So now I am telling you I will give you at 10 rupees. Okay. My question to you first. If the exercise price is reduced. If the exercise price is reduced, is it beneficial to employ or no? Yes. If exercise price is reduced, can I say it beneficial to employ? Yes. If something is beneficial to employ, can I say your right ka value has gone up? Thik? Something beneficial to you, fair value of option has gone up. Something against you, the fair value of option has gone down. Okay. If the fair value of option goes down due to modification, it's ignored. If fair value of option goes down. If I did a modification which is against employee, so, fair value of option will go down. Then it is ignored. You continue booking the original expense. Okay? And as per SEBI, as per SEBI, any modification which is against employee, they are not allowed. But that is only for what? Listed companies. Can I say private companies may still do it? Uh, so, any modification which is leading to a decrease in fair value of option, ignore it. But now, suppose due to modification, I reduce the exercise price. Can I say it is favorable to you? It is favorable to you. So, your right ka value has gone 
समथिंग फेवरेबल टू यू आपका राइट का वैल्यू वेंट अप समथिंग अनफेवरेबल द राइट वैल्यू इज गॉन डाउन ओके सपोज आई रिड्यूस द एक्सरसाइज प्राइस द फेयर वैल्यू ऑफ एन ऑप्शन इज गॉन अप नाउ द फेयर वैल्यू ऑफ एन ऑप्शन गॉन अप तो कैन आई से हैव टू बुक दैट एक्स्ट्रा एक्सपेंस नाउ दैट एडिशनल एक्सपेंस विल बी बुक्ड ओवर द रिमेनिंग वेस्टिंग पीरियड आई रिपीट एडिशनल एक्सपेंस विल बी बुक्ड ओवर नाउ क्वेश्चन कम्स हाउ टू फाइंड दैट एडिशनल एक्सपेंस हाउ टू फाइंड दैट इट्स नाउ क्वेश्चन डे 1 when i gave you the right the right was worth 80 rupees because we were expecting a share price 100 and i am going to give you at 20 yada yeah, we started with that i was expecting a share price 100 i am going to give you at 20 the right was worth 80 but now tell me if you are now expecting a price not 100 you are expecting a price of 60 only if you are now expecting a price of 60 you will be getting at 20 so now the right is worth how much what So earlier the right was worth 80 rupee on grant normally we don't remeasure the fair value on grant date but if there is a modification the fair value has to be remeasured so now the original option which you had got which was worth 80 what is the value of original option today 40 okay and now what did i do i reduced the exercise price if i reduced the exercise price so can i say now 40 will become more than 40 It was 60 expected. 60 minus 20 is 40. But now 20 की जगह I make it 10. तो कैसे ना 60 expected minus 10 it becomes 50. तो right which you have is worth 40 today. What was the value of right on grant date? Ignore it. The right which you have today is worth 40. I modified it and now your right is worth 50. तो कैसे I give you extra benefit of that? That is the incremental expense. So after modification, it's only 50 fair value. Now some people compare what sir earlier 80 tha, abhi 50 hai. You don't compare that way. You have to see what the right which you are having is worth today. How much? 40 rupee. I changed it and I made it at 50. 10 rupees the additional expense. So now how do we book the expense? 80 which you are booking grant date wala that will continue as it is. Upon modification, the grant date which you are booking that will continue as it is an incremental. the value of right which you are having today and now the modified one today uska difference that will be booked over the remaining wasting period so whenever we have this modification how many tables do we prepare two, two parts if you see one is original expense original expense 80 rupee will continue to be booked over 3 years and incremental 10 suppose we suppose this modification is done at the end of first year so can i say now remaining 2 years are there so that 10 will be booked over remaining Two years. It will come only in second and third. Okay. The important is how to find the additional cost of modification. Okay. Now just see this question. Uh, Marathon INC basically issued one fifty share option, thousand employees. Fair value of option on grant date is one twenty nine. Take it. Now year first end. They did a repricing. This basically is nothing but your modification. And because the fair value has fell to fifty, okay, fair value has fell to fifty means is the fair value of new option which I am giving modified one fifty or original one today is fifty? Original one today is fifty. But uh, we were not accounting fifty; we were accounting eighty. So eighty is to be booked over three years. That will continue as it is. But now the right which you are having today is worth fifty. I modified it, and now they are worth eighty. So can I say I gave you extra benefit? Third, don't compare with one twenty nine. That is. Accounting, what you are doing is different, and the real benefit which I am giving you is different. See, we were not concerned with market price fluctuation, so we are accounting based on the fair value decided on grant. So, one twenty nine booked over three years, that is continued as it is. But due to modification, the extra benefit thirty given, that will be booked over first year end we did. So, can I say it will be booked in second and third year? This will be only coming in second and third year. Clear with this? Okay. So, total how much expense we are booking? In this question, one twenty nine plus thirty. We are booking a total expense of one fifty nine. Are you clear? Next, cash settled. Now, cash settled basically is the same accounting. Only difference will be instead of word S B P R, we'll use the word S B P L. And second difference will be the fair value of option will be remeasured every year, which was not done earlier. Fair value of option will be remeasured every year. Fine. So that's. the thing now let's see the question related to this okay there is a 10000 sar given uh, on the grant date it was 
on the grant date it was 95 but if you just see one line over here that waste immediately as a good liquor there are 10,000 SARs they are wasting immediately if they are wasting immediately can I say to book the full expense immediately so this is not a question where it is wasting over three years this is a question where it's wasting immediately immediately 10,000 multiplied by 95 I'll book the expense on day one only. reason that waste immediately the 10,000 into 95 is the expense booked now later on lesser people are exercising so, well, the, basically they are telling afterwards at the end of it is expected 95 percent people will exercise then 92 people will exercise finally 89 percent exercised so i booked the expense 10,000 into 95 now first year end my expense well, the liability should be how much now i'm expecting only 95 percent people will take so can i say 9500 employee into now can i say it's sb uh, sbpl i have to remeasure into 112 so my liability now should be 9500 into 112 my already liability was something what is the difference that will come as expense in first year end then again next year now 92 percent i'm expecting so can i say it becomes 9200 into 109 now what was the liability what it is the difference will come in second did you understood the word that waste immediately was important that's why the full expense comes on day one if that line was not there if that line was not there, then I'll book the expense over three years. So next. Okay, now this is a good question. Uh, same, it is cash settled. Only difference is last May they've written one line. If company modifies the term to three years, earlier the term was four years. Earlier the term was four years. It's a SAR as booking basically expense over four years, but only difference is the fair value will be remeasure and see here the word waste immediately is not written i am not booking full expense in first year if you see first year may what we have done is basically your number of employees are 400 into 75 the number of options expected 400 and 75 employees and we would have done into 210 210 first year and into one fourth will be recognized as expense because it's not wasting immediately TK then second year the fair value was remeasured into 2 by 4 karke the expense would have been taken. Expense would book till date minus the expense already booked. TK that was done. Now that is one normal question. Now second if they modify the term and make it instead of 4 years how many years? 3. When did they do it? At the end of second year. Kab kia? Now see uh, some people ask me sir is this modification accounting? Modification accounting comes only for equity settled. I repeat. Modification accounting comes only for equity settled hoga, wo exercise price reduced, increase. That is basically the thing. Cash settled may modification accounting doesn't come because cash settled anyways, the options are always at the current value. We take the current fair value, no? We never have modification accounting for cash settled, it's only for equity settled. So now, sir, how do we account for this? Second year end, you understood my wasting period will not be four years, my wasting period will be in second year only you are booking expense at the end of second year na? so pe now you make it total wasting period as three and two thirds should have been booked till date did you understood how to account for this it's pretty simple just when you are in second year second year may the total wasting period you should take as three years the first year may you took total wasting period four second year may total wasting period is three years shall i move it fine next Okay, this is my favorite. If I was to set a paper, this question will come. Now, uh, the company again has some SARs which are given, but if you see the word written over here, all rights are wasting in December. But they can be exercised, can I say, December 06, they are wasting though. 06 end, they are wasting. People, the employees can exercise when? 7 or 8. So, can I say exercise period is 2 years? Now, SAR hai, so can I say how to remeasure the liability? If at all you take today or if you take after 10 days, the prices would have changed. The so cash which I have to pay also would have changed. Take it. So, few people might have taken in 2007, few people might have exercised in 2008. Take it. And you estimate 10% of employees are going to leave during a period of 2 years. 2 years is wasting period, 2 years is also exercise period. If you see, here we granted on 1105. Okay, 1105. Can I say 05 beginning? Wasting at 06 end. So, 5 full year, 6 full year. The 2 years is wasting period, 2 years is 
exercise period fine now 10 percent actually left in that two years that is fine so we would have booked expense uh, we booked half at the end of first year and then the remaining in second year and first year end the fair value was 12 then the fair value was 8 so can i say now the liability in books is based on 8 rupees now the liability in books is based on 8 rupees yeah that clear now december 7 december 7 when intrinsic value of sar was 10 now intrinsic value is nothing but market price minus excise price when i say intrinsic value of december 7 is today's intrinsic value it's not grand date ka intrinsic value today today the market price minus the exercise price that much cash which i have to pay the intrinsic value was 10 six employees exercise so can i say to six employees i would have paid 10 rupees when they exercised what was the difference going on 10 did you understood A intrinsic value means what is the price today minus exercise price okay if i say intrinsic value of grant date so it is grant date market price minus exercise price but this is intrinsic value of December 07. So December 07 morning. December 07 morning, one person came. He says, I want my cash. And at that time, the differential going on was 10. How much we had booked in our books till now? 8. So can I say for them, I have to book 2 rupees. So for 6 employees, for 6 employees, I have to book 2 rupees. Now, they came in morning of December 31st, 07. Now, when 7 was getting over, night may the differential became 13. See, it's not mandatory like you are coming on December 31st means full day the price will remain same. You came in morning, differential was going on 10, I gave you cash 10. But end of the year, same day, night, May, now the differential is going on 13. Now, I have booked the liability of 8. For the 6 employees, I have to pay 2 rupee extra. For remaining 30, can I say, for remaining 30, I have to convert that liability from 8 to 30. So, for remaining 30 employees, I will book 5 rupee expense. For that 2 employees, I am booking... For six employees, I'm booking two rupee expense. Did you understood? Okay, now question. For that remaining 30, how much is liability now in our books? 13. 13. 8 plus we booked 5, it became 13. Now 13 is there, and when they exercised, the intrinsic value was 12. When they exercised, the intrinsic value is 12. We have booked expense of 13. Can I say one rupee? Reversal comes. Did you understood? Over here, we had booked expense of 8 rupee for everyone. Pele Amara total, we remeasured it, 8 rupee was booked. Now, when few people took, they took 10 rupees. I have to book 2 rupee for them. Remaining, I have to bring it to closing price. Closing price is 13. So, I booked 5 rupee for remaining. So, in the year 07, for 6 employees, I will book 2 rupees. For 30 employees, I will book 5. Rupees. And now, the liability in my book is 13 rupees. Now, when they exercised, it was only 12. So, 1 rupee liability will get reversed and 12 is paid off. Next, share based payment with cash alternative. Okay, share based payment with cash alternative. They can go for cash, they can go for shares, whatever they want. If this is the case, share based payment with cash alternative. Now, Ismail, there are two things. Counterparty as a choice of settlement. Or second option is entity as a choice of settlement. Did you understand? Employee can choose what he wants or company decides what I want to give. Okay, if counterparty has a choice of settlement. Now, what employee will choose? Can I go in the minds of employee? No, we are not Leonardo DiCaprio. We can't insert the minds of people. So, the thing is, we don't know what's going on in their mind. So I don't know whether they'll go for cash, whether they'll go for shares. This is a share-based payment with cash alternative. You can go for shares, you can go for cash, whatever you want. Now, if the counterparty has option, I don't know. So, this will be treated as a compound financial instrument. How it will be treated? Compound financial instrument. Accounting, how do we do? Now, tell me one thing. If I am giving a similar benefit in shares or cash, can I say everybody will choose cash only? Shares leke beche, then again some transaction cost will come up. So, no point now. If you are giving a same benefit both the place, people will always go for cash. But if you are giving some extra benefit under shares, can I say they are motivated to go for shares? So, what I will do is, if you go for shares, you will get benefit for 12,000 shares. But if you go for cash, you will get a cash only differential of 10,000 shares. So, can I say I am motivating you to go for shares? Uh, I am motivating you to go for shares, but you please don't make a fool out of me. It should not happen. You take a shares today and then you sell it off tomorrow. So, I am paid you. I am trying to motivate you to go for shares to give you extra benefit. But I don't want that you should sell the shares tomorrow. The shares which will be issued to you will be generally subject to lock-in. 
So if you go for shares, extra benefit is there, but the shares you cannot sell it for two years or three years or five years, lock in it. The thing is, if at all you are still a shareholder with me, can I say you will work better for the company? Because now you are also inclined, company does well, share price goes up, me, I will also get benefit. So under this share based payment transaction with cash alternative, always under equity settled, extra benefit will be there, but the shares will be always be subject to lock in. Take it. So now on grand date, on which date? Grand date. You find out the fair value of option if everybody goes for equity settlement and fair value of option if everybody goes for cash settlement. Now tell me where the higher fair value will come. I repeat, if everybody goes for equity, how much they will get or if everybody goes for cash, how much they will get. Where the fair value will be higher? Equity. Because I told you an equity mail giving you for more number of shares. Okay, so whatever is the fair value of option on grand date under cash settlement. Whatever is the fair value of option and on grand date under which settlement? Cash settlement. That you treat it as a liability component. And the excess amount coming under equity settlement, excess amount, that you treat it as equity component. Did you understood? So suppose if they are going for cash, the fair value is coming 3 lakh. But if they are going for shares, the fair value is coming 324. So how much is extra? 24. Okay, the 3 lakh you treat it as liability component, extra 24,000 is only equity component. For this 3 lakh liability component accounted like SAR and for that extra 24,000 which was equity component accounted like ESOPs. <coughs> so when we are accounting that 3 lakh as per SAR, can I say that will be remeasured every year? But when we are accounting that extra 24,000 as equity settled, that is not remeasured. So that suppose 24 is to be booked over 3 years, it is 8,000, 8,000, 8,000. Yeah, the clear? Now, suppose sir, at the end, if employee goes for cash, what do I do? Now, we have SBPL also, we have SBPR also. Remember 24,000 is SBPR and 3 lakh was SBPL, but it would have been remeasured. It would have been remeasured. So now imagine remeasure that's 340. So now suppose he goes for cash, can I have to pay him 340? So SBPL you pay it, SBPR you reverse it. Reverse it because now they are going for cash. If they are going for cash, SBPR will get reversed. Okay? Now if they are going for shares, what do I do? Okay, now I tell you one thing. What do they do? Uh, ICI, how they are doing is uh, whatever is SBPR now, whatever is SBPR, that you still transfer to retain earnings. I repeat, SBPR you still transfer to retain earnings. And SBPL 340, na, that you convert into capital. So, ultimately what happens is, uh, if you just, someone has attended my class like 1-2 years back, so what we were doing was, SBPL was converted to SBPR and the whole of SBPR was converted into capital. So, 340 plus 24, 364 was converted into capital. But now what ICI does is, 340 you convert into capital and 24,000 you convert into retained earnings. Ultimately, both are a part of equity only. Uh, one goes in equity share capital, one goes in other equity. So, we need to do what ICI does. So, if they go for cash, SBPL you pay in cash, SBPR is going to retain earnings reversed. If they go for shares also, still that 340 SBPL, SBPL you convert into shares and SBPR you still transfer to retained earnings. Both the cases, 24,000 will go to retained earnings. Are you clear? Shall I move ahead? Okay. So this was counterparty had a choice of settlement. Now entity has a choice of settlement. See, if you have a choice of settlement, you know what you want to give. I want to give shares, I want to give cash, I know, na? So now you don't account like a compound financial instrument. Now you account what you want to do. If I want to give shares, fully you account it like ESOPs. If you want to give cash, fully you account it like SAS. So here there won't be that separate thing. Uh, it was compound financial instrument only when other party had a right. If you had basically the choice of settlement, then you account it either the whole award. The whole award will be either cash settled or equity settled. Okay, now this question we have over here, Tara Industries. Okay, if we check, okay, if they go for cash, it will be for 74,000 shares. If they go for equity, it, can I say they are getting 90,000 shares? I told you, you know, some extra benefit under equity. 
Now, grant date I need to find out. Grant date, see equity is with restriction. So, I have to take the fair value with restriction is 115. Okay, so 90 into 115. Just do it. 90,000 into 115. So if everybody goes for equity, can I say it is coming 1035 and 4 times 0? 1 crore 3 lakh 50,000. Now, if everybody goes for cash, it is 74 into, don't take 115. Shares restriction, hai, the fair value of something which has restriction is lower. Cash mein to restriction nahi hai na. So, the grant date fair value is 135. So, 74,000 into 135. This is coming 9990. Okay, 99 lakh 90,000. That was 1035. So, difference, can I say 3 lakh 60,000 is extra under equity settle? So, 99,90,000 will be treated as your liability component which will be accounted like SAS and extra 360, only extra 360 will be treated as equity component which will be accounted like ESOPs and this is 3 years time. So, this 360 will be divided into 3 years, 120, 120, 120. Okay. Now, if you just see the question, uh, have they given anything like what they are opting? No. Okay. Question is silent, what they are opting? So, suppose uh, this 99.90 would have been remeasured, remeasured. Tell me, what is the expense which came at the end third year? Mein? Total, total. Third year total expense is how much? Uh, under cash settled. Liability component. 1 crore. 8 lakh. So, it was 99.90 was remeasured to 1 crore 8 lakh. Suppose if they go for cash, so can I say that 1 crore 8 lakh will be paid off and that 360 will be transferred to retainer. Okay, if they go for equity, if they go for cash, if they go for equity, still what will happen? That 1 crore 8 lakh will get converted into capital, not cash, it will be converted into capital and 360 will still go to retainer. Did you understood? 360 will still go to retainer. It's fine. This is done. Next one we are having is cancellation settlement. We'll finish off this chapter, then we take a small break, 15 minutes. Okay, now cancellation and settlement. Uh, many times the ESOPs are cancelled in between. Now tell me, whenever I cancel the ESOP, would I make some payment to employee? And generally what I should pay them? Can I say fair value of option which is going on today? If I'm cancelling today, I should pay you at least what? The fair value of option going on today. Now you would have booked some expense. Like suppose your ESOP was for 3 years, so can I say you book some expense in first year, second, third, that way you are booking. Now suppose you cancelled in second year. Whenever you cancelled it, the remaining expense has to be booked immediately. First year you booked one third. Now second year you are cancelling, so full remaining expense you book it immediately. Okay, expense book ho gaya. Now, you are paying something. You are paying something. Now whenever I am paying, if I pay up to the fair value of option on the date of cancellation. I am not telling what was booked by you. You booked based the fair value of which date? Granted. You booked the base fair value of granted. Leave that. You have booked 100 rupees. It's possible. Now, fair value of option today is 80. Up to the fair value of option, if I pay you 80 rupee, that you debit to SPPR. If I pay extra, the extra will go in PL. Imagine the fair value of option today is 80. If I pay you up to 80, SBPR debit. If I pay you 85, so SBPR debit 80, PNL debit 5. To bank, 85. Did you understood? So, first of all, whatever expense you are booking, you are booking some fair value of grant date. You continue that. Whenever they are cancelled, the remaining expense has to be booked immediately. Now, you are paying something. When you are paying something up to the fair value of option on date of cancellation, that much you debit to SBPR, extra you debit to PNL. Even though SBPR may balance is there, like we had booked 100 rupee, now we are paying 85. So, still you can't debit 85 to SBPR. Fair value today is 80. 80 debit in SBPR and extra 5 you debit in PNL. Now, sir, what do I do? 100 was there in SBPR, 80 debited now, still 20 remain. Now, the 20 SBPR will get reversed once the cancellation is. Did you understood? Okay. So, this is basically whenever we have a cancellation. Achha, if it is a liability, if it is SAR which are cancelled, if it is a SAR which are getting cancelled, you have to remeasure it based on today. If it is a liability, go bring it to today's rate and then what you are paying? If you are paying the same amount, fine. If you are paying more, extra will go in. So, whatever I pay up to the fair value on the date of 
cancellation that much is debited to SBPR or that much is basically you are paying SBPL extra will always go in PL. okay then now this point is there which is actually not there in the sum but I just cover it uh, many times this ESOPs are cancelled I am giving you a new ESOP these ESOPs are cancelled I am giving you new ESOPs so can I say these are basically replacement kind of done so ISCA accounting will be done in a similar manner as modification these are cancelled new are given so this will be accounted similarly like modification yeah the clear so original expense what you are booking you continue as it is now the ESOPs which are getting cancelled, the fair value today and the new ESOPs which I am giving, uska fair value today, the difference. If there is an increase, can I say that increase is to be booked over the remaining wasting period. If it is a replacement, then in that case it will be considered as a modification. But just one thing, imagine this ESOPs are cancelled, this ESOPs are getting cancelled. I am giving you a new one plus I am giving you some cash. Okay, so now pay attention. Current ESOP had a fair value 20. Current ESOP had a fair value 20. I am paying you 2 rupee cash and I am giving you a new ESOP which are worth 25. What is the incremental cost? 7. How come 7? Reason out of 20, can I say 2 to I already paid you right now? So net it was 18. And the new one which I am giving is 25. The total will become 7. Clear with this? Shall I move ahead? Again, I am telling you the current ESOPs are worth today worth how much? 20 rupees. I am giving you a new ESOP which is worth 25 plus I am giving you 2 rupee cash. So, indirectly, if you see out of 20, 2 rupee already paid. So, this became 18. 18 and the new one is now 25. So, 7 rupee is the additional cost. So, this is if there is a replacement. This are cancelled and new are given. Fine. Next. Okay, come to this question, Anara Fertilizers. Okay, Anara Fertilizers, uh, we had some 2000 option given to 10 directors and they are to stay for 3 years. Fair value is 130 on grant date. So, can I say we will be booking 130? We will be booking 130 and we are expecting 8 directors to remain. So, we would have booked expense for 8 directors, 2000 into 8 into 130. This was the total estimated expense. And we were booking over how many years? 3 years. So, can I say first year, one third would have been booked? Okay. Now, second year, problem happened, we are cancelling. If problem happened, we are cancelling. Can I say remaining expense has to be booked in second year only? And now, when we cancelled it, at that time, there were 9 directors. So, can I say now 2000 into 9? 2000 into 9 into 130. That's the total expense. Out of that, whatever is booked in first year, you remove. Remaining all comes in second. Okay. So, now we have booked the expense actually 130. If you say, how much is lying in SBPR? 130. For how many directors? 9 directors. But now, upon cancellation, the fair value on the date of cancellation today is 19. How much we are paying them? Uh, see, market price on date of cancellation is of no use. I am not concerned with the share price. Okay, fair value of option. The right which you are having worth today is 90. I am cancelling the right and I am giving you 90. Fine. So, can I say I paid you more than the fair value of option today? 90 will be debited to SBP. Our extra 5 will go in here. Yeah. 90 will be debited to SBPR, extra 5 will go in PL. Now, someone asked me, sir, we have 130 in SBPR. How much you had in SBPR? 130. Out of 130, 90 we debited. How much still remained in SBPR? 40. What do I do with 40? Reverse it. It will go to retained. Done. Next is a group share based payment plan. Next is group share based payment plan. Now, what is a group share based payment plan? Well, uh, one entity receives goods or services and the another group entity will be making payment. So, holding company receives goods or services, subsidiary is making payment or subsidiary is getting goods or services or holding company is making payment. I told you group includes only your parent and subsidiary. Now, the clear? Take it. Now, how do we account for this? Everybody has to see whether it's equity settled or cash settled for them. So, holding has to see from their side, subsidiary has to see from their side. And if you remember what was equity settled? Or I have no obligation to settle, then it is a equity settlement. Okay. Okay. So everybody has to see basically from their end. Now, if I just go down, see, parent issues its own shares for share based payment plan of subsidiary. So who is getting goods or services? Subsidiary. Okay. Is subsidiary paying? No. 
पेरेंट विल पे तो कहने से सब्सिडी इज नो ऑब्लिगेशन सब्सिडी इज नो ऑब्लिगेशन टू पे तो कहने पेरेंट है पेरेंट इज गिविंग व्हाट ओन शेयर्स तो फॉर पेरेंट आल्सो इट इज इक्विटी सेटल तो सब्सिडरी के लिए इक्विटी सेटल बिकॉज़ नो ऑब्लिगेशन टू पे फॉर पेरेंट इट्स इक्विटी सेटल बिकॉज़ इट इज पेइंग बाय ओन शेयर्स ओके नाउ चेक नेक्स्ट सपोज इन दिस केस ओनली सपोज इन दिस केस ओनली इफ द पेरेंट वाज पेइंग बाय कैश if the parent was paying by cash based on price of shares the parent was paying by cash based on price of shares for equity can I, for subsidiary can i say no obligation to settle to a subsidiary it will be still equity settled but for parent now they are going to pay cash so for them it will be cash settled so it can be different for both now one question if parent pays for subsidiary if parent is paying for subsidiary are they going to claim from subsidiary later no so see if i have to receive from them i can debit subsidiary account but i am not going to receive from them so what do i debit investment so when parent pays for subsidiary it's treated as investment in subsidiary so parent will pass the entry investment in subsidiary account debit to sbpr or to equity share capital if the shares are given now equity share capital if shares are to be given in future to sbpr and now if cash is to be given to sbp l but they are debiting what see parent did not get the service who got the goods or services so expense will come in subsidiary book expense is debited in subsidiary book but shares are given by parent to do sbpr or to equity share capital that comes in parent what will parent debit investment in equity and what subsidiary will credit capital contributed by parent so in stand alone books in stand alone books parent ki book mein investment in subsidiary will go up and subsidiary book capital contributed from parent will go up but in cfs that will get Not in CFS that will get not. Yeah, that clear. Shall I move it? Okay. So if parent pays for subsidiary, it is accounted as investment in subsidiary capital contributed by parent. But if subsidiary pays for parent, if subsidiary pays for parent, it will be accounted as dividend paid to parent. So if subsidiary pays for parent, the employees are working in parent. The employee benefit expense comes in parents book. But a parent is not paying; subsidy is paying to do equity share capital or to SBPR or to SBPL. That will come in subsidy. So now, what will parent credit? Parent will credit dividend received from subsidy. What will subsidy debit? Dividend paid to parent. So simple words: If parent pays for subsidy, it is investment in subsidy, capital contributed by parent. If subsidy pays for parent, it will be dividend paid to parent, dividend received from subsidy. Clear with this? okay last point is accounting for reload feature now the sum has not been asked till now but if someone wants to make a bit trickier paper this can come up what is a reload feature uh whenever i give esops to employee can i say they have to pay me the exercise price they have to pay me what exercise price generally exercise price is paid by how cash generally but if employee pays me the exercise price not by cash but by our company ke own shares we already has shares of our company bought from market or previous esops or something like that so for the current esop he has to pay me exercise price rather than paying cash he is giving me the shares of company own then in that case he will be automatically entitled to another esop equivalent to the shares he is giving me so for exercising the current esop For exercising current ESOP, rather than paying cash, what is giving me the shares? He might be having shares past me purchase kiya tha ya past ESOPs he had got. So he is giving me exercise price not in cash but by the shares of company. So whatever shares is giving me as exercise price to that much shares, he becomes automatically entitled to another ESOP that is called as reload feature. Now question comes sir, how do we account for reload feature? तो करंट ईसॉप में राधर देन पेइंग एक्सरसाइज प्राइस इन कैश ही हैज अ ऑप्शन टू पे एक्सरसाइज प्राइस बाय शेयर्स तो हाउ डू वी अकाउंट नथिंग नथिंग टू बी डन तो करंट ईसॉप्स में नथिंग टू बी डन नाउ ही बिकम्स एंटाइटल्ड फॉर अनदर ईसॉप्स हाउ टू अकाउंट फॉर दैट अनदर ईसॉप दे आर जस्ट अकाउंटेड एज इफ इट्स अ न्यू ईसॉप तो रीलोड फीचर इज जस्ट अकाउंटेड लाइक अ न्यू ईसॉप वंस दैट रीलोड फीचर इज गिवन टू हिम मींस वंस दैट न्यू ईसॉप्स आर गिवन टू करंट ईसॉप्स में देर इज नो डिफरेंस एट ऑल तो इन सिंपल वर्ड रीलोड इज अव शेयर ऑप्शन ग्रांटेड वेन अ शेयर इज यूज टू सैटिस्फाई द एक्सरसाइज प्राइज ऑफ प्रीवियस ऑप्शन फॉर दिस करंट ईसॉप्स इज नॉट पेइंग बाई कैश द एक्सरसाइज प्राइज इज यूजिंग 
shares of our company only so that much shares you will become automatically entitled for another ESOP it will just be accounted as if it's a new option grant any doubts anybody with share based payment need a break 10 15 minutes or shall I continue okay we take a 15 minutes break and then we start so every one and a half two hours we'll take 15 minutes break and then we'll start again uh, those people who are referring online we are meeting back after 15 minutes probably for 15 minutes you might see the screen is blank okay Okay, now let's move ahead. <clears throat> we did introduction to NDS and we did NDS 102. NDS 102 generally comes for a 8 mark. So, one question generally will be there from NDS 102. Now, going to Schedule 3. So, we'll be doing Schedule 3 together with that NDS uh, 1 and we'll be doing Chapter number 15, Analysis of Financial Statement. These three things together. These three things generally has a weightage of around 10 to 12 marks. Now, in your schedule 3 i am just doing division 2 because division 1 is not relevant for exam purpose exam division 1 will not come up it's only division 2 is only relevant for us okay now if there's a conflict between your index and your schedule 3 what will prevail if there's a conflict between index and your schedule 3 Normally, we say that statute always prevails, but the first line which is given under Schedule 3 is if there is a conflict between NDS and Schedule 3, NDS will prevail. So, NDS is going to prevail, except now there is one exception given over here, except the option of presenting assets and liabilities in order of liquidity. Now, say NDS 1 gives an option of presenting the balance sheet in order of liquidity or in the order of permanence. Now, see when I start with PP, can I say it's order of permanence and cash is coming at end? But if I start with cash, can I say that becomes order of liquidity? NDS 1 allows you to follow in order of liquidity or order of permanence. But Schedule 3 has made it very clear that normally if Schedule 3 and NDS has a conflict, NDS prevails except the option of presenting the assets and liabilities in order of liquidity. The question, can a company prepare balance sheet in order of liquidity? Can a company prepare balance sheet in order of liquidity? No. Your NDS allows, but Schedule 3 doesn't. Even though there is a conflict, pe only for this thing, only for this thing, what will prevail? Schedule 3 will prevail. Okay. Now, the disclosures which are given over here, they are in addition to whatever disclosures which are there in NDS. So, NDS disclosures will apply, plus this disclosures will apply. That is fine. Now, the figures, whenever I am giving the figures, do I need, can I give the full figures? No, the mandatory rounding off is there. So, if you just see over here the word rate, uh, depending on total income, the figures shall be rounded off. So, can I say there is a mandatory round off? Okay. Now, uh, the word written over here is total income. Earlier, it was basically depending on total revenue. Now, they have just replaced the word with total income. Total income includes your revenue from operation as well as other income. Achha, now, sir, how rounding off should be done? If at all your turnover or total income, not turnover, if your total income is up to 100 crore rupees, less than 100 crores, then you may round off to nearest 100, 1000, lakhs, millions. So, nearest round off has to be 100, 1000, lakhs or millions. Okay, can I round off the rupees in tens? No, not allowed because it has to be 100, 1000, lakhs or millions. And if your total income is 100 crores or more, then you have to round off to nearest lakhs, millions, crores. Okay, imagine my total income is 120 crores. Our company's total income is 120 crores. Can we round off rupees in 1000? No, because if it is 100 crores or more, it has to be lakhs, millions or crores. Did you understood? Okay, corresponding figures are mandatory. Uh, whatever format we have under Schedule 3, that gives you the minimum disclosures which are required on face of balance sheet PNL and notes. These are the minimum things. Additional disclosures, if you want to do, that can be done. Fine. Now, the format of balance sheet, we already know about it. I am not going into that. Uh, it starts with asset. Division 2 starts with asset and then comes your equity and 
liabilities. There's a concept known as <coughs> financial asset, financial liabilities. So under your current asset, non-current asset, there's a word called financial asset. Under your current liability, non-current liability, there's a word called financial liability. The financial asset, financial liabilities are the word which is there. Now, what do you mean by the word financial asset, financial liability? It's defined under India's 109. The financial asset is any asset that is either your cash and cash equivalent, investment in equity instruments, or contractual right to receive cash or cash equivalents or other financial asset. If I have a contractual right to receive cash or cash equivalent, that's a financial asset. So my debtors, my loans which are given to someone, they all will come under your financial asset. Cash and cash equivalent will come under financial asset. Investment in equity will also come under financial. Okay, if I invest in debentures, do I have a contractual right to receive cash? If I invest in debentures, yeah. So contractually, I'll be getting interest and my principal. So that investment in debenture will also come under your financial asset. So financial assets will include your cash and cash equivalent, investments, it will include debtors, it will include your loans, that all will come over there. Achha, non financial assets, I already told you, where I don't have a contractual right, like your PP, your intangibles, your investment property, your inventory, you don't have a contractual right to receive cash. Okay, your financial liability. What is a financial liability? It's a contractual obligation to deliver cash or cash equivalent or other financial asset. You have a contractual obligation to deliver cash. So for example, creditors. Can I say I have a contractual obligation to pay? Loans taken. I have a contractual obligation to pay. So they all will come under your financial liabilities. Fine. Now, <clears throat> what is current asset? What is current liability? I'm coming to that. Uh, there's one more thing over here. Uh, if you see investment property comes on face in your division one investment property was a part of your non-current investment here it comes on face then there's a concept called as biological asset we have a in days 141 which is on agriculture so biological assets are living animals and plants they are living animals and plants but if you see over here the heading written is biological asset other than bearer plant. what is a bearer plant bearer plant is where the plant will remain plant is not to be basically removed the crops we only well, the fruits we get it from that plant like mango tree chikku tree coconut tree the tree will remain what we are getting is fruits so that bearer plants they don't come over here that bearer plant will come under pp bearer plant will be coming under your pp other than bearer plant will be coming over here financial assets we already discussed financial liability we discussed now your cash and cash equivalent is divided in two parts if you see one is cash and cash equivalent second word written is other bank balance so, whatever is there which is coming under cash flow statement. Now, cash flow statement, if you remember, we take all your short term highly liquid investments which are up to a period of 90 days, 3 months. So, 3 months tak ke short term highly liquid investments, they are considered as cash and cash equivalent. FDs up to 3 months are cash and cash equivalent for cash flow statement. For cash flow statement. But uh, more than 3 months can also be coming over here so that whatever is taken under cash uh, cash flow statement will come under cash and cash equivalent other things will be coming under your other bank balance okay then there's a new heading which comes on the face which is called as current tax asset current tax liability we know deferred tax asset deferred tax liability was there on face in division one also but in division two current tax asset like we have a provision for tax and against the provision for tax we would have some tds or advanced tax which would have been paid so if the provision for tax is more than the advanced tax TDS, then it becomes a current tax liability. If your advanced tax TDS is more than provision for tax, it becomes a current tax asset. It comes on pace under your current asset and current liabilities. Okay, question. Whether that current tax asset is a financial asset? Current tax asset is a financial asset? No. Reason. It's not a contractual right to receive cash. I don't have any contract with income tax department. It's not a contractual right. That's why it is not coming under your financial asset. It will come under current asset, but not under financial asset. Right. Uh, under your liabilities, uh, this lease liability is a new thing which is now introduced on face. Earlier, this lease liability was not on face. It was a part of borrowings, but now they want it on face. Your trade payables, creditors. Creditors are to be bifurcated on face only, due to micro and small enterprise, due to other than micro and small. This should come on face. Okay. Uh, one more thing, deferred tax asset, deferred tax liability, the net, the net will appear. So we can't have both appearing in balance sheet, deferred tax asset also, deferred tax liability. The net will appear in balance sheet. Same way, your current tax asset, current tax liability, net will appear in balance sheet. 
fine other things are okay now statement of changes in equity statement of changes in equity uh, i'll come to this statement of changes in equity later let me just finish up other things first now the definition of current asset is important if i was to set a question i'll set from this now current asset is asset which satisfies any of the following conditions there are four conditions given if even one of them is satisfied can i say it becomes current asset if it is expected to be realized it's expected to be realized or intended for sale or consumption within normal operating cycle so something which will be realized or something which will be consumed or used up in normal operating cycle that's a current asset and normal operating cycle can be more than 12 months also for few businesses it can be more than 12 months where you cannot determine normal operating cycle it has to be taken as 12 months so now what is this operating cycle right from your raw material you convert your raw material into fg fg are sold and then you collect so can i say it's conversion of basically fg then basically collection period all together is known as oper normal operating cycle so if something will be realized in normal operating cycle it's a current asset second it's primarily held for trading stock it's primarily held for the purpose of trading so if suppose we are having a stock which is lying with us since last 10 years still it will be classified as current asset because it's primarily held for being trade third one it's expected to be realized within 12 months from the reporting date balance sheet date say reporting date is balance sheet date from balance sheet date it's expected to be realized within how much 12 months now see word is expected if i have a debtor which is due within 12 months from balance sheet date the debtor is due due within 12 months but i know he'll pay late only but i know he'll pay after 15 months it's due within 10 months only it is due after 10 months but i know every time pays after 4 5 months late only so expected to realize is after 15 months so from balance sheet date due within 12 months but expected to realize after 12 months current or non current non current because i don't have to see due i have to see expected theek hai and if something is cash or cash equivalent it's always a current asset except it is restricted from being used to settle a liability uh, for at least 12 months after the reporting date For example, I have my money in bank account, but my bank account is freezed, like Vijay Malia. So I cannot use my money. So can I say it is restricted from being used to settle a liability? And if I feel the restriction will be there for at least how many months? Twelve months. From balance sheet date, restriction will be there for next twelve months. Then in that case, it will become a non-current. Otherwise, all your cash and cash equivalents are always current. Acha. One more thing. When I use the word this cash and cash equivalent, all FDs, all your fixed deposits which are cancellable. All cancellable FDs are always cash and cash equivalent. Uh, there are few FDs which are non-cancellable also. Like if you have taken a loan against FD, or bank has given a guarantee against your FD because you have a FD done, they have given a guarantee for you. <clears throat> they are non-cancellable. If it is non-cancellable and you cannot cancel for at least twelve months after reporting date, FDs which I cannot cancel for much time, balance sheet dates and next twelve months I cannot cancel, then they are not. Cash and cash equivalent. Then they will go under your other non-current asset. Or here, it will be other financial asset. Reason is you will have a right to receive cash, but after 12 months, yes, it will come under your non-current assets. But if cancellable FD is there, all cancellable FD, irrespective of tenure, they are always cash and cash equal. And if question is silent, if question is silent, the FDs are treated as non-cancellable. I repeat, ICA treats them at what? Non-cancellable. So non-cancellable FDs. uh if they are there basically we'll be taking if it is for more than 12 months we'll take it under where your other non current as well non current asset may other financial asset fine so uh, this is definition of current asset all other assets are non according to me this expected to realize one is very important so due within 12 months but expected to realize after 12 months it will be classified as non current fine next uh we have liability under your current liability it says uh, any of the criteria fulfill it's a current liability which uh, to be paid obligation is expected to be settled in normal operating cycle it's primarily held for being traded due within 12 months after the reporting date or you do not have a unconditional right to defer the settlement for at least 12 months after the reporting date now what is this imagine i take a loan from my father I take a loan from my father, and my father says, uh, "I asked uh, Papa when I need to pay it back." So my father says, "Nikhil, you pay whenever you want." Okay, so do I have an unconditional right to defer it for at least twelve months? Yeah, I have an unconditional right. See, here, what is written? You do not have an unconditional. If you do not have an unconditional right, it's current. 
but I have an unconditional right to differ, so it becomes non -conditional. Now imagine I take a loan not from my father, but from my friend. I'm taking a loan from my friend and I ask my friend when I need to pay it back. He says, Niket, you pay whenever you want, but if I need in between, I'll tell you one month in advance. If I need in between, I'll tell you. Okay, do I have an unconditional right to differ it? No. Can I say there's a condition apply? So I do not have an unconditional right to differ for at least 12 months after the reporting. If he needs in between, I have to give him. So then in that case, this liability will be treated as current liability. My papa's liability will be non-current, but my friend's liability will be current. You do not have an unconditional right to differ it for at least 12 months after the reporting date. <coughs> okay. Now I issued some convertible debentures, optionally convertible debenture. It is possible other party may go for cash. It is possible other party may go for shares. Optionally convertible debenture, so you hold the debenture. Can I say you may go for cash also, you may go for shares also. In that case, does that affect classification of current and non-current? Whether you will go for shares or cash, that the, does that affect the classification of current and non-current? Answer is no. The terms of securities wherein the holder has an option to go for cash or shares will not affect the classification of current and non -current. But now we know under Indies, if at all there is optionally convertible, other party has a right. Can I say now we divide it into two parts? It's a compound financial instrument, equity component and liability component. But the point is the liability component, will current day or non-current day, it will depend on basically when are they to be exercised. It doesn't matter whether we will go for shares or cash. We will treat them as compound only. Okay, uh, PP is fine. There is one small amendment which I am just taking. Uh, if any revaluation is done and the revaluation is 10% or more of the net book value. What is net book value? Cost minus accumulated depreciation. There was a net book value. Now there is a revaluation done. If the revaluation is 10% or more of net book value, then that increase or decrease due to revaluation has to be shown on that table of basically the PP. If you remember, we used to prepare a table of PP in notes. Uh, we have the name of all PP, gross block. Opening, addition, deletion, closing. Accumulated depression. Opening, addition, deletion, closing. And then we used to have a net block. So if there is a revaluation which is 10% or more of the net book value, then so your addition may, your deletion may, you have to write it very clearly. It's addition due to revaluation. So normal addition and addition due to revaluation needs to be shown separately if this figure crosses 10%. Now, investment property as such it comes on phase under your division 1, investment property was a part of your non-current investment and as it was a non-current investment, remember AS13, investments appear at cost unless there is a diminution other than temporary. So, we don't depreciate investment properties but under your index, the investment properties are to be depreciated and as we are depreciating, we are giving a reconciliation that gross net how it is come. That's it. Uh, these things are fine. Uh, similar amendment is also there under your intangibles. Like if there is a revaluation of intangible, 10% or more of net book value, then that revaluation is to be shown separately in that. So addition normal and due to revaluation, if it exceeds this limit, has to be shown separately. This all is fine. Just go down. Okay. Now come to trade receivable. Come to trade receivable. Now, your trade receivables, how are they to be bifurcated? So, trade receivables are to be bifurcated as trade receivable considered good, usme secured, unsecured. So, can I say it is considered good, secured, unsecured? And if you recall your division one, it was then written basically doubtful. So, good may secured, unsecured, doubtful may we don't classify secured, unsecured. But here, under India's, the doubtful is divided into two categories. Doubtful is divided into Two categories. These are two categories. One, trade receivable which has a significant increase in credit risk and trade receivable credit impact. So now two things are there. One which has a significant increase in credit risk and second is credit impact. Up so difference is what? Okay. Now again this goes in India's 109. India's 109, when do I say there is a significant increase in credit risk? If it is overdue for more than 30 days. I repeat, if something is overdue for more than 30 days, we say there is a significant increase in Credit risk. Huh? So it's overdue for more than 30 days, but there is no clear indication of bad debt. Aapko indi clear indication bad debt ka nahi. Then there's a significant increase in credit risk. But there's a clear indication bad debt will come, then we take it under credit impact. Did you understood? 
So just overdue for more than 30 days, but no clear indication of bad debt, it comes in significant increase. There's a clear indication of bad debt, it will come under credit impaired. Uh, whenever you do a provision for bad debt, whenever you do a provision for bad debt, it has to come under relevant subhead. For example, credit impaired ka provision should be deducted from there. And significant increase in credit risk, uska provision should be deducted from there. I can't have a combined provision for all things. It has to be deducted from the relevant subhead. Uh, plus this aging schedule, aging schedule is newly added, the earlier aging schedule was not required, now aging schedule is required, so your debtors, your trade receivables, how do we have this aging schedule, uh, one they have written is undisputed good, undisputed good, then undisputed, doubtful is divided into two categories, one which has a significant increase in credit risk and credit impact, the undisputed may good, significant increase in credit risk, credit impaired same way disputed may good significant increase in credit risk and credit impaired these are the six categories this way now the aging schedule is from the date they become overdue overdue hone ke baad how much time it's overdue so it's overdue for less than six months six to twelve months one to two years two to three years more than three years and total so it's less than six six to one year one to two two to three more than three and total now in Trade receivable, the aging schedule starts from less than 6 months, then 6 to 12 months. If you go to trade payable, we'll have trade payable also aging schedule. It starts with less than 1 year. Yaha pe it's less than 6 months, Wahape it starts with less than 1 year in trade payables. Fine. Uh, just tell me one thing, loans. Uh, I have given loan to someone. Would it come under your financial asset? I have given loan to someone. Would it come under financial asset? Yes. Now, under your division 1, the heading was loans and advances. Here, advances word don't come. Reason. Because I have given advance to supplier. Is supplier going to give me cash? No, I am going to get goods. I don't have a contractual right to receive cash. I have a contractual right to receive goods. So, can I say it doesn't fall under your financial asset? So loans are financial asset, but advances are not the financial asset. Fine. This is okay. Now, other financial asset. If you see, here, bank deposit with more than 12 months maturity. FDs with more than 12 months. Under your non-current asset, they are given under other financial asset. I told you nothing is given. FDs are treated as non-cancelled. If it is non-cancelled, you can't cancel it for at least 12 months after the reporting date. Can I say it becomes non-current? But do I have a contractual right to receive cash? Okay, after 2 years or 3 years, whenever I can, quote, period is over, then can I say I will be getting cash? Okay, so I have a contractual right to receive cash. That's why it's a financial asset. That's why it is coming under other financial asset. We have this the FDs which you cannot cancel for at least 12 months after reporting date. They will come under your other financial asset under your other non uh, under your non-current asset. Under non-current asset, other financial asset. Okay, now this word security deposit given. If you see security deposit is given here also and it's given under other non-current asset also. If I go to other non-current asset, you'll find yeah, the security deposit two places. Sometimes I give a security deposit, I will be getting cash when the contract is terminated or sometimes the security deposit they will adjust it against the last few months rent, something like that. So if it is going to be adjusted, I will not be getting cash. So can I say now it is not a financial asset? So then it will come under your other current asset, other non-current asset. But if it is to be received in cash, then it will come under other financial asset. Fine. Inventory is fine, just inventory may one thing. Uh, Whenever there is a goods in transit, imagine inventory is classified as raw material, WIP, finished goods. So, there might be raw material in transit. There might be some finished goods also in transit. So, if at all they are in transit, the transit has to be shown under the relevant subhead. So, raw material in transit and finished goods in transit cannot be clubbed together and we just write goods in transit. No. Raw material in transit separate, finished goods in transit separate. You see, here under the relevant subhead. TK. This is fine. This trade receivable same. Uh, cash and cash equivalent is okay. Equity share capital is fine. Achha, this is the amendment under equity share capital. Under equity share capital, uh, whatever is your promoter's shareholding, that needs to be given in note of basically your equity share capital. Earlier it was not there. Plus one more thing, uh, under your index, preference shares do not come under equity share capital. Preference shares if they are a normal redeemable preference share, they will come under your liability. It's a financial liability. But if it's a convertible preference share, what will happen? 
it's a compound financial instrument compound financial instrument will classify into two parts liability component equity component. liability component will come under your financial liability equity component will go under your other equity but not under equity share capital so promoter's holding is now to be given name of promoter number of shares percentage and any change in percentage during the year next other equity is fine borrowing is okay Achha, borrowing may just one thing if you see here pe liability component of compound financial instrument liability component of compound financial instrument that will appear as a part of your borrowers provision fine 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 Achha. this uh, amendment in point number F current liability. Achha, I have a loan taken for five years, remaining period is nine months. I have a loan taken for five years, remaining period is nine months. Current liability, non current? Current. Okay, where it will appear under current? Short term borrowing or other current liability? This is the amendment. Now it comes under your short term borrowings. So earlier it was coming under your division 1, you would have seen pele it was other current liability. Now in division 1 also it comes under your short term borrowing. Here it was coming under other financial liability. Why it was financial? Because I have a contractual obligation to deliver cash. It was coming under other financial liability. Now it will come under your short term borrowings. So this current maturities of long term borrowing are to be disclosed separately. It will appear under your short term borrowings next other financial liability now see what is this line written now, other financial liability if you see division one this all items were coming under your other current liability but now something was other current liability but i have a contractual obligation to pay cash now they will put it under other financial so under your current liability there is a financial liability under that there is a other financial liability so other financial liability may application money received pending allotment usme, which is to be refunded. Now imagine I got application money from shareholders. Two options. Either I'll be giving shares to them or I'll be refunding. One I will be giving shares to them that will come under your other equity. And one which I have to refund that will come under your liability. Other financial liability. Unpaid mature deposit, unpaid mature debentures, this all is fine. Now imagine customer has given me advance. Customers advance, advance received from customer, asset or liability? Advance received from customer, liability, okay. Now, I have to give him goods, is it a financial liability? No, because I have to give him goods. So, that will continue to come under your other current liability. If you see other current liability, revenue received in advance. Okay, now, trade payable is fine. There are five points related to MSME, but that is not relevant from exam purpose. Final mini, inter is fine. Oh, this is okay. Okay, now if I propose a dividend, do I need to make any entry for proposed dividend? No, dividend ka entry is to be done only when it is declared by the shareholders at an HEM or if it's an interim dividend, it's declared by board of directors. So declared pay, it will be the entry done. But now the proposed dividend, the total amount and the per share amount, total amount and the per share amount is to be disclosed in your notes to accounts. Okay, same way, I have some cumulative preference shares. You know, cumulative preference shares, if I am not able to pay dividend this year, it is accumulated, carried forward and paid in next year or whenever I have profits. Okay, if there is arrears of cumulative preference dividend, do I need to show it as a liability? Arrears of cumulative preference dividend, does it appear as a liability in books? Answer is no. It doesn't appear. Reason is I have to pay only if I have a profit. This year I don't have a profit, I did not give you dividend. Next year also I don't have a profit, I don't give you dividend. And I shut down without having profits. So I don't have to pay you dividend. So this is payable only when I have a profit. So this will appear under your notes to accounts. The so arrears of cumulative preference dividend is also to be disclosed in notes to accounts. Fine. Uh, this is the amendment earlier. If I issue some securities, securities is shares or debenture. If I issue security shares debenture for a specific purpose and I don't use it for a specific purpose, note was to be given. But now if I take a bank loan also, if I take a borrowing from bank, financial institution and don't use it for that purpose, that is also to be disclosed in notes to accounts. Here with this, uh, this L point is totally a new amendment, all additional regulatory information. Out of L point, I expect a question in audit subject. I repeat. Not in FR, but I'm expecting a question in 
audit subject like first they are so these are all disclosures acha one more thing this schedule 3 disclosures who has to do auditor has to do or management has to do management, management. because financials are prepared by management auditor has to check it whether they are as per schedule 3 or not okay so these are additional disclosures which has been added one is a title deeds of immovable property if they are not there in the name of company so immovable properties are there but they are not held in the name of company few disclosures are required as we are doing fr i am not going into it but a audit ke andar this can be there like there is a case where they say that title deeds are not in the name of company what are the disclosures required by the company second we have over here uh, we know in days 40 is for investment property right okay investment properties we depreciate now investment property can i follow a revaluation model cost or revaluation no in days 40 allows only which model cost so can i say there cannot be a fair valuation of investment property but i tell you one thing you have to find out the fair value of investment property every year end but only for disclosure disclosure you don't account that fair value of investment property is just to be disclosed in notes to accounts and there is a line which is to be written by management whether the fair value is based on a report of a registered valuer or not that is to be disclosed okay if you have revalued your property whether it's based on a report of registered valuer if you have revalued your in intangible whether it's based on a report of registered valuer that is there okay if you have given a loan or advance if you have given a loan or advance to your promoters directors kmp related party promoters directors kmp related party and loans which type one which are repayable on demand whenever you ask they will pay it back whenever you ask they will pay it on demand or there are no terms specified they can pay whenever they want so if such type of loans are given then some disclosures are required in notes to accounts okay for capital work in progress now problem used to happen was since many years the things are in work in progress I can tell you, there's a company known as NMDC, National Mining Development Corporation of India. NMDC is basically constructing a steel plant. Now that steel plant they're constructing since last ten years, and it's there in CWIB. You know the amount of CWIB, twenty-four thousand crores. Now twenty-four thousand crore is lying in CWIB since last ten years, and since last five years they're telling next year it will be commissioned, next year it will be commissioned, next year it will be commissioned. So can I say since long time the things are lying in CWIP and shareholders are not having a clear idea. So now CWIP aging schedule. Since how much time it's lying in CWIP that's required. And if you are delaying, if you are running late, then you also give a completion schedule. So now two things. One is aging. Since how much time it is lying in CWIP past. And second is when it will be completed. Is it expected to be completed in one year, two year, three year? So that is. Future. So two tables are required. One is aging schedule, and second is completion schedule. This is completion, but completion schedule is required only when the things are running late. If at all you are running overdue, then only you give completion schedule. Otherwise, completion schedule is not required. Same way for intangibles which are under development. Two tables are there. Next, details of Benami property held. Now, what is this Benami property? Uh, sometimes what happens is money is not mine, but the property is in my name. My friend bought a property, registration done in mine. So that's called as a Benami property. There are laws related to it. We cannot hold a Benami property and all that things. So if company, there is any proceeding initiated against the company for holding any Benami property, then details are to be given. The proceedings against the company for holding a Benami property, details are to be given. Next, willful defaulter. If at all you are not paying your loans. Timely basis, the bank will declare you as a willful defaulter. If at all you are declared as a willful defaulter, so its date and the details of default is to be given. Relationship with stock of companies. Now, what is a stock of company whose name is removed by ROC from the register of list of companies? So, list of companies का जो register उसमें जो name है, stock of by ROC rules and regulation you learn in law. Okay, so now if at all you have some relationship with stock of company, like you have done an investment over there, or you sold goods to them, you have a debtor creditor, or you have given a loan to them, uska details are to be given. Investment receivable, payable, shares held by stock of company of yours, आपके shares are held by them, so that data is to be disclosed. Uh, whenever you take a loan, you give asset as a security. Can I say charge is created on asset? You have to fill a form for creation of charge. Once that loan is repaid, we have to fill a form for satisfaction of charge, and the time limit is kind of thirty days. CHG one, CHG four, they are the forms kind of. So if at all that forms are not filed on a timely basis, disclosures are to be given. 
Number of layers, C. A limited as a subsidiary, B, B as a subsidiary, C. So can I say there are two layers? A to B, B to C. Maximum, how many layers are allowed? Two layers are allowed. Subject to, if it's a wholly owned subsidiary, that layer is exempted. So there are a few exemptions which are given. Same, if at all you are having more than the prescribed layers. So which are the companies falling after that two layers? Uska details. Which are the companies falling after that two layers? Uska details are to be given in notes. Now, ratios have been introduced. Earlier, if you remember, financial statement does not give ratios. When I say you have to calculate it, if you wanted to analyze the financials, you will calculate the ratios on your own. Now, the ratios are to be given in notes. So, some 10, 15 ratios they have added, which are to be given in notes. Plus, any ratio, there is a change. Like last year, current ratio was 1. Last year, current ratio was 1. Current asset divided by current liability was exactly 1. Now, this year, if it is more than 1.25, or if it is less than 0.75, so can I say either side 25% up or 25% down? If it the change is more than 25% upside or downside, the reason for the change are to be given in. Now, uh, approved scheme of arrangement, you go for amalgamation, mergers, demerger, you need approval of the authority, tribunal or high court or supreme court, whatever. So, you need some approval. Now, whenever you get the scheme approved, now many times they specify the accounting also to be done in the scheme only. How to account for it? It's specified in the scheme which has been approved. And it used to happen. Sometimes it happens like the scheme which is approved, the accounting specified by them and the accounting which is given under India's might be different. The scheme ka approval, what High Court told you how to account and what is there under India's is different. Those ka dif description, the di the whatever changes are coming due to that, that are to be described in notes. To so, when you write down that, Either they are same. If they are different, what is the impact? If you would have followed Indias, that is to be written. Next, this is utilization of borrowed fund. Now, what is this? Now, A Limited has given a loan to B Limited. They gave loan or they made investment in B. And B has given a loan or made investment or given a guarantee or given security for C. Oh, that's A gave a loan or A made investment in B and with a condition that B has to give a loan or B has to make an investment or B has to give a guarantee or security on behalf of C. On behalf of C. So, B will give loan, investment, guarantee, security for whom? C. So now, in this case, if this is the case, then few disclosures are to be given by A limited, few disclosures are to be given by B limited. Okay, if I ask you, who is the ultimate beneficiary over here? Who is the ultimate beneficiary over here? C. C is the ultimate beneficiary. A gave a loan to B. B will give a loan to C. Who is getting the money? C. A, gave, a invested in B. B will invest in C. So who will be getting the money? C. The ultimate beneficiary is C. The ultimate beneficiary doesn't need disclosures. This A and B has to give disclosure about who is the ultimate beneficiary and all that. Things. Did you understood? So we just see here point number A. Where a company has advanced or loaned or invested fund to any other person entities with the understanding that the intermediary shall, okay, I have given a loan to someone with a condition that someone will, what, directly or indirectly lend or invest to some other entities. Okay, so they are talking from whose angle? They are talking from whose angle? A limited's angle. A has given a loan to B with a condition that B will give to C. So, A has to give some detail and if you just go down Nietzsche, where a company has received fund with the understanding that company shall lend it to someone else. I received it but I have to give to someone else. So, they are talking from B. So this is basically from B cycle. The first para is from A's angle, second para is from B cycle. Then this is basically the amendment points. Now, uh, this point is important, point number seven. Uh, whenever, imagine. Uh, there was a word called prior period item under your AS. Imagine five years back there was an error committed, five years back. And now I came to know about it today. How do I rectify under AS? Accounting standard. How do I rectify? I'll show it in this year as what? Prior period. So in this year there are two columns, current year and previous year. It will appear in current year column only. In current year column only it will appear rectification, but we'll show it as what? Word will be? Under NDS, what happens is, like suppose you found out an error. Uh, if error relates to last year, na, you change the previous year figures. You don't show in current year as prior item. You change which figures? 
प्रीवियस ईयर फिगर बट इफ एरर रिलेट्स टू पीरियड बिफोर प्रीवियस ईयर तो ओपनिंग बैलेंस ऑफ प्रीवियस ईयर विल बी रिस्टेट तो इट विल नॉट बी शोन इन करंट ईयर एज अ प्रायर पीरियड आइटम तो ओपनिंग बैलेंस ऑफ प्रीवियस ईयर विल बी रिस्टेट तो इफ एरर इफ एरर रिलेट्स टू प्रीवियस ईयर वी चेंज द प्रीवियस ईयर कॉलम इफ एरर रिलेट्स टू पीरियड बिफोर प्रीवियस ईयर विल चेंज द ओपनिंग बैलेंसेस ऑफ प्रीवियस ईयर सेम वे व्हेन यू चेंज द अकाउंटिंग पॉलिसी रिमेंबर वी हैव टू गिव अ रिट्रोस्पेक्टिव इफेक्ट as if the new policy was followed from very beginning what would have been the effect okay now under as that retrospective effect used to appear in the current year column which column current year column so if from very beginning this new policy was followed what would happen the current year column had that impact under indas suppose you change the policy today okay today is which date 15th october okay 15th october you change okay so now one four say this year started ठीक है बिजनेस स्टार्टेड टेन इयर्स बैक बिजनेस स्टार्टेड ऑन इमेजिन वन फोर ट्वेल्व ओके नाउ दिस इयर वन फोर ट्वेंटी टू टिल फिफ्टीन अक्टूबर ऑल्सो यूर फॉलोड ओल्ड पॉलिसी ओके इफ दिस इयर यू फॉलोड द न्यू पॉलिसी वॉट वुड हैपन दैट इफेक्ट ओनली कम्स इन करंट ईयर इफ लास्ट ईयर यू फॉलोड न्यू पॉलिसी वॉट इफेक्ट वुड केम इन लास्ट ईयर दैट यू केप इट इन प्रीवियस ईयर कॉलम एंड अर्लियर नाइन ईयर्स यू हेड फॉलोड अ New policy, what would have been the effect? That will be given in opening balance of previous year. So under AS, what was happening from that one four twelve till fifteenth October, all that effect was put directly in current year. Now what happens is one four twenty two to fifteenth October twenty two. Current year's effect come in current year. Previous year's effect previous year and period before previous year, the effect is given in opening balance of previous year. Did you understood? So whenever there's a rectification of error or basically a change in accounting policy or there's a reclassification, like simplest example, uh, tell me, current maturities of long-term debt, loan of five years, remaining period is uh, basically nine months. Earlier, such type of loans were coming under other current liability. Now they will come under short-term borrowing. Can I say we reclassify? हो गया? Did you understood? It's a reclassification. So if such thing happens, so we have to reclassify this year also. We have to reclassify in previous year also. So that all things, whenever this there, you have to show the effect as if it's from very, well, the previous year beginning. So if there is a restatement of financials due to error, due to rectification, or due to reclassification, then you are required to give a third balance sheet in your financial statement. Third balance sheet. So balance sheet may three column: current year, current year end. Previous year end and previous year beginning because the changes we are doing in previous year beginning for the period before previous year effect was given in the beginning of previous year. But I have a question. I rectified an error which was related to last year. Last year ka error I found out in this year I am rectifying. So I am rectifying. Can I say the previous year column? Okay. So do I need a third column in my balance sheet? No. Reason is it's not getting affected. Reason is it's not getting affected if that column the beginning of previous year is getting affected then you are required to give otherwise you don't okay this is done preference shares are classified as equity or liability if it's a plain vanilla redeemable preference shares the normal redeemable one it will appear under liabilities otherwise if it's a compound wala thing convertible one it will be liability equity based on compound financial instrument classification fine this is done okay pnl now under indas There's one major change in PNL. What's the major change? Okay, now PNL is divided into two sections: normal PNL, OCI, and then you have the total profit. Now, question is, can I prepare two separate statements? Normal PNL का statement अलग, OCI का statement अलग. Is it allowed under IFRS? Yes. <laughs> Answer is yes. It's it's uh, yes. So. they have option they have option either they can have one statement with two sections or they can have two separate statement we can have only one statement with two sections one is a normal pnl section second is a oci section now in your normal pnl in your division 1 we used to have profit before extraordinary item exceptional item and tax remember exceptional extraordinary and tax yahan pe there is no concept of extraordinary item under indas there is nothing called as extraordinary if something needs a separate disclosure it's exceptional it's exceptional even loss due to flood is also exceptional loss due to earthquake is also exceptional so there's just exceptional there's nothing called as extraordinary fine 
and if you just see over here we have continued and discontinued operation so first we have all the details revenue and expenditure of all continued operation then comes your discontinued for discontinued we don't have to give much detail for discontinued we directly have what profit or loss before tax of discontinued deduct the tax of discontinued we get profit or loss after tax of discontinued fine and then there's a profit for the period now coming to the main thing other comprehensive income now sir what is this oci oci is nothing but your items of profit or loss or incomes or expenses which have not been taken in your normal PNL due to the requirement of certain in days. I repeat, these are items of income expense or profit loss which has not been taken in normal PNL. Sir, why you did not took it in normal PNL? In days told me. Now, which in days? All. I have to see every in days. Me kya kya likha hai. Like I tell you, simple AS10, accounting standard 10. If you do an upward revaluation of fixed asset, where do you take it? Revaluation is up. Why are you not taking in PNL? In AS told you. If you don't take it in PNL, you have to take it in revaluation reserve. The same over here also. There are a few items which have been told under the relevant NDAs that this you don't take it in normal PNL, this you take it in OCS. And reason is these are mostly unrealized profits and losses. These are mostly so we don't want our profit to be impacted due to that unrealized profits and losses. Because many places we know under NDAs, not all, many places we know under NDAs there's a fair valuation concept. So when I do a fair value up, down, can I say there are unrealized things? So, many places they don't want that to impact your normal PNL, and that's why they are telling you to take it in OCI. Okay? Now, under OCI, whatever item came, under OCI, whatever item came, it doesn't mean it stays here lifetime. When I prepare a SOPL, whatever is your profit loss goes where? Retain earnings. Can I say it goes in other equity? Retain earnings is other equity. The retain earnings is accumulated PNL. So, current year effect comes in SOPL. Current year effect comes in SOPL, and then it goes in. Retain earnings, accumulated impact, accumulated profit till date. Can I say it appears in retain earnings? Same way, if something comes in OCI over here, from here also it has to go to other equity. OCI made its only current year impact. Accumulated impact will go where? Other equity. So other equity made it has to go. Like from PNL also it goes in other equity. Retain earning. Okay, yeah, it may not go in retain earning, it will go to somewhere else. Now, uh, OCI, the items are classified in two things. If you see OCI may two things. One item that will not be reclassified to PNL, item which will be reclassified to PNL. Now tell me something today is unrealized. We have some investment in equity. If I do investment in equity and if I revalue every year, fair valuation. So that's unrealized profit every year. But after five years, seven years, ten years, can I sell sell that shares? When I sell that shares, the profit became okay. Every year I fair valued, it came in OCI. Accumulated effect will be other equity. See, yearly impact comes in OCI. OCI is a part of SOPL. Yearly impact. It's for the years. Statement of profit or loss for the year. So yearly impact will be there. Accumulated impact will be lying in other equity. Okay, after five years, I sold it. So can I say now the profit became realized? Okay, so it was lying in other equity in some reserve. In some reserve. And when you sell it, it becomes realized. If you then take it to SOPL of that year, if you then take it to SOPL of that year in your PNL section, then it is known as item reclassified to PNL. Once it is realized, it will come in PNL. But suppose once it is realized, it will not come in PNL, it will go directly to retain earnings. Once it is realized, also, I will not take it in PNL only, I will directly transfer it where? To the, from that reserve to retain earnings, then it is item not reclassified. What is item reclassified to PNL? Today it is in OCI accumulated in other equity. Whenever it becomes realized, it will go in PNL. What is not reclassified, it will never go in PNL. Today it's in OCI, accumulated in other equity. Once it becomes realized, from there only it will go directly to retain earnings. Now, sir, which one will go to PNL and which one will go directly to retain earning again? In days. All that in days would have said. So let us just see the items which come under item reclassified to PNL, not reclassified to PNL. Just go down. Point number six. Okay, which are the items not reclassified to PNL? Uh, change in revaluation surplus. This is as per your index 16 and 38. 16 is PP, 38 is your intangible. Both this standard have said whenever you do a upward revaluation. Whenever you do which one? If you see the word written is revaluation. Downward revaluation goes in PNL. 
but due to upward revaluation upward revaluation impact we don't want our pnl to be impacted what do we do we put it in oci from oci it will be accumulated in other equity as revaluation surplus in other equity it will be written as revaluation surplus now suppose after the so first year we did revaluation upward 10 rupee upward oci me 10 came and other equity me 10 balance next year again we did upward revaluation 5 oci me 5 will come other equity me balance will become 15 opening was 10 plus current year is 5 okay third year again we did revaluation upward 2 so oci me 2 will come and other equity total will become 17 now opening was 15 this year is 270 now that property sold so can i say now 17 is the realized profit so from that other equity may revaluation surplus it's an item not reclassified to pnl it will go directly in retail did you understood so once that revalued property is sold off that profit which is realized will not go in pnl it will go directly to retail next one remeasurement of defined benefit plan what is this remeasurement of defined benefit plan uh, we know that provision for gratuity, we need to do actuarial valuation. Actuary is hired for provision for gratuity and that's required every year. Till the time business is shut down, employees are there. And employees are there, the provision for gratuity is also there. And the provision is always based on estimate. If you remember, actuary will take certain assumption. Gratuity is based on last drawn salary, number of years of service. So now what will be your last drawn salary when you will go? Nobody knows exactly. So can I say you would have estimated the growth in salary? You would have estimated the retirement age? So he has done some estimate. Is it possible actually might change the estimates later? Yeah. So whenever actually changes his assumption, can I say liability may go up or down? That liability going up or down, that profit or loss is remeasurement of defined benefit plan so that is due to change in actuaries estimate that is coming due to change in actuaries estimate the actuary change the assumption uske current this profit or loss will be coming now this again is not a realized one again this year we change assumption after two years again we'll change assumption based on market scenario currently recession everybody is fearing so can i say now we'll feel the growth rate has gone down after two years recession goes away and then he feels no now the things are again back so can i say now we'll say growth rate will go uh, so he will change assumption constantly and these are not realized things these are all what unrealized so they want that this due to change in actual assumption profit loss coming you put it in oci oci mein dal diya but uh, one thing from oci it will directly go to retain earnings Kaan pe so it will be not accumulated under separate reserve in other equity it will go directly to retail so does it go any time in pnl answer is so it will come in oci from oci directly retail Okay, third one, equity instrument through OCI. Now, what is this equity instrument through OCI? Equity instrument is nothing but investment in equity. Investment in equity. Now, investment in equity is a financial asset. Yes, no? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, the investment in equity is a financial asset. Now, financial assets, how do we value? Now, as per your NDS 109, there are three options of valuation of financial asset. It depends on your business model. Basically, your model is to hold the asset till maturity or sell it off in between and the contractual cash flows coming from the asset. Whether the asset is going to give you a periodic return, which are in form of principal and interest. Now, so if your business model, if your business model is to hold till maturity and the contractual cash flow which you are getting is solely the payment of principal and interest then the financial asset is carried in your books at amortized cost this is given under 109 the so business model is to hold till maturity and SPPI test solely for payment fully the payment for principal and interest then it is amortized cost amortized cost may kya asset is there interest accrues we receive something closing interest accrues we receive something closing this is called amortized cost amortized cost doesn't mean cost interest accrued we received something closing Okay, second option is if your plan is not to hold the asset till maturity, you might sell it off in between and SPPI test is fulfilled. Uh, the contractual cash flow till the time you sell is basically principal interest what you get. The SPPI test fulfilled but you don't want to keep it till maturity. In that case, in that case, it will be shown at FBT OCI, fair value through OCI. In that case, that financial asset will be fair valued every year and the change in fair value will come in. OCA, please keep it inside. No. So, change in fair value will come in OCA. And now, 
thing which doesn't meet that two criteria about to uh, hold till maturity SPP at as fulfilled or sell off in between an SPP at as fulfilled. If it doesn't come under there, then it falls under your FBT PL. So it will be fair valued every year and the difference will go in PL. Now tell me, if at all I invest in equity, is SPPI test fulfilled? The returns which I am getting is principal interest. No, if I invest in equity, so can I say SPPI test is never fulfilled? So can I say it doesn't fall under first two category? So when I do an investment in equity as per 109, normally it will go under what? FBT PNL. But now problem is, see, my business is not of making investments. But I have done few investments. And if you tell me that investments you fair value every year, take it in PNL. So sometimes stock market did well, my investment would have done well, my PNL will shoot up. Sometimes stock market did not do well. I fair value it, my PNL will go down. So people say, sir, this is not fair. Our business is not that. So they gave an irrevocable option. So normally, when I invest in equity, it's always what? FBT PNL. But because people say this is not the normal business, sir, it should not go in PNL. So they gave an irrevocable option that if you want, you can choose FBT OCI. Okay, if I see over here equity instrument through OCI, this is only if you have chosen irrevocable option. If you choose irrevocable option, then only that investment in equity can come in OCI. Okay. Now tell me, investment in equity, if irrevocable option is chosen, I will fair value every year and the fair value change comes in OCI. So yearly impact is in OCI, accumulated impact will be in other equity. Yearly impact will be in OCI, accumulated impact will be in other equity. After 5, 7, 10 years that investments are sold. Can I say profit loss will be there? Now equity may, can I say profit loss can be huge? Someone invested in Infosys 1 lakh rupee when Infosys started. Today it will be basically hundreds of crores. And now if you say you take it in PNL, so can I say this year PNL will shoot up like anything? And that's why they say this should not go in PNL when it's realized also. When it's realized also you take it directly in retained earnings. And that's why it's item not reclassified to did you understood? But uh, when does this equity instrument through OCI come in OCI? It's only when you choose an irrevocable option. Okay, done. Fourth one, uh, fair value change relating to own credit risk for a liability which is designated as FPT PNL. Now, see, there are three options under your financial asset. Financial asset with three options say amortized cost, FPT OCI, and FPT PNL. Your financial liability may there are only two options amortized cost, FPT PNL. So, liability can never be FPT OCI. Liability can never be FPT OCI. It will be either amortized cost, amortized cost may interest accrued, we paid something, closing. Interest accrued, we paid something, closing. Or fair value through PNL, you fair value every time, the difference will go in PNL. But imagine, I have taken a loan, I have taken a loan of 1 CR. So I have to pay 1 CR. Now, my health is not good. My company is not performing well. So, can I say I'll reach to a settlement with a bank? The bank is not getting EMIs on a timely basis. So, we have a settlement kind of. So, I have taken a loan of 1 CR, but I know the settlement is likely to happen at 60 lakh rupees. So, can I say liability in books is 1 CR, but to be paid will be only? So, can I say there's a liability going down by 40? So when I do a fair valuation, liability is going down by 40. Why? Our health is not good. Our health is not good, that's why instead of 1 CR, the liability will be settled at 60 lakh, I know, so there's a 40 lakh gain coming. This is sir, please don't take this in PN. <laughs> you say, I am not well and uske karan, I won't pay the liability, I have a profit 40 lakh. So that PNL doesn't reflect a proper thing, now people will feel business is doing well. So business is not doing well, now. it's because of your health getting deteriorated, liability will be settled at a lower amount, this you take it in OCS. So, it is a financial liability. See the word financial liability which is designated as what? So, it is a liability designated as FPT PNL. But if the risk, the change, the fair value change is due to own credit risk, then you take it in OCI. Ah, so fair value changing due to anything else, the difference will go in PNL. But if fair value change is due to own credit risk, that you don't take it in PNL, that you take it in OCI. And this also from OCI, immediately it will go in retail earnings. Like this point number 2, remeasurement of defined benefit plan, point 0.2 and point 0.4 from here, directly they will go in retail earnings. And the last one is share of comprehensive income, OCI, in associates JV. Now tell me, if you follow in days, can I say associate JV also follow in days? Okay, for associates and JV, you follow which method? Equity method. Now what happens under equity method? In my SFS, there is an investment in associate JV. In my CFS also, what will appear? Investment. 
their assets and liabilities don't come in our books. When I follow equity method, investment will remain as investment. But our share in post profit, uh, if it was basically SFS, if they declare dividend, I have a dividend income. Otherwise, my investment was 100, appears as 100. If they give dividend, dividend income will come. But in your CFS, investment 100, now they earned a profit 30. My share is 40%. 30 ka 40% is 12. So I will add 12 rupee in my CFS as well. Even though they have not declared dividend, even though they have not declared dividend, 12 rupee I add it in my consolidated PL and they have not paid me cash. What I'll do? I'll add it in my profit 12 rupee, but they have not paid me cash. What I'll do? I'll add it in my investments. So in my consolidated PL 12 added, and in my consolidated balance sheet, investment 100 plus 12 rupee, 112 will appear. Did you understood this? Okay, so my share of post acquisition profit in associates and JV, I need to include. So this fifth point is only for CFS. Fifth point is only for CFS. So my share of post acquisition profit of associate and JV, I need to include. Now if I am following in days, can I say they are also following in days? Okay, if they are following in days, can I say their PL is also divided in two parts? If they have a profit in normal PL, my share I'll add it in normal PL. If they have a profit in OCI, my share I'll add in OCI. Okay, if they have a profit in OCI not reclassified, my share I'll add in OCI not reclassified. If they have a profit in OCI reclassified, our share I'll add it in OCI reclassified. Did you understood? So this point will be there in both not reclassified also reclassified also because if they have a profit in OCI not reclassified my share I am adding in OCI not reclassified if they have a profit in OCI reclassified my share I am adding in OCI reclassified so check this point is also there below also in reclassified point four did you got it this were the items which were not reclassified to PNL again one change in revaluation surplus that's one number two is remeasurement of net defined benefit plan third one was in equity instrument through OCI. Fourth one was fair value change relating to own credit risk of a financial liability designated as FPT PNL. And the last one was uh, our share in OCI not reclassified of the associates and J. Now coming to items which will be reclassified to PNL. Today they are coming in OCI. They are accumulated in other, other equity. Once they become realized, they will go back in PNL. And now from PNL, they will come to retain earnings only. From PNL again, they will come back where retain. But this will go to PNL, then come to retain earning. Not reclassified are those which will never go to PNL, it will directly go to retain earnings. Clear? This is very, very important. This upper question definitely will be there. Okay. Uh, this not not this point, this whole reclassified, not reclassified, whole things. Okay, now reclassified may number one exchange difference relating to translation of foreign operation. See, there is a difference between word foreign currency transactions and foreign operation. See, I do sales abroad, I purchase from abroad, they are foreign currency transaction. This is foreign operation. I have a branch abroad, I have a subsidiary abroad. Now, can I say their financial statements will be in US dollars? I need to convert there into INR. And if you just recall your AS11 or basically India AS21, whenever you are converting, you are bringing that assets and liabilities at closing rate, incomes and expense at average rate. There will be a difference. And difference we used to put it in one C translation reserve. Ah, this is nothing but foreign currency translation reserve. Okay. So whatever is difference coming, and see every year their balance sheet PNL is in foreign currency. Every year translation happens, every year difference comes. Every yearly impact will come in OCI. Accumulated will be there in other equity. Now, once that foreign operation sold off, once that foreign operation sold off, can I say now it's realized? Now it's realized. Now it will go to PNL. From PNL, it will come in retail. Did you understood? Okay. Next is debt instrument through OCI. Debt instrument through OCI is investment in debt. Now remember, if I invest in debentures, uh, SPPI test fulfilled, and if I plan to sell it off in between, so can I say it is fair value through OCI? So if I plan to sell it off in between. So if there is a debt instrument which I plan to sell it, off, sell it off in between, it will be fair value through OCL, fair value every year. Now debt may the fluctuations are not much. 100 rupee debenture will never become 1000 rupees. Based on interest rate bit moves, so the market may price also bit moves. Simple. There is a debenture which gives 8% return. Earlier FDs were giving 5-6%. Earlier FDs was giving 5-6%. There was a debenture which was giving 8%. Now, FD started giving more return, but this debenture still gives 8%. So, people will prefer this or no? 
नो पीपल विल नॉट प्रेफर दिस उसका फेयर वैल्यू विल गो वेरी सिंपल ना एसेट है पीपल आर नॉट प्रेफरिंग वैल्यू विल गो डाउन बट इफ मार्केट में रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट रिड्यूस्ड एफ डी स्टार्टेड गिविंग थ्री परसेंट दिस इज गिविंग एट कहने से पीपल विल तो उसका फेयर वैल्यू विल गो तो बट इट डो टू मच अप एंड डाउन हंड्रेड माइट बिकम हंड्रेड एंड टेन हंड्रेड माइट बिकम नाइनटी फाइव नाइनटी दिस इज वॉट हैपन्स इन डेट So when I invest in debentures, we plan to sell it off. It is fair value through OCI. Yearly impact when I fair value it, it comes in OCI, accumulated in other equity. When that debentures are sold off, it's not a huge profit. So you take it in PNL. Equity me kya tha? One lakh rupee might have become hundred crores also. That's why they were not allowing you to take it in PNL. They were directly telling you to take it in retained earnings. But yahan pe debt me it's not much. So take it in PNL. From PNL will go to retained earnings. Next effective portion of gain or loss on hedging instrument. Now we know when I have a payment in foreign currency, I entered into a forward contract of buying dollars. I have to make payment in foreign currency, so I'll buy dollars foreign forward contract something like that. Now whenever I do that forward contract, can I say it's for hedging purpose? I already have a made payment, and that's why I'm doing this. When I don't have a payment and I enter, can I say that's for speculation? But this is hedging. Now whenever you enter into some contract which is for hedging purpose. So what will happen is till the contract is over, uska gain loss will be coming in OCI because contract will be settled. Nahi ho. Once the contract is settled, then from OCI it will be removed and it will go in P. Did you understood? So till that time the contract is settled, that income expense is there in OCI accumulated in other equity. Once that contract is settled from other equity, it will go in P. And last point we already discussed. So items which will be reclassified, item which will not be reclassified, you should be clear about which item comes where because question will be there on this. Then, baki all points are fine. Uh, this PNL me, one thing. Uh, suppose, uh, imagine we have filed our income tax return or we basically prepared our accounts. Afterwards, a search or survey or basically a raid of department came at our place. Is it possible during raid or during that search survey we disclose some additional incomes which we have not shown in books? Okay, so during that income tax department search survey raid, we have accepted or disclosed some additional income. Earlier it was not recorded in books, but yeah, now you have disclosed it. So when I say now it should be recorded in books, so you have to give okay, basically now whether it has been properly recorded in books or not. Then few disclosures about your CSR. Uh, Amount required to be spent, you know, two percent of average net profit of last three years required to be spent. Amount which you actually spent, what is the shortfall? Total of previous year shortfall, opening shortfall. Reason for shortfall? What type of activities do you do? Is there any related party transaction like Reliance Industries Limited? How do they do CSR? They contribute to Reliance Foundation. So when they contribute to Reliance Foundation, it's nothing but a contribution to a Related party. So this is basically the disclosures which are required. Details of cryptocurrency. I know some of you might be trading. Uh, cryptocurrency may a profit or loss which basically is there from the cryptocurrency that is to be disclosed in notes plus um, the stock holding. How much is the holding of cryptocurrency as at 31st March? That is also to be disclosed. Like you might have uh, basically you would have heard the announcement that Tesla is accepting money in bitcoins. If you buy a Tesla car, you can pay by bitcoins. So can I say they will be having a stock of bitcoins with them? So this all disclosures basically. Tesla is abroad, but are similar if Indian company is accepting bitcoins, that all data is to be given. Okay, this is basically for the standalone financials. Coming to the consolidated financials. Now tell me one thing. If at all I have a subsidiary where I hold 80%, can I say I have a right over the 80% assets and liabilities? Okay, would I include their 80% assets liabilities or 100%? So we'll include the 100% assets and liabilities and 20% assets and liabilities belonging to someone else. We show it as NCI, non-controlling interest. Where does NCI appear in balance sheet? It will appear under equity but separately from owner's equity. I repeat, it will appear under equity but separately from owner's equity. So when you have a balance sheet, equity and liabilities, then we start with equity. Under equity, equity share capital, other equity, this is equity belonging to owners, plus NCI, this total equity. Then comes liabilities. Okay, then. Now, same way, you hold 80%. Would you include their 80 days expense income or would you include 100%? 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 
Like even though I hold 80 percent, I have included 100 percent sales, 100 percent expense, 100 percent income of subsidiary. So can I say I included 100 percent profit of theirs? Okay, I include 100 percent profit, but my share is only what 80. So can I say 20 percent? I have to give it to NCI. So profit, whatever profit comes, now you have to allocate. So you have your 100 percent parents' profit, 100 percent subsidiary. Both are there in CFS. Out of subsidiary, uska 20 percent I have to allocate. So belonging to owners of parent, belonging to NCI. So now in your PNL you have a normal PNL, OCI and total comprehensive income which is total of both. So that normal PNL you bifurcate belonging to owners of parent NCI. OCI other comprehensive income you bifurcate belonging to owners of parent belonging to NCI and total comprehensive income you bifurcate belonging to owners of parent and NCI. Fine. Now this statement is to be disclosed in notes. This statement helps you to understand size and importance of every subsidiary. Now when I prepare a CFS, can I say if I have a 10 subsidiary, it's parent plus all 10 subsidiaries figured together. Now which subsidy is doing how? Do I get to know from the balance sheet PNL? No. So which subsidy is doing how? For that this note will be useful. So what this note says, you are required to give net assets coming from parent subsidiary Indian 1, 2, 3, subsidiary foreign 1, 2, 3 plus if you remember you have a share in profit of associates and JV also. So, wo sab kitna aya? investment in associate, JV will appear in your CFS. Equity method, investment will appear as investments. Equity method, investment will appear as investment. Our share in post profit, we included in profit. Opposite, we added in investments. So, net assets, mein, how much is net asset coming from parent, subsidiary 1, 2, 3, foreign subsidiary 1, 2, 3. How much is investment in associate, JV, JV 1, JV 2, JV 3, associate 1, 2, 3. So that all pura bifurcation with the percentages. Same way how much profit comes from each of them, how much OCI comes from each of them, how much total comprehensive income comes from each of them. So can I say each, each subsidiary contributing how much profit, each associate JV how much is our profit coming from them, this is going to help me understand. Now all subsidiary associate JV are to be consolidated, if at all you are not consolidating any subsidiary associate JV. Now why we are not consolidating, you know there are few exemptions given, remember intermediate subsidiaries exempted from consolidation, well, they are exempted from preparing CFS plus uh, investment companies, investment companies if they carry their invest subsidiary associate JV at fair value through PNL, they are not consolidated, uh, AS21, AS21 may if the control is temporary. I acquired a subsidiary which I would sell it off within a year. Temporary control, they are not to be consolidated. So there are few exemptions. If suppose a subsidiary associate JV is not consolidated due to some exemption available, due to exemption available. So you have to give a list of subsidiary associate JV which is not consolidated in your notes along with the reasons. The notes may be required to show along with reasons. Any doubts? Anybody with this? Okay, come to India's one. Okay, there's a question from Vamshi, sir, will the videos remain on YouTube? Answer is yes, the videos will remain on YouTube. That's live stream currently, afterwards also it will be available if anybody wants to see it. Which one? Equity of? Oh, statement of changes in equity. Just, just come back to statement of changes in equity. Chalo. Go back to schedule 3. Just come back to statement of changes in equity. Okay. Now, this is a statement which is there under India AS, which is not there under your normal AS. So this is extra thing which we prepare as a part of your financial statement. Uh, this is a statement of changes in equity. Equity means equity share capital as well as other equity both. So if you see here, one is this equity share capital, uska change. Now how is the change they have given? Uh, this is the two figures current year and previous year. Okay, current year opening. Current year opening. Now due to error, can I say current year opening might have been restated? Remember error hota hai to we change it to change due to prior period errors so restated opening and then is there any new equity share capital issued during the year or bought back during year uska changes and then you have a closing opening then we have basically error due to error some rectification happened restated opening 
After that, what happened during the year? Did we issue new? We bought back and we have to give in terms of rupees, not in number of shares, in terms of rupees. If you see the word written is equity share capital, not number of shares. And then we have a closing. Similarly, we give it for previous year. Shall I move it? Now, if I go to this other equity changes, other equity. First, let me take this headings which you are having, the horizontal ones, then I go to vertical ones. Okay, horizontal ones, what all comes under other equity? Can I say other equity is nothing but your reserve surplus? Okay, now application money received pending allotment. If it is to be refunded, can I say it will go under financial liability? But if it is not to be refunded, shares are to be given, can I say it will come here? This is the first item. Okay, compound financial instrument, we divide in two parts. Liability component goes under liability, equity component will come under here, equity component of compound financial instrument. Then all your reserve surplus, capital reserve, securities premium, A, retain earning, that all will come over here. Now, uh, we had equity instrument through OCI, debt instrument through OCI, that all things or revaluation surplus which was coming in OCI. If you remember, I told you yearly impact comes in OCI, the accumulated impact will be in other equity. So, the accumulated impact of debt instrument through OCI, equity instrument through OCI, effective portion of cash flow hedge, revaluation surplus, exchange difference on translation of foreign operation. Now, if you see two things are missing. Which are the two things missing if I tell you? One is remeasurement of defined benefit plan and change in fair value due to own credit risk for a financial liability designated as FBT PNL. Now, why that two things are missing? I told you they will go directly to retainer. So from OCI it goes directly to retaining. That's why that two things are missing. And money received again share capital. Like suppose you got some money, you are required to give shares after two years. Pakka, 100%. 100% shares are to be given, but not today. Shares are to be given after two years. So that is money received against share capital, or we used to call it as money received against share warrants. Both are one and the same. Do you understood all these headings? Okay. Now, what happens over here? There might be some opening balance in sub may. Okay, due to some change in accounting policy or error, can I say there might be some restatement coming in opening balance? So we have a restated opening balance. Did you understood three things? Now, current year. Current year normal PL profit. Can I say it's added in retain earnings? Current year revaluation surplus upward. It will be added in revaluation surplus column. Current year equity instrument through OCI be fair value. That will be added in equity instrument through OCI. Debt instrument be fair value this year. So this yearly impact. So this is current year's impact. Okay. Dividends, if I declare, can I say it will be deducted from retain earnings? See, appropriations. We don't have a PNL appropriation account or appropriations don't come in statement of PNL. Appropriation come in this note of other equity or reserves and surplus. So it is deducted. This dividend will be deducted only from where? Retained earnings. Okay, then transfer to retained earnings. Now, what is this? Tell me. Uh, equity instrument through OCI. Equity instrument through OCI. Is it item reclassified to PNL? Not reclassified to PNL? Not reclassified. Okay, if that equity instruments are sold off, so whatever is the total balance of equity instrument through OCI lying in other equity, I have to remove and transfer to. So what will happen over here is it will be added in retain earnings. Yape. Retain earnings will be added and it will be deducted from equity instrument through OCI. Did you understood? Yase deduct and wape it will get added. Any other change? Closing. So first, all the titles were given. Opening. Any change due to change in policy or prior period item or something like that, or restated opening, current year impact, dividend you deduct only from equity. Plus, uh, if realized profit not transferred to PNL is there, not reclassified, so it is removed from that item, transferred to retain earnings, others and close. Clear? So now come to. Yes, one time they asked the format of OCI, audit subject. <laughs> Six months, just the format. But it's very simple, it's like a normal thing only, you don't have to remember, it's understandable. Yes, please. Coming in days one. Okay, the question is, uh, sir, 
uh, we told you we had this like something is realizable with a op normal operating cycle it's a current asset company has two businesses one ka operating cycle is 15 months others operating cycle is 8 months what do we do we classify how so asset related to one business classify accordingly asset related to other business classify accordingly so you have to classify separately according to the businesses okay now in days one is actually nothing but based on your schedule three only if you see majority things which is given over here it's the same they also have given a definition of current asset current liability which is all same first of all complete set of financial statement it includes your balance sheet sopl statement of changes in equity cash flow statement notes comparative and if at all you change your accounting policy, you restate the financial statements. Remember, we have to give an opening balance sheet of previous year. That also becomes a part of your financial statement because it's a requirement of Schedule 3. Okay, can I have my PNL in two separate statements, normal and other comprehensive income? No, so it will be one statement in two sections. IAS1 provides an option either for a single statement or two statements. So over this, they can prepare PNL and OCI as a two separate statements. We have one statement with two sections. Identification of financials is fine. Balance sheet, current asset, we already discussed under Schedule 3. I am not discussing what is current asset again. Same thing. Now, this is your question. There are two different businesses. Real estate business and manufacturing of passenger vehicles. Real estate business, the operating cycle is basically three to four years. Passenger vehicle, it is 15 months. So, can I say two businesses, different operating cycle? So, now, passenger vehicle, something realizable in 20 months is non-current. But for real estate, something realizable in 20 months will be current. Because wahan pe 3 to 4 years is the time. So, you have to see for that business separately. So, when you are having two operating cycles, classification of assets, liabilities, current and liability will be based on normal operating cycle that is relevant to that particular asset and liability. If it's a real estate ka asset, classify based on 3 years wala thing. If it's a passenger vehicle ka asset, classify based on 15 months thing. Current liability is already done but uh, there are 2-3 points over here which are very good. Okay. Uh, just one minute, I need to restart my laptop. This pen is not working. Just one minute. If I feel we are getting a bit delayed, like uh, late chal rahe, so I might extend the session from not 6 o'clock, it might become till 7 o'clock both the days. Yes, Just to ensure that we cover everything in a proper way. Or that I will confirm. <laughs> Okay, we are back. Hmm. Now, just see this two, three points. Just see this two, three points. Now, what this point says, uh, you are having a liability which are due to be settled within 12 months. Okay, there is a liability which is due to be settled within, a loan here which is due to be settled within as such 12 months. So, can I say it is a current liability, non-current? Current or non-current? Current, right? Now, after the year end, but before the books are approved, bank has agreed to extend it by another two years. I repeat the question. After year end, before the books are approved, bank has agreed to extend it for another two years. So should I still classify it as current or non-current? <laughs> I repeat again, again, just pay attention. There was a liability loan of five years. Remaining period was nine months. Balance sheet date, the remaining period is? Nine months. As such, it's a current liability. But after year end, before our books are approved by board of directors, the bank has agreed to extend it by another two more years. 
and show it as current or non-current. Okay, my question: whether on balance sheet date your knowing bank will extend? No. The so circumstances was not prevalent. Circumstances was not prevalent. If circumstances are not prevalent, it's a non-adjusting event. You continue it as a current liability. Did you understood? I repeat, balance sheet date. I was not knowing bank will extend or not. ये तो after balance sheet date bank agreed and they extended it by another two years. If before balance sheet date bank has agreed, if before balance sheet date bank has agreed, so now I know on balance sheet date that I have to pay after two years and nine months. Then I'll show it as not. But if after balance sheet date bank has agreed that was not there on thirty first March, then in that case it's a non adjusting event. You will show it as a current liability. Check. Now you will be able to understand properly. You will classify as current what when they are due to be settled within twelve months. Original term was longer than twelve months. Original term was five years. Remaining period is nine months. And agreement to refinance on a long term basis is completed after the reporting date, but before the financial statements are approved. Did you understood? Okay. Suppose this agreement to refinance was done before the reporting date. तो एडजस्टिंग नहीं तो तो बैलेंस शीट डेट इट्स नॉट पेबल ओनली विद इन नाइन मंथ्स देन इट्स पेबल आफ्टर टू इयर्स एंड नाइन मंथ्स देन इट बिकम्स नॉट क्लियर नेक्स्ट एग्जांपल इज फाइन वी डिस्कस्ड इट नाउ आई हैव टेकन अ लोन इन द लोन ओनली इन द लोन ओनली देयर इज अ कंडीशन दैट इफ आई वांट आई कैन एक्सटेंड इट बाय टू मोर इयर्स इन द एग्जिस्टिंग लोन एग्रीमेंट देयर इज अ ऑप्शन विद मी आई कैन एक्सटेंड बाय अनदर Two years, and I plan to extend by another two years. So, should I classify it as current or non-current? Non-current. Reason is it's already there in existing agreement, and the option is with me only. Okay, but the option is not with me; it's with bank. They may extend, they may not extend. Then, in that case, it becomes current. Okay, so check. If a entity expects and has a discretion, can I say it's up to you? to roll over under a existing loan facility i can extend it by another 2 years existing agreement only gives me the option that i can extend it by another 2 years if its option is with me only i can extend i plan to settle after 2 years only then i should show it as a non current but if it is not at my discretion then it becomes current did you understood option under existing loan agreement with me only to extend it So can I say I have an unconditional right to defer it? But uh, if it is bank situation, then I do not have a unconditional. Then it becomes a current liability. Bank approves when it depends. Before the approval of financial statements, but usme you had filed for it before the balance sheet date. So situation is existing. But if you had not filed for it before the balance sheet date, situation is not existing. Now, next one, very important. It's a carve out. Uh, whenever I get a loan, you know, loan always has some conditions attached. Your current ratio should be at least this much, or promoter has to bring in some extra funds by this date, something like that. So there was some condition given. If you breach the condition, they have written the loan becomes repayable on demand. As such, loan is five years. As such, loan is the remaining period is also five years. Man, loan is a long term loan. Remaining period is also Five years, but they have written that if you breach, if you breach any contract or terms, loan becomes repayable on demand. Now you breach something, you breach something when it is after year. Now you are already breached this. So before thirty first March, you already breached. Okay, if you already breached the terms, can I say loan is repayable on demand? Before balance sheet date, you already breached. The so loan is payable on demand. So can I say it should be classified as current? Okay, now after year end, before books are approved. After year end, before books are approved, I rectify the breach, and bank has agreed not to recall on demand. I repeat again, there was a long term loan. Tenure is also pending much, but I had breached some terms. They said current ratio should not fall below this. I breach, and the breach happened before balance sheet date. When did the breach happen? So it's on balance sheet date. It's repayable. On demand. When I say as such on balance sheet date, its current liability. After year end, before books are approved. After year end, before books are approved, I rectify the breach. Bank has agreed not to recall. Okay. So in India, 
this is a adjusting event because after year end before books are approved if bank has agreed then we show it as a non current liability abroad may basically it will still be shown as current liability so this is basically a difference between your indas one ias one check when you breach the provision of long term agreement before the year end when did you breach before year end so can i say now it's payable on demand so as such it should be current but you will not classify its current when do you not classify if the lender has agreed after year end before books are approved not to demand the payment if you rectified the breach and bank has agreed not to demand it then you don't classify it as current you continue it as not current but this is a carve out from ias 1 wa pay it will still be classified as current even if the breach is rectified after the year end before the books are approved clear now see the questions good questions over here RTP number nineteen. Entity has taken a loan facility from a bank that is to be repaid within a period of how many months? Nine months from the end of reporting period. Okay, so it's a loan which is repayable within nine months from balance sheet date. Can I say it's a current liability? Okay, before prior to the end of reporting period, before year end. you entered into agreement with bank and now they are going to ask for money after 5 years i repeat as such it was repayable within how many months 9 months but before the year is over i went to bank and they agreed not to call for how many years 5 years so when i say now before year and only they agreed to extend it so now on balance sheet date i know it is to be paid after 5 years and 9 months i should show it as non current to so see a point classified as non current B. Would your answer be different if the new facility is agreed upon after year end? The bank extended, but after year end they extended. Then on balance sheet date, can I say extension was not there? Then it will be termed as current. To check second wale me, it will be current. Okay. Third, will your answer be different in A if the existing facilities from one bank, new facilities from another bank? So this loan I have to repay in nine months only. I'll get a new loan from another bank, which will be payable after five. So can I say this loan I have to pay in nine months? So this will be still classified as current. So check third one is current. Fourth, will your answer be different if new facility is not yet tied up with the existing bank, but there's a potential to refinance? So means abhi tak They have not granted an extension. They may grant an extension. So can I say as of now it's payable in nine months? It will be correct. Did you understood all four? Okay. Next one. Question number three. Question number three. In December two thousand one, an entity entered into a loan agreement with a bank. The loan is repayable in three equal annual instalment. ठीक है. You entered into a loan agreement. It's payable in three equal. annual installment one of the loan covenant is there should be some amount amount equal to loan to be contributed by promoters by which date march 24 otherwise loan becomes repayable on demand okay march 24 you are not able to get promoters contribution and march 25 you go to bank okay so when did you go to bank after the breach or before the breach so can i say breach has happened if breach has happened the loan is repayable Uh, this was 24th we went to bank on and we obtain a grace period till june <coughs> okay bank agreed to give you a grace period till june. you got a grace period but can i say grace period is only till june 3 months so still current grace period is only till june bank cannot demand till june bank cannot demand till june but can i say after june so they can still demand so it will be classified as current so check this is classified as current now check second question assuming that in anticipation that it will not get a promoters contribution feb only february only you go to bank february only you went to bank and bank told you okay get promoters contribution by 30th june okay there did any breach happened or breach only didn't happen it was before the breach happened i got a extension the breach why nahi the breach why nahi to can i say now it will be not so it is now not repayable on demand it is repayable only if breach happened yahan pe before the breach happened only i got a extension the breach has not happen which has not happened it's not repayable on demand it is non current so check yahan pe it is non current 
ओके एसओपीएल वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस दैट इज फाइन अच्छा एक्सपेंसिस विच वी शो इन अवर पी एन एल दिंग्स इफ यू जस्ट रिकॉल योर हेडिंग्स इज इट लाइक फिनेंस एक्सपेंस देन वी हैव बेसिकली और डेप्रिशिएशन अमोटाइजेशन तो इट्स बेसिकली देन एक्सपेंसिस विच आर गिवेन आर काइंड ऑफ नेचर वाइज नेचर ऑफ एक्सपेंस इट्स अ फिनेंशियल एक्सपेंस द डेप्रिशिएशन वो नेचर है ओके कैन आई हैव एक्सपेंडिचर इज एडमिन एक्सपेंस सेलिंग एक्सपेंस दैट इज not nature that is actually what function so function wise can i show it answer is no we don't have it they allow we don't have it but ias1 allows so we present expense based on nature i indias1 does not allow based on function admin manufacturing selling we don't have it like that ias1 allows either based on nature or based on function you don't have anything called as extraordinary if something you want to show separately it's always exception this is fine separate disclosure information which comes in oci we discussed in detail which will not be reclassified six items which will be reclassified this items and financial assets are measured as per three things amortized cost fvt oci fvd pnl the detail is given over here and same way uh, note number 2 is if i have investment in associate jv can i say they are carried at equity method how does equity method work that is basically written over here now question number 4 uh, due to covid there is a significant impairment in intangible asset okay there is a significant impairment in intangible asset can i say huge loss coming huge loss coming can i show it as extraordinary no can i show it as exceptional yes Yeah, so it can be shown as exceptional based on materiality and incidents. So, like, it's not a recurring thing. Material, hey, amount is huge. Then I can show it as exceptional. But there's nothing called as extraordinary. Now, this May 19 question. This is good. Check. Entity has undertaken various transactions. You are required to present as per India S1. Simple. Whether it will come in PNL or whether it will come in OCI. And OCI also, I take it further one more level. whether it will be item reclassified or item not reclassified okay remeasurement of defined benefit plan oci not reclassified current service cost current service cost is current year salary simple they work for current year you pay them pnl change in revaluation surplus oci not reclassified gain or loss arising from translating the monetary assets in foreign currency monetary assets in foreign currency yeah. this is not foreign operation this is foreign currency transaction you might have some purchase some asset in foreign currency uska hai bas gain or loss on translating financial statement of foreign operation oci reclassified gain or loss from investment in equity designated as fvt oci oci not reclassified income tax expense pn share based payment cost employee benefit expense pn done this is basically the question 6 marks next general features of financial statement what are the general features one it should show a true and fair view it should be based on going concern accrual materiality offsetting acha can i offset a income against expense and show directly the net i have paid commission i have received commission i can show directly net commission paid or net commission received answer is unless other indias allows indias one says you can't do set off like dta dtl remember we can present net but uske liye there are conditions given under indias 12 indias 12 says that the, both the taxes should be related to same governing laws so then in that case you are basically allowed to do it so there are some conditions if other indias allow you do it otherwise it has to be shown everything on gross basis frequency of reporting generally is one year but ha if you are having less than one year or more than one year some disclosures are required comparative consistency okay now presentation of true and fair and compliance with indias my question what if i don't comply with indias is it okay what if i don't comply with indias we have to make a explicit unreserved statement that we are complying with indias but i feel indias mein kuch galat hai this is not proper there in indias so can i in exceptional circumstances can i deviate from the requirement of indias 
Okay, exceptional circumstances, you can deviate from the requirement of NDAs provided the applicable financial reporting framework does not prohibit you. Provided applicable financial reporting framework means laws and regulation don't prohibit you. You may follow a different treatment, but if you are following a different treatment than what is given in NDAs, can I say you need to give disclosure? If you would have followed NDAs, what would have happened, all that things? If law and regulation don't prohibit, you follow different treatment, but give a disclosure what would have happened if NDAs was followed. But if law and regulation prohibits, if law and regulation prohibits, then follow NDAs. Then follow NDAs. But you feel this is wrong? So give disclosure why this is wrong and what should be done. I repeat, if law and regulation don't prohibit, then you may follow different treatment and give disclosure about what is not followed and if NDAs was followed, what would have happened. If law and regulation prohibits you, then follow NDAs only. But you feel this is wrong? So according to you, what will be right? That you discuss. Okay? Check to over here. Departure from NDAs, whether permissible. Extremely rare cases where you feel the NDAs compliance will be misleading. If I follow this, this is not correct. So, you shall depart from the requirement provided the regulatory framework does not prohibit then you may follow different treatment. You can see you are following a different treatment, but you will give disclosure what is not followed, why not followed, and if NDAs was followed, what would have happened. But if I just go down, if regulatory framework prohibits departure, okay, if regulatory framework prohibits departure, then you continue with NDAs. Even though you feel it's wrong, you continue because law doesn't allow you. You continue. But according to you, what is wrong, what should have been done, not prohibiting, you followed something else. So can I say you accounted somewhere else? But if law prohibits, you accounted like in days only. But you give disclosure according to you what is wrong, what should have been done. Clear? Okay, going concern. Now, we always prepare our financial statements based on going concern and every year we need to check out are there any indication which cast a doubt on entity's ability to continue as Going concern, uh, audit keywords are <laughs> Now, <laughs> the point is, imagine after year end, a circumstances came up. After year end, before books are approved, circumstances came up, which affects going concern. Now, you feel you will not be a good concern. 31st March, you are strong. After 31st March, something happened. Imagine 5th April, there is a fire at factory and now you feel we will not be a going concern. 5th April. So, can I prepare this March wale financials as per going concern? So, basically, basically non-adjusting event which affects going concern are treated as adjusting. Actually, yahan pe it's already given. That's why basically it's there. See, uh, this point, event occurring after reporting period might indicate that entity is no longer a going concern. Okay. Entity does not prepare financial statement on going concern basis if management's post year end assessment. After the year is over, then you assess now we are not going concern. Still, last year's financial which is over, you don't prepare as per going concern. Did you understood? Accrual is fine. Materiality. Okay. Materiality may uh, similar items. If similar items, Usme material hai. item is similar, but one item is material, then you have to show it separate. Okay? Similar item, but one is material, you show it separate. Dissimilar item, you always have to show separate. Whether material, not material, dissimilar items always has to be shown separate. Okay? Offsetting, it's not allowed unless required or permitted by any index. Otherwise, not allowed. Frequency of reporting, it has to be annually. If you are using longer or shorter year, you are required to do disclosure reasons and you have to state a fact that the amounts are not comparable. Last year was 12 months, this year is 15 months. So, two figures are not comparable. You have to present minimum two balance sheet, two PL, two cash flow, two statement of changes in equity related note. Two means current year and previous year. But whenever you change your accounting policy retrospectively, or you make a rectification of error or you reclassify the things, then you are required to have minimum three balance sheet. Okay, three balance sheets are required, not PN. So balance sheet may current year end, previous year end, previous year opening. 
ठीक है नाउ कम टू द क्वेश्चन अगेन अ गुड क्वेश्चन देर आर क्वालिफिकेशन इन ऑडिट रिपोर्ट दैट टू इन डेज आर नॉट फॉलोड सी मैनेजमेंट फील्ड वी आर फॉलोड इन डेज बट ऑडिटर इज क्वालिफाइड द ऑडिट रिपोर्ट टेलिंग देर नॉट फॉलोड इन डेज इज इट सेट टू बी इन डेज कंप्लेट See, I prepare financial statements, and I have to make an explicit statement that I am preparing as per index. If I believe, I can make the statement. If someone doesn't believe, it's his lookout, na. If he gives a qualified report, it's up to him. But I, according to me, it is still explicit statement that my financial statements are as per index. The qualifications are there in audit report with respect to two index. It's okay. Still, the financial statements are said to be index compliant. Check. Yes, the still then an entity shall not describe financial statement as index unless they comply. Okay, but ah, uh, still you can say you are complied with index. Okay, is it mandatory to use the word standalone before the financial statement? I don't have a subsidiary. No subsidiary associate JV. But you are still required to indicate in notes to accounts. These are individual financial statements. You know there are three types: individual, standalone, consolidated. Individual financial statements are the financial statements of an entity which does not have subsidiary associate JV. If I don't have subsidiary associate JV, my financial statements are individual. Okay, if I have a subsidiary associate JV, I'll prepare two. One is standalone, other is consolidated. so even though you don't have any subsidiary associate jv you are preparing financial it has to be mentioned somewhere that these are individual financial i don't say heading b but at least in notes that these are individual financial statements to so check the entity need to disclose these are individual financial statements third the company is having a turnover 180 crores and want to present absolute figures in financials can i have absolute figures in financials no rounding off is mandatory Okay, you have some ten related parties during the previous year. Current year, there are no transaction with four parties. अच्छा, तो you had transaction with how many parties? Ten. Last year you had transaction with ten parties. This year you have transaction with only six parties. So do I need to give disclosure of only six parties or ten parties? Parties. See, your financial statement includes current year as well as previous year. So previous year में ten parties were there. You are required to still give a disclosure. So see, company is of the view it need not disclose the transaction with four parties because this uh, there were no transaction during the year. So they say that we don't have to basically disclose only anything for this. Well, a previous year it was there, but current year it is not there. No, no, still you are required to disclose. The answer will be no. You are required to disclose because your financial statement is not just current year period; it's also previous year period. Okay, next. Now check over here. There was some error which came up. The company presents not error. Company presents financial statement for three years. Okay, can I give comparative of two years? Minimum is two balance sheets, two P and L, two cash flow. That was minimum. If I want to show extra comparative, can I show it? Yes, extra comparative is allowed. Acha, can I do one thing? I have three columns in P and L, but not in balance sheet, cash flow. Huh? That I'm giving extra only, na minimum two chia tha. One may I give three? It's okay, na. They don't say that if you give three, to give everywhere three. <laughs> Not required, actually. Check. So they are having over here. Can a management present a third P and L as an additional comparative? Yes. If management presents third P and L, is it necessary that that also has to be as per index? Yes. Yeah. So if you prepare, you prepare as per index. And can management prepare third P and L only, without preparing balance sheet, cash flow, statement of change, equity? Yes. The first one is third P and L. Can they prepare? Yes. Acha, is it required to be as per index? Yes. And comparative, can management present third P and L only? Answer is yes. Okay. Next question number eight. See, these are all type of tricky questions. It's not so easy. This one plus we did wo bridge wale and all that things. They're all tricky questions. A company while preparing financial statement for one two erroneously booked the revenue. Okay, one two may you did a erroneous booking of revenue, excess revenue ten crore. 
in two three you discovered. So can I say you are rectifying in two three? Error is related to one two. Can I say previous year? So I'll rectify previous year column. Okay. Do I need to prepare the third balance sheet? No, because the third balance sheet is not affected. So whether it is required to prepare third balance sheet? No. Okay. Now company wants to correct the error of two three by giving impact in current year column. Can I give the impact in current year? No. I have to rectify the previous year column. So no. Next. You have operating cycle 18 months. Your operating cycle 18 months. You have certain trade receivable payable which are payable within a period of 12 months from the reporting date. Fine. Let's see. There are some trade receivable which are due after 15 months, but I'm expecting a payment after the Achha, they are expected that payment will be received within operating cycle. Okay, we are expecting the payment to be received within operating cycle. Current. Current. Okay. Now, company has some trade payable which are due after 14 months and they fall due within the operating cycle, but we expect will pay after operating cycle. Now, see, for trade receivable or for current asset, the word is expect. For current liability, the word is due. So, I don't have to see here expected to be paid. I have to see here due. For current asset, the word is when I am expecting to realize. For current liability, the word is when it is due. Okay, so it's due. Uh, you don't expect to pay within operating cycle, but it is due within operating cycle. That so will be a current liability. Fine. Now let's see what the question is. I just go down. The company wants to present the trade receivable as current. Answer is yes. Company wants to show trade payable as non-current. They are due within operating cycle. The answer is no. It has to be shown as current. Next third one. You have got some award contract. As per the contract, you are given a security deposit, Phi CR. You are expected to get it in 18 months time. The contract, so the contract is expected to be completed in 18 months and then you will be refunded after 6 months from completion of contract. Okay, contract will be completed in 18 months plus 6 months. I will get it back when? 24 months. Operating cycle is 18. So, it is 24 months. So, can I say now it is non-current? 18 months my contract will get over. Another 6 months I will get it. The total after 24 months and the operating cycle is only 18 months. So, it is after operating cycle it is not correct. Okay. Coming back to the second one again. For liability, I have to see when they are due. If they are due within the operating cycle, they will be treated as? Okay. They are due within... Just a minute, let me just come back to the definition. Understood. Question. Okay. Now, when I see the definition of current asset expected to be realized in normal operating cycle or expected to be realized within 12, expect. Achha, pe expected to settle in normal operating cycle and here it's due to be settled within 12 months. Achha, it is not due to be settled within 12 months, it's due to be settled after how many months? 14 months and it's expected to be settled in normal operating cycle? No. So, it should come as non-current. So that is, should come as non-current. Let me just come back. If you see over here, they say liability is due when? After 14 months. It doesn't fall under point number C. And it's we do not expect to pay within normal operating cycle. It doesn't fall under A also. It doesn't fall under any of this. Answer should be non-current. The company wants to show it as non-current. Due within operating cycle. This is actually wrong answer. It should be non-correct. The word is expect. Now, coming to third one, can a security deposit of ICR, can a security deposit of ICR with a customer be classified as a current? Answer is no. We are going to get it after 24 months. Fourth point, check. We have a certain contract and we have received a security deposit of 2 CR. We have received a security deposit of how many CR? 2. Which are payable on completion of contract, but if 
contract is cancelled, it becomes payable immediately. Okay, so do I have an unconditional right to defer it? No, if they cancel, can I say I have to pay it in between? So I don't have an unconditional right to defer it for at least 12 months. It's current or non-current? Current. I do not have an unconditional right. It falls under that default. It's a current. Uh, they want to show it as non-current. Answer is yeah. Done. This was your in days one. Let's go to chapter number 15. Online students, any doubts, anybody? Keep replying, man. Okay, now chapter 15, analysis of financial statements. This is based on your schedule 3 only. So this chapter is nothing but we have to point out the errors which are there in financial statement. They will give you a financial statement. The classification is wrong. Presentation is wrong. That is what we are required to rectify. Now, first of all, characteristics of a good financial statement. It should show a true and fair view. It should show all the relevant information. It should be understandable. It should be consistent. It should comply with the regular well, the regulatory framework. And universality is nothing but it should be comparable with others. That's universality. It's comparable. Fine. Uh, information to be presented in OCI, we already did it. Two things, items which will be reclassified to PNL, item which will not be reclassified to PNL. We did it in detail. Now coming to illustration one, this is same which was there under your in days one also. We just now did the question OCI item or PNL and OCI may reclassified or not. The same question is there. It's just a copy paste. I'm not going for that. Come to question number two. Okay, the balance sheet of appropriate limited as that 31st March 16 is given to us. Uh, equity and liabilities, share capital, reserve surplus, employee stock option outstanding, application money refundable. Non-current liability, you have deferred tax liability. Now just check, you have a deferred tax asset also. And see they have written arising from Indian income tax. This is also arising from, so can I say same governing laws? And if it's the same governing laws, you will definitely offset and always pay what? Net. Achha, I have a question for you. Uh, suppose for a parent and there's a current tax asset of a subsidiary. Current tax liability for parent. The parent may provision for tax is more. Advance tax TDS is less. But for a subsidiary, they have some advance tax TDS more. Provision for tax is less. When we are preparing a CFS. When we are preparing a CFS, can current tax liability of parent, current tax asset of subsidiary be net of? Did you understood? Answer is no. Reason is we cannot set it off. Now imagine if subsidiary has paid more taxes, can I set it off against the parent's tax? No. Subsidiary has paid more taxes, subsidiary has to claim a refund and a parent which has paid less tax is required to pay the refund. So that cannot be set off. But this is not consolidated financial, this is just a normal one. Just this question came in my mind, so I asked you. Next, we have trade payables, fixed asset, capital work in progress, trade receivable, PL debit balance. Okay, PL debit balance, where does it appear actually? In your other equity, retained earnings negative. It should appear under this negative under retained earnings. We are required to comment on the presentation. We are just commenting as per division 2. Probably in your book, answer will be given as per division 1 also, division 2 also. Currently, we are just doing division 2. Okay, the first mistake is, can I say balance sheet should not start with equity and liabilities? It should start with assets. That's one. Then, basically, under your equity and liability, heading should come equity. Under equity, it has to be equity share capital. That's again a mistake. Then, there should be a other equity. Okay, employee stock option outstanding is nothing but SBPR. SBPR should be a part of other equity. That is also wrong. Application money which is refundable. Can I say it should come under your liability? So, under your other financial life, under current liability, current liability can the financial liability, under that other financial life. Deferred tax liability and asset, they are from same tax authorities. It has to be shown net. Take care. Trade payables is to be bifurcated on phase due to micro and small other than 
ठीक है नाउ इन योर नॉन करंट एसेट इन योर नॉन करंट एसेट दे रिटर्न फिक्स्ड एसेट टेंजिबल कैपिटल वर्क इन प्रोग्रेस नाउ देयर इज नथिंग कॉल्ड फिक्स्ड एसेट टेंजिबल द वर्ड टू बी यूज्ड इज व्हाट पीपी pp is to be used and capital work in progress is fine capital advances it doesn't come under capital work in progress capital advance will come under your other non current asset see when i give capital advance i'll be getting fixed asset it's advance given for purchase of fixed asset i'm not going to get cash it's not a contractual right to receive cash so it's not a financial asset it will come under other non current asset ठीक है देन ट्रेड रिसीवेबल इज फाइन डिफर्ड टैक्स हो गया पी एन एल शुड कम अंडर योर रिटेन चेक बैलेंस शीट शुड स्टार्ट विद एसेट ये पीपी होना चाहिए डिफर्ड टैक्स शुड बी शोन नेट करंट ट्रेड रिसीवेबल शेल बी अंडर द हेडिंग ऑफ फिनेंशियल एसेट फिनेंशियल एसेट अंडर दैट देर विल बी ट्रेड रिसीवेबल दिस शुड बी इक्विटी इक्विटी इज मिसिंग अदर इक्विटी रिटेन अर्निंग डेबिट बैलेंस इज फाइन शेयर एप्लीकेशन मनी रिफंडेबल विल कम अंडर योर फाइनेंशियल लायबिलिटी अदर फाइनेंशियल लायबिलिटी ओके ट्रेड पेएबल्स टू बी बाय पर क्रेडिट ड्यूस टू माइक्रो एंड स्मॉल अदर देन माइक्रो नेक्स्ट वन क्वेश्चन नंबर 3 दीपक स्टार्टेड अ न्यू कंपनी सॉफ्ट भारती लिमिटेड विद इक्तारा लिमिटेड वेयर इन्वेस्टमेंट इज डन 55% बाय इक्तारा एंड रेस्ट बाय दीपक तो इन सॉफ्ट भारती हाउ मच परसेंट इज हेल्ड बाय इक्तारा 55. तो कैन आई से सॉफ्ट पार्टी इज अ सब्सिडरी ऑफ इक्तारा इक्तारा इज पेरेंट सॉफ्ट पार्टी इज सब्सिडरी फाइन दे आर टू डायरेक्टर्स दिस हायर्ड सम कंसलटेंट 30000 रुपीस दे चार्ज व्हिच वेंट इनटू पीएनएल इक्तारा प्रिपेयर्स एज पर इंडेस ओके इफ इक्तारा फॉलोस इंडेस द सब्सिडरी सॉफ्ट पार्टी आल्सो हैज टू फॉलो इंडेस फाइन एंड दिस इज बेसिकली दे हैव गिवन द स्टेटमेंट ऑफ पीएनएल ऑफ सॉफ्ट पार्टी and balance sheet of soft party fine date is march 22 in balance sheet they have to follow indes so can it start with equity and liability no so your parent is following indes you are also required to follow indes this is wrong let's go down a uh, deferred tax liability 6000 is created due to temporary difference in depreciation as per income tax an accounting profit okay now if you just check below the second point pp as per books is 1 lakh as per income tax is 80 okay so can i say in income tax we do got some extra 20000 depreciation okay income tax mein we got extra 20000 depreciation so can i say income tax mein as extra depreciation was there profit as per income tax was less the profit as per income tax was less can i say we would have paid less tax now future i have to pay more tax so i have to create DTL. So twenty thousand is difference. Twenty thousand is thirty percent. How much it comes? Six. And that's why they are telling six thousand is the DTL. Did you understood? Very simple. If profit as per income tax is less today, we pay less tax now, leading to more tax to be paid in future. We create DTL. Okay. Pre incorporation expenses. Uh, if you just saw thirty thousand rupees was the incorporation expenses which we have charged it in PL. Now income tax may preliminary expenses are allowed over a period of okay. The books may we got expense thirty. Income tax may it's only six thousand thirty divided by five. Okay, so can I say twenty four will be allowed in future? Okay, so today I paid more taxes. Future I have to pay less. I have to create what DTA. So twenty four thousand into thirty percent seven two double zero will be DTA. Okay, seven two double zero will be DTA. now current tax is calculated 30% on pbt without doing any adjustments relating to income tax okay if i just go up if you see pbt is 355 question mein and do 355 is 30% you get 106500 did you get it so can i say they have taken current tax as whatever is pbt into 30% my question whether your current tax is based on profit as per books or profit as per income tax so it should not be 30% of profit as per books it has to be profit as per income tax if i just go down they are telling they are telling the correct current tax after doing necessary adjustment of allowance disallowances it will come as 125 750 so in our books we had 106 something it has to be increased to 125 700 so current tax will go up so can i say opposite your current tax liability also will go up 
तो बैलेंस शीट में करंट टैक्स लायबिलिटी गोज अप इन पी एन एल द करंट टैक्स एक्सपेंस गोज अप ठीक है ओके डायरेक्टर्स हैव रेकमेंडेड अ डिविडेंड व्हेन आफ्टर द रिपोर्टिंग पीरियड आफ्टर रिपोर्टिंग पीरियड दे रेकमेंडेड डिविडेंड रेकमेंडेड इज व्हाट प्रपोज्ड डू वी नीड टू पास एंट्री नो बट व्हाट हैज हैपेंड व्हिच हैज बीन डिडक्टेड फ्रॉम रिजर्व्स एंड सरप्लस एंड दिस डिविडेंड पेएबल अपीयर्स अंडर व्हाट अदर करंट लायबिलिटी तो कैन आई से एंट्री शुड नॉट बी डन वी हैव डिडक्टेड फ्रॉम रिजर्व सरप्लस सो वी विल ऐड इट इन रिजर्व सरप्लस एंड वी विल रिमूव दैट 15000 फ्रॉम अदर करंट लायबिलिटीज Okay, there are some government dues fifteen thousand, which are grouped under other current liability. Now let's do one thing. What is the other current liability given? Forty-five. Out of forty-five, fifteen is reversed. Oh, dividend wrongly. So can I say now thirty? Out of thirty, how much is government payable? Statutory due, how much it is? Fifteen. Now that fifteen should not come here. It should go under other. No, that should come here. Remaining should go under other financial liability. statute government dues government dues is not contractual obligation contractual obligation will go where financial liability so out of other current liability 45 15 is reversed another 15 which is payable to government will continue and remaining 15 15 15 15 okay na 45 remaining 15 will be a contractual liability that will go in other financial liability other 15 will go in other financial liability Okay, capital advances of five fifty thousand are grouped under other non-current asset. Okay, now if I just go to other non-current asset, do you see fifty? What are this? Capital advances. Where does capital advance appear? Here only. Here only. Capital advances. It's basically advance for purchase of fixed asset. Last question, mate, was given in CWIP, not in this question. So it is basically. I am going to get fixed asset. I don't have a contractual right to receive cash. If it was a contractual right to receive cash, I would have taken under financial asset. But here it will continue under other current, other non-current asset. There is no adjustment required. Next, uh, other current asset fifty-one thousand includes or comprises interest receivable from trade receivable. अच्छा interest receivable from debtor. Debtor paying late, we have to take interest. Now see, there will be a contract for it. If you see any invoice also, na, if amount is paid after thirty days, this much interest will be levied. So, वो एक type का contract हो गया. So basically, this is a contractual right to receive cash. It should come under your other financial asset. So under your current asset, financial asset. Under that other financial asset. Okay, there is a current investment thirty thousand in shares. Okay, now if you remember investment in equity. Normally it is FPT PNL. If you go for irrevocable option, then only it's FPT OCI. Otherwise, it's always FPT PNL. Okay, the FPT PNL may thirty thousand is there. Now this is carried at cost. This is wrong. Fair value is fifty. So can I continue at cost? No, nothing. And if irrevocable option they don't tell means we are not choosing. If you are not choosing irrevocable option, it should go where FPT PNL thirty is now becoming fifty. So can I say twenty thousand will go in PNL? Now the problem is. Twenty will go in PNL. That's fine. Asset goes up. Okay. Did you pay tax right now? No. You have to pay tax when future asset has gone up. You have a profit right now, but tax you will pay in future. You have to create a DTL. Twenty ka thirty percent is six thousand rupee DTL. So now if you see DTA DTL ka adjustment, first six thousand DTL coming due to depreciations. Six thousand again DTL coming due to equity shares, fair valuation. And seventy two hundred of DTA came due to pre incorporation expense. That is your preliminary expense. So check out the net twelve minus seven to four eight double zero is what DTL. Okay, if I just go down to the solution, last point. Okay, did you find four eight double zero DTL? One is PP me six thousand DTL. Current investments we fair valued six thousand DTL and pre incorporation me seven two double zero DTL. Okay, coming back, uh, there's an actuarial gain on employee benefit of thousand, which has been omitted in the financials. Okay, M actuarial gain, actuarial gain hoga. So liability goes up or down? Actuary did some remeasurement, and there's actuarial gain. So liability will go down, and this gain will be recorded where? OCI. So OCI me thousand rupee gain, thousand rupee gain, and liability will go. Down for it. 
एंड प्लस उसके रिलेटेड बेसिकली ऑल्सो वी कैन है If I just go over here, OCI, OCI, where is it? Okay. Item not reclassified to PNL, remeasurement of defined benefit plan thousand. Uska related tax impact is three hundred. Net becomes seven hundred. And liability, liability basically, if at all, if we see over here, seven hundred. Our liability will go. Down your thousand liability goes down by thousand three hundred will come under what DTL the DTL me three hundred added so forty eight hundred plus three hundred total became fifty one forty eight hundred we already calculated this three hundred and total DTL becomes five one double zero done all the points remaining you can just go through it. all points we have discussed it this was your chapter fifteen let's come to chapter thirteen. Business combination. Or we do one thing. We take up two small chapters. Chapter sixteen, seventeen. कर ले. Integrated reporting and corporate social responsibility. After the break, we'll start with business combination. Okay. Come to chapter sixteen first. Count it as seven p.m. both the days. Count it as seven p.m. both the days. Nine a.m. to seven p.m. Okay. Now going to this integrated reporting. Uh, first of all, what is this concept of integrated reporting? Uh, just take up any of the startups. Like suppose an academy is there, or Swiggy is there, or Zomato is there. If at all people who are investing in this all companies, they don't see the revenues as of now. They basically focus on what. one how is the plan outlook of the company what they are planning to do later on second they will try to see is how the subscriber base is getting increased number of people coming on the portal are increased that is what basically the look is now our financial statements which we see over here they are constantly or just focused only on financial sides so that does not give a proper view or holistic view which is required So integrated reporting is kind of giving a holistic view, covering not just the financial information but also non-financial information. In this, they will show where we are, where we want to reach, how we are going to reach. That all thing is relevant. If someone goes, like suppose an academy wants a new funding, if they want a new funding, can I say they will go and pitch to investor about past, or they will go and pitch to investor about what they are going to do? Can I say future? This is a. These are the plans we have. This is how we are going to reach over there, and this is the fund required. This will be used in this, 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 this way. That is what you are required to pitch it. So if I just go by the past financial, seeing the financial, someone will throw it and dustbin only say go out. Yeah, if you see any of the startup car financial statement, it's not worth looking only. लगे क्या ये क्या कर रहे? So point is, you need to have a integrated reporting, which is basically. relevant and actually giving more details which is required for the people to take the timely proper decisions now as of today integrated reporting is not there basically as per the law so whatever integrated reporting is given over here it's just a kind of a uh, kind of you can have it voluntarily if you want to add it in your financial statements or you want to add it in your annual report you can add this thing but as of now officially nobody is required to prepare this integrated report now question uh whenever this integrated reporting thing comes up like law doesn't tell you to prepare but can i say every company's goal how they are going to achieve that plans everything will be different if you know zomato and swiggy two things are there usme one of them has a plan to enter some different space other might not be having like suppose swiggy has started going into this uh groceries also but zomato has not gone into groceries now zomato ka plan might be different it is possible one wants to go in groceries other wants to go in some other field also so can i have a common format of integrated reporting which is applicable to all entities no because see this is showing what i want to do how i'll reach over there and my plans your plans will be completely what different so that's why there cannot be a standard format which is applicable for integrated report clear with this okay let's see over here so 
international integrated reporting council was set up to come out with some integrated reporting framework the integrated reporting framework and this international integrated reporting council may who are the people there are regulators there are investors there are company there are standard setters everybody is there so that they can all contribute and tell this way the integrated reporting should be done okay now if i go by the definition name suggest we integrate both financial and non financial information in future this will be the only report which will be issued by organization but we don't know future and i tell you something when we had this old syllabus of ca final before you there was a well, you all are new syllabus old syllabus of ca final there were chapters called economic value added there was chapter of value added there was one chapter of mba so there were two three four chapters which were there they were also kind of future reporting will be this syllabus me se nikal gaya so they did not came up now syllabus only doesn't have that so same way this is also like expected to come up in future what will come up what will not we don't know uh, it's a concept that has been created to better articulate include articulate means include a broader range of measures which contribute to a long term and the role organization plays in society it is enhancing the way company thinks plans and reports their story of business what company thinks about them what they are planning and they are just reporting their story of business theek hai it's a concise communication about the strategy the governance the performance the prospects everything and how you are going to create value in short term medium term long term for your people it shows what is your current position where you want to go and how you are going to reach over there theek hai now primary purpose is to provide explanation to the providers of capital how you will create value for them someone who is contributing capital to you how you are going to create value to them that's the purpose now salient feature is important uh, see this cannot be rule based it cannot be like strictly on rules there are principles which will be there it will be more of principle based approach second this is more focused on private sectors so whatever integrated reporting frameworks which are came up by basically iirc international integrated reporting council they have came out basically with some frameworks basis framework are nothing but the basis which will be used to prepare that integrated reporting they have came out with the basis which are more based on private sector companies but it can also be adapted by public sector ones as well Uh, identifiable communication means um, is it necessary that integrated reporting has to be a separate report only no it can be a part of your annual report it can be a separate report anything it can be so it can be either a stand alone report or included as a distinguishable accessible part of some other communication as well it will cover financial and non financial both the things and it will show how the company is going to create value for its investors how it will create value for itself and for others how it's going to create value for itself and for others so salient features principle based approach targets finance uh, of private sector but it can also be used for what non profit making also identifiable communication financial non financial both things and how value creation will happen now the types of capital when we say that uh, how it will create value for the providers of capital they say capital is divided into six parts and we want to grow the capital capital doesn't mean only financial capital like suppose i tell you i have a intellectual property right can i say it's a intangible asset i want to have lots and lots of intellectual property right so that is also that's a intellectual capital which is to be enhanced so it's not financial it's intellectual okay plant capacity we want to enhance so that's basically your production capital kind of the manufacturing capital so one is financial capital we already know second is manufactured capital kind of plant capacity intellectual capital is kind of your intangible asset wala thing human capital is number of employees today we are having staff of 10 people we want to make it a staff of 200 people i don't care about profitability but 200 people should get employment so that's human capital social and relationship capital how company is known to people brand image of company in people we want to grow that and natural capital is how company cares for natural resources so that's basically the natural capital so it's not only financial capital which is look but all the various types of capital are content 
there cannot be a specified content every company will have a own way of reporting their own story but there are few things which should be included which is given under the framework which is came up from iirc so integrated report includes the eight content you cannot have a standard structure they are not intended to serve a standard structure but this is what if you are covering plus other things whatever you want to give that's fine but this is just the basic thing which we are recommending okay now if you see the word the eight content elements suggested by the framework okay what is this framework this is integrated reporting framework who came out with this framework iirc so they came out with some bases thoda kuch base denge to people will start doing it if i just tell you start integrated reporting i don't know what is integrated reporting nothing will happen so some bases they have given they say try to report or include all these things eight points are there now for eight points they have given over here the questions if you answer the questions automatically this is what is to be included first organizational overview you have to give and the external environment so what does your company do which are the products in the, which you are dealing do you operate only in india or abroad so that's kind of what organizational overview and environment which is affecting you like the foreign currency affects us a lot uh, how is the market in us also that also affects us a lot that all what is basically to be given organization overview usme culture ethics ownership principal activities competition position of yours key numbers number of employees revenue thode key numbers external environment legal commercial social political environmental what is affecting you so if you see the question na they have written what does the organization do and what are the circumstances under which it operates what does the organization do is overview what are the circumstances in which it operates is external environment next governance governance is your hierarchy your structures so how your structure is framed to ensure you achieve your goals which you have kept your short term medium term long term goals so your hierarchy your structure which you have kept that will be based on that so how the governance structure support the ability to create value in short term medium term long term who are the leaders unke basically qualifications culture ethics etc under one person how many people are there you know span of control word span of control is one person is covering how many subordinates if one person covers 1000 subordinates he can't manage but if one person covers 20 subordinates probably he can cover better so that all things basically is there third one the business model one was organizational overview external environment second was your structure governance structure third one is what business model in your business model you tell about your input your business activities your output and outcomes so input is fine understandable your activities what do you do what differentiates you from others kya hai so how you differentiate yourself in market what is your business model etc that is basically business activities output outcomes are both internal and external see output doesn't mean basically output is basically i put some input and i get the uh, finished goods that's output but outcome is because of that our quality of product are very good so can i say customer base becomes a loyal customer base to so outcome it's not output it is a outcome because we have a very good quality product repeated customers are coming more to outcome so if you check over here there's a internal outcome employee morale both positive as well as negative outcome both can be there external outcome customer satisfaction brand loyalty social environmental effect they are all outcomes okay the so third we'll be talking about basically your business model fourth we are talking about is risk and opportunities which are there in our business So what are the risk and what are the opportunities fifth strategy and resource allocation we might be doing more than one businesses so how we are allocating our resources strategy etc performance how did we do now this year this year went over to so this year ka performance so we are talking about performance qualitative quantitative both ways outlook is about future performance is about what happened this year outlook is about future and last basis of preparation and general reporting guide etc so these are few things which are said which should be covered in your integrated reporting exam angle not much relevant now is it mandatory to have integrated reporting as per any laws in india 
No, has SEBI said something that listed companies should prepare integrated reporting? Advised, advised. Yeah, so if you just check over here, SEBI has advised top 500 companies to adopt integrated reporting. Is it mandatory? No, it's just advised. And over here, they have clearly said, you may provide it in annual report. Or uh, if you ever see annual report, in annual report there are financials and there are so many other reports. One report is called as Management Discussion and Analysis Report, MDA. So audit also we have a question in chapter of corporate governance. So Management Discussion and Analysis Report, in that also the management can include the points related to integrated report. Achha, to one, you can provide it in annual report separately or include it together with Management Discussion and Analysis Report or by a separate report. Now my question. See, many points of integrated reporting are already covered under management discussion, analysis report or board of directors report. So, again, should I give it under integrated reporting or I can just give a reference of theirs? Did you understood? Some points of integrated reporting are already covered somewhere else. If I again put it under integrated reporting, it's a duplication. So for that points, can I just give a reference that refer this point of board report, refer this point of management discussion, analysis report? Answer is yes. So you already provided the relevant information in some other reports, you are required to just give a reference. As a green initiative, they are just trying to say that you can host it on your website rather than basically giving a printout to anyone. Just you can put it on website and give a reference of the same in annual report. See annual report we generally send to our shareholders. If you don't want to print all these things and you don't want to accumulate all these things, in annual report you can just put a reference that integrated report is put up on our website but this all is not mandatory it is just advised okay question this was asked in november 2020 exam state whether following are true or false integrated reporting is necessarily a standalone report false yeah in the framework for integrated reporting is written primarily for private companies no primary it is written for private companies it can also be adapted by others but primarily written for whom private true a uh, report prepared as per the local laws, like some local laws or some local people, they need some reporting. You have done that reporting, which contains a management commentary or other reports that provide the context of financial statement, serve the purpose of integrated report. It means like some laws, regulation required to give some extra details, not just financial, other things also. So, whatever you are given additionally, can that also serve as integrated reporting? Yes, purpose to why you wanted to give something that is something given extra. The answer is yes. Integrated reporting should have only positive matters. No, it can have both positive and negative. Then one more chapter we do, then we take a break. Chapter number 17 is corporate social responsibility. Chapter 17 is CSR. Now, what do you mean by the word CSR? It is, they say CSR means and includes but not limited to programs and projects which are covered under Schedule 7. Schedule 7 of basically your Companies Act is Schedule 7 of Companies Act. They have given you a list of activities which you can do under CSR. But does it mean that only that activities are covered under CSR? No, there can be other activities also which might not be there in Schedule 7. It means and include but not limited to. Programs, projects which are as per Schedule 7 and project, program projects which are undertaken by the Board of Directors of the company based on the recommendation of CSR committee. So, they have given some limits. If limits are crossed, you have to have a CSR committee. CSR committee will recommend a CSR policy and based on CSR policy, the Board of, directions are requir board of Directors are required to take actions. Okay, now, which companies need to have a CSR? This is important. Which companies need to have CSR? So, limits are given. If you are covered in limit, you have to have a CSR committee. CSR committee will recommend the policy. Who will implement it? Board of Directors. Okay. Every company, including its holding or subsidiary. Every company, including its holding or subsidiary. Okay. Every company having either net worth 500 crores or more, turnover 1000 crores or more, net profit 5 crores or more immediately preceding financial year. I have to see the limits of which here. 
last two three years back it was basically last three years that was three years back it was past three years i have to see but as of now it's only the a net profit of five crores or more then we are required to have csr committee form now question i don't cross the limit my parent crosses the limit to me is it applicable see the written every company including its holding and subsidy to you it is applicable it's also applicable to your holding and subsidiary yeah. okay so then you are required to constitute a csr committee consisting of three or more directors out of that one has to be an independent director but if you are not required to have independent director as per your section 149 of your companies act then in that case you don't need three directors then you need only two directors fine now question there is a company which is a section 8 company there is a company which is a section 8 company i do that thing only do i also have to do csr sir my whole business is csr do i still need to do csr answer is yes so still if you cross the limit you are required to have a csr committee formed and you are required to spend have 2% of average net profit on csr activities anyways you are having csr activity but still you need to constitute a csr committee okay now what is the role of committee formulate and recommend formulate karke they will recommend to board the policy and amount of expenditure which should be incurred they will just recommend policy is recommended by them and monitor the policy from time to time this is the work of committee okay what is the role of board what is the role of board disclose the composition of csr committee in its report its report means board of directors report approve the csr committee who recommended the committee who recommend the policy committee recommend the policy they will approve disclose the content of policy on its website and its report this is important is cube question aaya tha are they required to disclose the content of csr policy in the website answer is yes as well as bod report what written is bod report and website ensure that the activities are duly executed plus ensure that you are required to spend at least how much 2% of average net profit of last 3 years 2% of average net profit of last 3 years so whether csr is applicable or not limits of only last last year is to be seen if csr applicable the spending is 2% of average net profit of last 3 years now if i spend extra okay 2% se jyada if i spend can i carry it forward yes answer is yes 2 years back it was not allowed now you can okay how many years i can carry forward next 3 years how many years 3 years so if at all you spend extra you can carry it over for such number of years it's actually 3 it will come up later this point is again coming up later now if i don't spend what should i do i have to spend 2% of average net profit if i don't spend now two things one the project is ongoing there's a project ongoing we are spending but our 2% have not spent the remaining amount i have to keep it in a separate bank account within 30 days for ongoing project whatever amount remain unspent you have to keep it in a separate bank account within 30 days and you spend it within 3 years separate bank account 30 days spend it within 3 but i don't have ongoing project i'm not spending only then you give it to government government will spend na so then you are required to give that money you have to deposit to a fund jaise we have investor education protection fund that was separate we have a similar kind of fund established by government which is for csr which you are not done so you have to deposit money to a fund which is established by the central government within 6 months from the end of financial year okay the project going on you keep it in a separate bank account within 30 days no ongoing project you are not spending within 6 months you are required to give it to whom the government specified fund of government you deposit within 6 months sir what if i don't do it i don't care penalty lagega man penalty on company twice the amount which was to be transferred separate bank account or fund wherever twice the amount which was to be transferred or rupees 1 crore whichever is less officer in default one tenth of the amount required to be transferred or rupees 2 lakh whichever is less clear okay now amount which you have to spend on csr if it does not exceed 50 lakhs 
If amount whatever you have to spend on CSR average net profit is coming less than 50 lakh rupees, then you don't need to have a committee because a committee form karo, committee does all the things that becomes a bit headache. Then in that case, your BOD can directly function without having a CSR committee. If the amount CSR ka amount does not exceed 50 lakhs. There was a question on this. Okay, now we have this Save Trees Foundation. In Save Trees Foundation, you might have seen a book of ITC. ITC ka book aapne dekha hoga. They say that out of every book purchase, one rupee will go to Save Trees Foundation. Achha, by writing that in the book, is CSR done? No, they have to really do it. So, consequently, company sold 25,000 packs. 20,000 was recognized as CSR. However, they have not paid anything to that Save Trees Foundation. Is it a CSR? Answer is no. Okay. CSR activities can I conduct abroad? I there are so many poor countries. Our Sri Lanka has become very poor right now. So I did something for Sri Lanka. They did not have money. I gave them food grains. They did not have petrol. We gave them some petrol. So is that covered under CSR? No. Only India may amount what you spend is covered under CSR. Okay, I do something for betterment of my employees. Employees, parent, employees, kids. Uske liye old age home banata hu, uske liye schools banata hu. Is that covered? No, if you do anything related to employee, that's a staff welfare expense. That's not covered under CS. And political party, if you contribute directly, indirectly, that's not CSR. That money is gone in wrong hands. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next. Accounting for CSR, whenever you are spending on CSR, CSR will be always your revenue expenditure. As it's a revenue expenditure, it will go in PL. Now, someone told me that, sir, for CSR, we constructed a school building. What is capital expenditure? Hua? Now question, would you have a control over that asset? If you are running the school, you will still have a control over asset. But if school, you gave it to government to run. Can I say I don't have a control? Chalo, control, chodo, second. Would you have any future economic benefits? And remember, asset is something. Asset is a resource controlled by an enterprise arising out of past events and which is going to give you what? Future economic benefit. So CSR, may there cannot be a capital expenditure it will always be which type of expenditure is revenue expenditure so we take csr in pm whenever we say sir oh, asset ki definition is not getting fulfilled it's always a controversy provision for unspent we already did it ongoing project we are required to transfer sorry other than ongoing project we are required to transfer to a fund within how many months six months and if it's an ongoing project we are required to transfer within 30 days to a separate bank account now question i have not spent I have to transfer to fund or I have to transfer to bank account. 31st March, should I show a liability in books? Liability for transfer to fund or liability for transfer to separate bank account. Provision has to be shown. You have to transfer it. Nah? So you are required to show that thing. The question is whether provision is required. The provision for liability to the extent amount is to be transferred needs to be recognized. Same way here also. Provision for amount which is to be transferred to the separate bank account needs to be done. Provision for liability for amount representing the extent to which amount needs to be transferred needs to be recognized. Did you understood? Okay, excess amount, can I carry it forward? Answer is yes. For how many years? Three. But it's up to you. Reason they've said minimum you have to spend is 2% of average net profit. I am happy spending 3%. I don't want to carry over. Next year I'll spend again 3 so if I don't want to carry it, it's up to me. If I want to carry it, I should show it as a prepaid expense in my book. If you want to carry over, you have to show it as asset, prepaid expense. If you don't want to carry over, then you show full as expense only. Then you don't show anything as prepaid. Imagine you spent three, required was two. So one option is expense three to bank three. Second option is expense two, prepaid expense one to bank three. It's up to you. November 2020, this was asked, uh, as a part of CSR, we contributed 15 lakh towards education of girl child. Average net profit is 7 crores. Okay, do one thing, 2% of 7 crores is 14 lakhs. We spend how much? 15. Company wants to carry forward the 1 lakh rupee. Can it do so? Yes. As per the current law of land, you can carry over. But if company decides not to carry over, then you should record full 15 lakh as expense. Okay, if I do CSR in kind, like uh, imagine uh, HUL, Hindustan Unilever Limited, they are 
giving toothpaste or they are giving soaps or they are giving basically some other items, FMCG items, biscuits, etc. in CSR. So if at all they are distributing their product in CSR, the CSR amount will be what? The sales price or the cost price? Cost price. So CSR will be the cost. Achha, now, if I give that product at a discounted rate, imagine there is a flood coming in Tamil Nadu and Tamil Nadu we are distributing this all products at 50%. Is it a CSR? No, that's not CSR. If you spend, if you give them at a discounted rate, it's not CSR. That's an ordinary course of business. Because many times in ordinary course, we come out with discounts. But if you give completely free of cost, it's a CSR and the CSR amount will be equal to the cost. Next. Uh, income earned from CSR project. Now, if at all there is some CSR project, like say for example, you might have seen many times we do some stage shows wherein the reputed people come but all the amounts will be going to what charity so if at all such type of events are conducted an event may be charged something from the people tickets etc and whatever amount we have received that all things basically just one minute huh? okay. that all things whatever is realized from that event is also to be spent on CSR later. Any income from CSR has to be spent on CSR and this will be other than the 2% of average net profit which will happen every year. Fine. Accounting entries for CSR. What is the accounting entries for CSR when you spend CSR expenditure to bank? If it is basically in kind to so CSR expenditure to your purchases or COGS. If you are not fully spent, if you are not fully spent CSR expense to cash what you have spent and remaining you have to deposit to a fund. Government wala 135 subsection 5. 135 subsection 6 is your ongoing project that is to be transferred to a separate bank account. And lastly, if you are spent in excess, one is you record expense, second is you have a prepaid. It's up to you want to show prepaid or not. And lastly, it is to cash purchases or COGs. It's what you have spent. So out of 3 rupee, 2 is my expense, and so cash is 3, expense is 2, and 1 rupee I show it as prepaid. Uh, disclosures, this is fine, not relevant. Okay, cessation. When can I stop from CSR? Okay, they say we have to check the limits of last year. Okay, last year is covered. Last year my limits crossed. This year CSR applicable. This year limits are not crossed. The next year, not applicable? No. Once applicable, it's mandatory applicable for three years. The so last year you crossed. Imagine 21, 22 you crossed. So now 22, 23, 23, 24. 24, 25. This three years will be mandatory. Then you can go out of it. So once applicable, it will be applicable for three consecutive financial years. Check over here. In 2001, the profit exceeded 5 crores. 2001, the profit exceeded 5 crores. Now you discharge the obligation in 2002. So 1 May it crossed. 2002 May you did it. Now 2 May the limits are not crossed. So whether in 2003 you are still required to do it? Yes. 1 May it crossed, right? 1 May it crossed. So now it will be applicable for 2002, 2003, 2000. Four. To check answer, it will be applicable from 2002, 3 and 4. Then you can stop spending. Any doubts? Anybody till now? Okay, now we take a break of half an hour. Lunch break, aram se lete. And then we'll meet again. We'll start with business combination. After business combination, we'll do consolidated financial statement. And then we'll go to in days 2, in days 16, in days 38, in days 40. This much minimum. Kuch extra hota hai. We'll do all this. Kal hai na? Chalo, enjoy your break. See you after 30 minutes. Okay, uh, shall we move it? Okay, now open up chapter number 13, business combination. Okay, there was a question from Ramesh. Uh, Sir, how many years CSR expenditure which you have spent excess can be carried forward? Next year or three years? Three years. Three years. It can be carried forward for three years. Okay, there was one more question during break which was asked. Uh, Sir, if it is share based payment with cash alternative, if at all they are going for cash, SBPL we will pay off to bank. 
and SBPR goes to retain earnings. If they go for shares, what do we do? If they go for shares, SBPL gets converted into capital. SBPR will still go to retained earnings. So it's not SBPL to SBPR and then all of SBPR gets converted into capital. Don't do that. SBPL will get converted into capital and SBPR balance will go to retained earnings. Okay, now starting with chapter number 13, business combination. Now, what do you mean by the word business combination? It's a transaction in which acquirer obtains control of another business. Word which is basically there is, you are obtaining control over another business. Take it. Now, control can be by way of two ways. One, I take over their assets, liabilities, that is by net assets. I took over assets, liabilities, that company shut down. That is one way I get a control. Or second, I take a controlling interest in that company. So that company is still there, but I bought 60% of that company or 70% of that company or 100% of that company. That is by way of equity interest. The so control is either by acquiring net asset or by acquiring a significant equity interest. Now, whenever you are acquiring net assets, if I just go to my accounting standards, I take over assets and liabilities, that entity is closed. It's called as amalgamation. AS14. But in case I acquire a significant equity interest, A Limited acquired 70% in B Limited. We acquired 70% shares of B Limited. Can I say B Limited is still in existence? We will remain. B becomes my subsidiary and I have to prepare a consolidated financial statement. Now, if you are preparing a consolidated financial statement, the preparation of consolidated financial statement, it's not governed by 103. How to prepare a consolidated financial statement when you are a subsidiary? That's covered by 110 in days 110. Fine. Now, the word written was acquirer obtains control over another business. So, for a business combination, what we are acquiring has to be a business. Now, what do we mean by a business? It's an integrated set of activities and asset. It's an integrated set of activities and asset which is capable of being conducted and managed which is going to give returns which is going to give returns so it's integrated set of activities and asset now imagine there is one company they just have they just have say for example three warehouses which are given on rent they just have three warehouses given on rent they don't have any employee or they have only one employee imagine if i take over that three warehouses or three basically if i take over that entire company also it's not a business taken over. It's just basically three asset taken over. So accounting cannot be by way of business combination. Accounting has to be by way of asset activation. You have this. So for a business combination, there has to be a business. Business is integrated set of activities and assets which are capable of being managed in order to provide returns. There has to be input. There has to be input. There has to be process which will lead to creation of output. So, one, you need uh, input, second, you need a process, third is output. And the process has to be a substantive process. The process has to be which type? Substantive. Now, what do you mean by the word substantive process? Uh, they have defined it over here, substantive process. Suppose that business, that business does not have output today. If that business does not have output today. The process is such which is critical for creation of output. The process is which type? It is crit critical to develop <coughs> the output or basically or convert your input into output. If it is a critical process and the word two things are written. The process has to be critical for creating output and the input is basically an organized workforce and other inputs. The input includes organized workforce and other inputs. The simple words, if they don't have output today, the process has to be a critical one and the input should not be a generalized input. The input should be which one? Organized input and some other input. Now, sir, what is the organized input? If you have a skilled labor, if you have a skilled labor and that skilled labor ka team is coming to me, that's an organized input which is coming. But if at all, all un unorganized things are coming, whether I take over your employees or not, it doesn't matter to me, then in that case, the inputs are not coming. <coughs> okay. So, if output is not there, the process has to be such which is kind of critical for creating output and the process and the inputs which we are acquiring has to be which type? Organized workforce and other inputs. Okay, but if there is output, imagine output is there today. 
there is output in that company and I am taking over that company, outputs are there. So, process, when do I say it is a substantive process? The process is basically critical for continuing the output. So, it is critical for continuing the output or, or, yahan pe word is not and, yahan pe word is or, it significantly contributes to the ability of continuing processing output and is considered a kind of unique or scarce. The process jo hai, it is not a simple process, it is unique or scarce and it cannot be replaced without significant efforts. Okay, imagine. Uh, I have a manual system in which we are basically doing the production. If you want to change my production, can I say it will involve a significant amount to you? So when you are changing that whole process, automation, but the thing is that current process is also a substantive process because unless you spend a significant amount, you are not able to change. So something which is scarce or something which cannot be changed easily without a significant cost, that is also said to be a substantive process. Okay? So, that is basically the definition given. Now, this concentration test is important. What is this concentration test? I took over your business. Many assets, liabilities came. I took over your business. Many assets, liabilities came. Now, ignore liabilities. So, whatever assets came. Suppose I took your assets and suppose assets ka value is 100. Out of 100, if 90 rupees building only. The total assets coming are 100. But out of 100, 90 rupees what? One building. So actually, it's not a business takeover. It's actually what asset acquisition because it's ninety rupees is just building only. Other rupee, other things are only just ten rupee. So then, in that case, we don't say it's a business acquisition. Then we say it is a asset acquisition. And asset acquisition is not accounted as per India's one zero three. Okay. So how do I do this concentration test? If concentration test is met, concentration test is met means out of hundred ninety is at one place only. So is it a business combination or no? No, if concentration test is met, it is not a business combination. If concentration test is not met, means one thing, one asset is not the main thing, there are many things. If concentration test is not met, then I have to check other things and then I have to decide whether it is a business combination or so concentration test met, not a business combination. Concentration test not met may be a business combination. Did you understood this word? Okay. <clears throat> Now, what are the steps for concentration test? So, I need to find out the fair value of gross asset. I need assets. Now, how do I find fair value of gross asset? Don't try to basically do the fair value of assets given. No, not that way. I am paying you something. Now, I acquired 70%. So, can I say that is 70% I paid to you and 30% will be NCI. So, what is the fair value of NCI? Whatever shares they are holding, unka fair value or whatever. So, what I paid to you is for 70% business plus if I add NCI's value, can I say this is nothing but 100% of business? Okay, 100% of business includes assets and liabilities, both are only asset. I paid something plus NCI, 70% plus 30%, this is 100% of your business. So, can I say it's my asset liability, dono agya? If I want only asset, if I want only asset, so can I say this is net assets? This is net asset. If I want only asset, what should I do? Add the liability. Did you understood? Okay, then I'll see you over here. First, how to find out the fair value of gross asset? Okay, one, what you have paid, fair value of consideration, transfer. Okay, TK. Now, this K and there you also include the fair value of NCI. And if you had already some previous equity interest, to be fair value. So basically, it's a fair value of my holding plus basically NCI. So can I say 70% what I acquired today? I paid you this much. If I pay you today, that is the fair value only. And 30% NCI, I am taking fair value. This is the fair value of your business. But I want only gross asset. What should I do? Add back liability. Then you find the fair value of liability B. And if you see over here, A plus B. Did you got A plus B? If I add back liability, then now it is only asset. But they are telling, you do not calculate or you do not take up in the asset cash that you do not take. Second, you don't take basically over here DTA because DTA is not really an asset. It's just future ke liye something and the goodwill resulting from DTA. Okay, now imagine I took over your business. In your business, there was 500 crore rupees of cash and now I'm paying you also in basically PC extra 500 crores because you already had a cash. So when I took PC, PC may have paid you for cash. Cash ke liye payment should not be done. So, when I am seeing your assets which are coming to me, I want to check your assets which are other than
cash other than DT, what are the real assets coming? That I want to check out. So that's why when I had your net assets, what I paid to you 70% plus NCI got 30%, that was your total business. We added the liability, that's a total asset. Now out of total asset, which assets we don't want to include? Cash. So remove cash. Then we don't want to include is DTA. Remove DT. So that I'll remove. So cash is removed, DTA is removed. And there's one more thing they've written goodwill resulting from DTL. I'll come to that. So this I have to minus. If you see here they have written is minus C. So this gives me the total assets which are coming from you. Now I will see is there any single asset which is basically the major amount in this. First we found out the fair value of gross asset. Then we find out the fair value of one single asset. And if concentration test is met then we say it is not a business. Yeah, that clear? Okay. Now <clears throat> what is this goodwill resulting from DTL? Pay attention. See, because of business combination, what happens is, many times, I take over your asset at higher value. Remember, the assets and liabilities on the business combination are to be accounted at acquisition date, fair value. So, if I record in my books at a higher value, but our asset is not yet sold, asset will be really sold in future. The tax purpose, the tax has to be paid in future. Yeah, yeah? Tax purpose, the tax has to be paid in future. So, now what happens is, I have to create what? DTL. So, if I create DTL, so can I say net assets will go down? Achha, net assets will go down. PC remains same. So what will come up? Good. So because of DTL, whenever I take over your assets at a higher value, assets have gone up. I am not paying tax today. I will be paying tax in future. So indirectly, future may have to pay more tax. I will create a DTL. When I create a DTL, so what will happen is net assets today will go down. Today net assets are going down. PC is remaining same. Indirectly, it leads to creation of Good. Did you understood? Now they say that you don't take that. So one option is we ignore DTL. If I ignore DTL, automatically goodwill will not come only. Or if you take DTL, so you remove DTL also, you remove goodwill also. So now there are two ways of solving the sum. So in the liabilities, you ignore DTL. Or in your liabilities, if you take DTL, then in your assets, you have to remove goodwill. So they have given you one question. ICA has given one question. What they have done in the solution, they have ignored DTL only. If I ignore DTL, goodwill will not come only. The goodwill no need to add back. So indirectly, what happens? If you have added in B, liabilities may DTL is added. So goodwill has to be deducted. If in B, DTL is not added, goodwill is not to be deducted. Did you understood? Again, I am telling. They are telling that cash, DT and goodwill resulting from DTL are not to be taken when you are seeing your gross asset. Now, if I took over your asset at a higher value, assets have gone up, I have not paid the tax today because of a profit here, but that asset will be sold in future, taxes to be paid in future, there will be a DTL coming. Okay, if DTL comes up, I record a DTL, my net asset goes down, my PC is remaining same, automatically what will happen is similar amount of goodwill will come. So now, in B point, we have to add liability. C point, I have to deduct the goodwill. So if in B point, I take DTL as a liability, so goodwill would have came. So in C point, goodwill is to be removed. But if in B point, I ignore DTL. If in B point, DTL is ignored, so can I say now goodwill did not came only. So in C point, goodwill is not to be deducted. If in B, DTL taken, deduct goodwill in C. If in B, DTL not taken, no need to deduct goodwill in C. Did you understood? Okay, check the question. See, you already hold 20%. You further acquire 50% by paying 300 crores. Okay. Now, the fair value of assets coming, building, cash, financial liability, DTL. Okay. The fair value of B is 400 crores. NCI is 120 crores and your previous interest is 80 crores. Okay. Now, today I acquired 50%. At what rate? Today, I acquired 50% at 300. Okay, I already have 220%. That is worth 80 crores. Okay, I already hold 20%, which is worth 80 crores. So, 70% holding is 80 plus 300. Can I say 380? This is 70%. Okay, 30% NCI ka fair value is 120. So, can I say 100% will become 80 plus 300 plus 120? What is the total? 500. So, can I say 500 is the total? net assets what i paid plus nci everything now i want only the gross asset what i should do 
add back what liability okay now should i take up dtl in the liability if i take up dtl in liability i have to deduct good way so better i ignore dtl so there are two liability if you see financial and dtl which one i should consider okay so 500 tha, that was net assets i want only the assets add back liability how much is add back liability 800 okay now 500 plus 800 comes to achha, this is including all assets now which assets are not to be taken cash then dta and goodwill to ignore ho gaya because dtl not taken goodwill is ignored so now cash and dta dta is not there cash is how much 200 so i deduct 200 so now it became what 11 now 1100 is the gross asset coming did you understood gross asset okay gross asset is 1100 out of that if you see building only is 1000 so gross asset 1100 usme say one building only is 1000 so can i say 91% is just building only so can i say it's a business equation or it's a building equation building equation so i cannot say it's a business equation here the concentration test is satisfied it is not a business combination so student would have a doubt is like sir why dtl is not taken i told you if you take dtl in b you have to deduct goodwill in c or if you ignore dtl in b then you don't have to deduct goodwill in c any doubts anybody with this Uh, see, they have not actually said it anywhere. So, how much you say is concentration? 75% is concentration, or 80% is concentration, or 90% is concentration. That again goes on your judgment. Remember, NDS are principle based. So, few people will take 90%, few people will take 80%. It's up to you. But an ICI sum, they have given this only sum wherein it's more than 90%. So, they have taken it as concentration test is met. Okay. Next is acquisition method. Now, whenever there is a business combination, all your business combination except CCBC, common control business combination, leave that common control wala thing. All other business combination, they are to be accounted by acquisition method. What is the name of method? Acquisition. Acquisition, acquisition method, mein the assets and liabilities are coming in at acquisition date fair value. And we have paid something that is a PC, difference automatically goes in goodwill. Or we call it as gain on bargain purchase. We pay more, it's goodwill. We pay less, it's gain on bargain purchase. Okay. So first of all, we need to understand who is the acquirer. First of all, we need to understand who is the acquirer. Now see, normally, see, acquirer is the one who obtains control over another business. That's the person who is acquired, who gets control. That's a acquirer. Now normally, acquirer is a person who pays cash. I take over your business, I pay you cash or I bought your shares and I give my shares. The one who is giving cash or one who is giving shares is normally the acquire. But we know there is a concept called as reverse acquisition. Now what happens under reverse acquisition? When a small company acquires a big company. If a small company is acquiring big company by giving equity shares. Imagine the small company is acquiring a big company by giving equity shares. So can I say I have to give them more equity shares? Because I am small, they are big. If I give them more equity shares, effectively what will happen is they will have a control over my. So officially, on paper, it looks A acquired B. But now B's shareholder will have a more shares in A. So indirectly, B's shareholder are controlling A. That is called as reverse acquisition. How to account for reverse acquisition? I will be coming to it later. Okay, the one is identifying acquirer. Second is identifying the equation date the date on which you are getting control the date on which you are getting control that is known as your equation again i'll come back to that uh, then we have to record the assets and liabilities coming in we have to record at which value equation date fair value and then we are required to measure goodwill or gain on bargain purchase fine first of all identifying the acquirer one who obtains the control and control definition. The definition of control is not given under NDS 103. The definition of control is given under NDS 110. Now see, control doesn't mean you hold more than 50%. NDS is all principle based. They don't say that you should hold more than 50%. They say investor has a control over investee. If and only if all the following are present. All. All should be present. One. You have a power over investee. Power means you are able to take the decisions unilaterally. Okay. Second, you have exposure or right over variable returns. You have exposure or right over variable returns. And third, you can use your power to influence returns. 
इमेजिन इफ आई होल्ड मोर देन फिफ्टी परसेंट तो जनरली कहने से आई कैन टेक द डिजन यूनी लैटरलीस विद लेस देन फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑल्सो इमेजिन आई होल्ड फोर्टी परसेंट बट ऑल रिमेनिंग सिक्सटी परसेंट आर स्मॉल 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 थाउजेंड ऑफ शेयर होल्डर would that small 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 thousands of shareholder come and attend meeting no so whenever a meeting is held now the average those people who come and attend they are holding 60 65% shares total and in that 60 65 i hold 40 every time so can i say i will be able to take decision whichever i want so even with 40% holding i can have a control but now i change the question i hold 40 remaining 60 there are six people holding 10 10% okay can that six people come Yeah, can they vote against me? Yes. So can I take decision whichever I want? No. So वहाँ पे with forty percent I don't have a control. So with forty percent you may have a control, you may not have a control. It depends on facts and circumstances. What is your chunk of holding? What is others' chunk of holding? Are they small, 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 small shareholders or a big wall of shareholders? Second, we might have an agreement with each other. Even though I hold sixty percent, I have an agreement with the remaining forty percent people that I will not take any decisions without their approval. So if I cannot take any decision without their approval, so even with 60%, I don't have. So so many other you are exposed or have a right to variable returns, and you can use your power to influence the returns. See, uh, if at all you are basically investor when you are investing somewhere, it is always a variable return, equity wala. Fixed return, the bank has given a loan. The bank will not be able to have what. A power over the investee. They will not be able to control it. They will be just getting what fixed. Unka interest. They are telling for a power. You should not just have a control. Plus, you should be exposed variably. You are involved in their business. That business does well. You get more. The business doesn't do well. You get less. Then I say acquire a business. If that business does whatever, I'll get the fixed amount. Then I'm not involved in that business. Okay. If payment is through cash, the guy who pays cash will be basically the acquirer. The payment is through shares. The guy who gives the share, issues the shares, is normally the acquirer. But under reverse acquisition, the person who is getting shares, they might become the acquirer. Take it. So actually, ये जो है ना points यहाँ पे you have to see the facts and circumstances, including these points are very important. So many times they don't just give a question which is a practical one. They add a theoretical point to it. So this point is which are the facts and circumstances which are to be considered in identifying acquirer one relative voting right in combined entity after the business okay combined entity whoever will have a more voting right can i say that guy is acquirer a limited b limited combined they form c now you might say sir c limited is acquirer but now if b shareholder will have a majority in c so can i say c will matlab b will control the business of c a limited b limited combined they form what C. So now you might say C is acquirer, but in C limited, B's shareholder will have a majority voting power. So who is controlling C? B. And C has a business of A and B both. So indirectly, it is B taking over A. Name is C limited. Indirectly, it is B taking over A. So who has a majority voting right, relative voting right in the combined entity? Largest minority. composition of governing body i appoint the bods or someone else is appointing the bod senior management how it is basically there terms of exchange uh if your share price going on is 100 and i am paying you 150 per share the generally acquirer will be a person who gives more so your share price going on is 100 but still i am giving you 150 the extra 50 i have given you towards your good will the so acquirer will be the one who is paying more kind of an acquirer is usually the combining entity whose relative size is significantly great this is usually see word usually means it's not always but most of the time okay so this is there now there's a question vira and zira vira limited zira limited they join forces and they are forming mira limited so can i say v and z they combine and form what m but now in m now in m what happens is 100 shares are given to vira 50 shares are given to zira okay if i ask you m limited will be controlled by who shareholder vira so can i say indirectly it is vira will control the new entity so can i say indirectly vira will control vira's business and zira's business so indirectly it is v taking over 
सेट इट इज वीरा टेकिंग ओवर सी तो एम इज जस्ट ऑफ नो यूज ओनली तो डोंट थिंक दैट एम इज अक्वायर यू माइट फील एम टू कोवर वी एंड जेड बट द थिंग इज इन एम वी विल कंट्रोल तो एक्चुअली एम इज नथिंग बट वी ओनली नाउ तो वी टू कोवर जेड दैट इज हाउ द अकाउंटिंग विल बी दैट वीरा इज द अक्वायर एम न्यू कंपनी मीरा इज नॉट द अक्वायर वीरा इज द अक्वायर Okay, now acquisition date. It's a date on which you obtain control. Acquisition date is the date on which you are getting control. Now, if you are getting control, is to be seen. Many times, what happens is the agreement is done, but still control over assets and liabilities have not came. I need to see which is the date on which you are getting control over assets and liabilities. Normally, if question is silent, the control comes when you make the payment of. consideration if question doesn't say anything i pay money i got control uh, if question specifically says you pay now but i'll give you control after 6 months it is possible you give me some advance payment now 6 months ke baad you take over my assets and liabilities then in that case the acquisition date will be after 6 months sometimes agreement mein likha hoga you take over control over assets and liability right now you can you can pay me in 3 months so you can pay me in 3 months so then i got a control right now only so it depends normally if question is silent i'll get a control when i pay but agreement made can be written like earlier also it can be later also <laughs> okay but if agreement is subject to approval if agreement is subject to approval then acquisition date cannot be a date before the approval is received like suppose i tell you uh, say for example amazon and flipkart wants to merge if amazon and flipkart wants to merge can i say they need to take approval of competition commission of india because they are both the uh, biggest people over there if cci is approved like pvr and inox merge you know pvr and inox is officially merged and they had to take a approval of what cci they got cci is approval now so before merging they have to apply for cci is approval so now agreement ho gaya but thing is can i say it is subject to cci is approval the acquisition date cannot be a date prior to cci is approved now it can be later cci approval came but still i have not taken control over your asset wo ho sakta hai na CCI approval came, but I have still not taken over the control over asset. Then acquisition date is not CCI approval; it's the date when you get control. But uh, it is; it cannot be prior to the date of CCI approval. Fine. This is a question. Check over here. Sham Limited listed entity. Ninth April, they started to negotiate with Ram. Tenth May, board authorized board of directors of Sham authorized them to go for merger. board approval came 15th may they offered 12000 shares theek hai 31st may the bod of ram accepted the offer subject to shareholders vote 2nd june okay did they say that one shareholder approval came i'll get the control over assets liability did they say anywhere that one shareholder approval comes you'll get control over assets liability no so if nothing is given when do i get control when i make payment when did i make 15th answer is 15th and this is very important because if acquisition date is 15th and i am giving you how many shares 12000 shares so what is the pc pc is 12000 share into the rate going on on 15th if someone takes 10th the pc go wrong ho jayega and pc wrong can i say everything will be wrong in the sum and then you say sir marks gone <laughs> so over here see approval came but they didn't told me that one shareholder approval comes control over assets and liability goes to you they didn't say that to so simple control comes when i make payment so 15 so 12000 into 90 will be your pc <coughs> check answer is 15 june 12000 into 90 that is 10 lakh 80000 here board of directors of sham acha suppose they said 10th was basically this they said 12th of june the board has passed on the control to sham and 15th june payment made now if they say 12th of june the control is transferred then the acquisition date will be 12th june clear <laughs> okay now direct cost of acquisition any time when you are acquiring someone's business there will be acquisition related cost one is called as a finder's fee we might hire some agency who will help us find out a right target yeah they call it as target you want to acquire someone to kisko acquire kare uske liye finders fee then 
before I acquire someone, I need to check whether they are really what it is shown. That's called as due diligence. So there are some fees which are involved related to all these things. So they are called as direct cost related to acquisition. What do I do with them? Do I add it in PC or do I take it in PNL? Yeah. PNL. They are all going in PNL. Now one more thing. Suppose I acquired your business. So can I say your assets and liabilities will come to me? I'll record it which value? Acquisition date. Fair values. Okay. Now, suppose you had a building. So your building comes to me. I'll record it. Acquisition date. Fair value. Now the problem is when your building comes to me. Can I say I have to get it registered in my name? When I have to get it registered in my name, I have to pay stamp duty to government. And you know, stamp duty is around six to seven percent. Okay. Now six to seven percent stamp duty, which I am paying. Your building coming to me. I've recorded at fair value. Now stamp duty paid to government. Do I add it to the building? Okay. Answer is. Answer is no. The reason is very simple. Yeah, I already recorded building at fair value. You already recorded building at which value? Fair value. Now you pay six percent stamp duty. Do you think the fair value is increased by six percent? No. So that then you are showing the building at more than fair value. That becomes wrong. Same way they had some spectrum license. Imagine five G ka license that company was having. I acquired that company. Now can I say that license? I have to get it in my name from government authority. Now license I already recorded in my book at which value? Fair value. Now government authority, I want to get the license transferred. I am paying money to them, say five percent, ten percent, fifty percent, whatever is based on the government agreement. Now that doesn't increase the fair value of license. Now then that cannot be capitalized. That will go directly to P. Uh, normally, normally building acquired, you pay stamp duty. It's added to your cost. But building coming in business combination already at fair value. Now you pay stamp duty. That's not added to building. That will be treated as Acquisition related cost going to P. Check this question over here. You acquired a company, they had a spectrum license, their spectrum license come to you, but you have to pay some one time fee to whom? Regulator. I already would have recorded license at fair value. Now, if I pay something to regulator, does it increase the fair value? No, so that should be treated as a direct acquisition cost and it will go to PNL. It's acquisition related cost, it should be expensed. Next word is contingent consideration. Next word is contingent consideration. Now, what is this contingent consideration? Yes, please. Hmm. The date of acquisition is first January. When I get control, see, the control mil gaya hoga. Agreement cannot say that you will get from back to. There's a difference between getting control and getting profits. It is possible that profits of that company from 1st January belongs to me. That is not control. Profit is not control. Control is I manage your assets, I manage your liability, I manage your business. Did you understood? If they had given me the management really from 1st January, then the date of acquisition is 1st January. Many times what you are trying to say is agreement today. Kiya. If agreement today, kiya na, there might be a clause in agreement that profit from 1st January belongs to you. There cannot be management first January because that period is over. I did not manage. The profit coming to me is not control. Managing assets and liability is control. Okay. Next is contingent consideration. Now, contingent consideration is I acquire your business, I pay you. Now, it is possible something I paid you now and something is based on future earnings. Now, JK Shah Limited is taken over. <laughs> Okay, so if you see in that there is a contingent consideration, you know, there is a contingent consideration. They are paying for 76% some money right now. I don't want to comment on amount, but the remaining 24% will be based on the turnover and profitability of FY2425. Somewhat amount remaining 26% ke liye, 24% ke liye, it's based on the profitability of FY2425. So can I say there is something which is to be paid in future, but it will depend on profitability uh, it may be payable may not be payable less payable more payable whatever it is how do we account for this contingent consideration do we include it in pc they are included in your pc at acquisition date fair value. acquisition date fair value is included in pc now suppose if i am going to pc may include karliya pc may include karliya we included it in pc now the thing pc is now normal was 100 plus acquisition date fair value is 20 so can i say pc is 120 
ओके एसेट्स एंड लायबिलिटीज कम्स यू से पीसी 120 इज इट टू बैंक 120 नो हाउ मच यू आर पेइंग राइट नाउ 100 सो व्हाट डू आई डू विद 20 लायबिलिटी ओके नाउ इफ 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 यू हैव टू गिव शेयर्स टू देम इफ यू हैव टू गिव शेयर्स टू देम दैट टू फिक्स नंबर ऑफ शेयर्स रिमेंबर फिक्स टू फिक्स टेस्ट वाला so fixed number of shares are to be given to them then in that case it will be shown as equity so to write to sbpr what do you write down sbpr i have to give shares in future it's a share based payment so to sbpr but if i have to give you cash in future so i'll be showing it as live but sbpr or the liability whatever it is it will come at which value acquisition date fair thing is if it is equity it will not be remeasured if it is a liability it will period clear with this okay this is done now check question number 4 over here uh, how should contingent consideration should be taken for the following example uh, first april 16 a limited acquired 100% in b first april 16 a acquired how many percent 100% immediately we are giving 10 lakh shares face value 10 face value ठीक है एंड फर्दर हैव टू गिव 2 लाख आफ्टर 1 ईयर इफ द प्रॉफिट बिफोर इंटरेस्ट एंड टैक्स एक्सीड्स 1 ईयर तो कैन आई से दिस सेकंड पार्ट इज अ कंटिंजेंट कंसीडरेशन एंड द फेयर वैल्यू ऑफ ए लिमिटेड ऑन द डेट ऑफ एक्विजिशन इज 20 व्हेन आई एक्वायर्ड व्हाट इज माय शेयर का फेयर वैल्यू 20 ओके हाउ मेनी इमीडिएटली आई एम गिविंग माय शेयर्स 10 लाख तो कैन आई से पीसी इज 10 लाख इनटू 20 दैट इज इमीडिएट कंसीडरेशन 10 लाख इनटू 20 इज व्हाट 2 ईयर ओके प्लस आई हैव टू गिव यू Further 2 lakh shares, but can I say that may or may not be payable? So don't take 2 lakh into 20. That is not to be taken. I have to take what? Fair value of contingent consideration, considering the probability whether it will be payable, not payable, all that things. Okay, and the fair value of contingent consideration is 25 lakh. So immediate consideration is 2 CR plus the fair value of contingent consideration is 25 lakh. Total consideration will be 225. TK, total consideration will be 225. Now, during this year, the profit exceeded 1 cr and you had to pay that extra 2 lakh shares okay you had to give that extra 2 lakh shares now continuing with uh, 2 lakh shares fixed number of shares are there okay now question pc is 225 pc is 225 2 equity share capital is 2 cr right now we issued and 2 sbpr will be 25 lakh okay and then i'm giving how many shares to you 2 lakh shares. Now, when that shares are issued and that day the market price may be different, am I concerned with that? No. Remember, if it's an equity settle, we don't check the market price. So, for us, 2 lakh shares are issued for 25 lakh. So, can I say per share it is issued at 12.5? I had recorded 25 lakh as the fair value, SBPR. That SBPR will get converted into capital after one year. That 25 lakh will get converted. Finished. Okay. Now, assuming the same thing, Except for the shares are not fixed. Okay, if shares are not fixed, then in that case it becomes what? Liability. liability. If it is liability, I'll write what to SBPL or basically contingent consideration payable. Simple. Contingent consideration payable. 25 lakh. But I have to remeasure now. Okay. Now the fair value of this 2 lakh shares is now 40. The fair value of not 2 lakh shares. Now it's a variable number of shares. It's not fixed number, it's a variable number. The fair value after one year is what? 40. How much I had recorded? 25. Now that contingent consideration payable was 25. I have to take it to 40. There's an increase in liability. Increase in liability always goes in PN. Liability going up down is always PN. Liability going up down is always PN. Remember I told you liability cannot be FPT, OCI. Save A ki the own credit risk. We saw that own credit risk goes in OCI. Otherwise it never goes in OCI. Always it goes in. PL. Okay, so that 15 lakh will go in PNL. And now, now basically 40 lakh is basically the amount to be paid. Now, what is the share price of our company today? Check out share price of our company era 25. So 40 lakh divided by 25. Can I say 1 lakh 60,000? 40 lakh now. 40 lakh divided by 25. Is it coming 1 lakh 60,000? Yes. I'll be giving you how many shares? 1 lakh 60,000. So, in your case, A, we were giving them 2 lakh shares and books it was accounted as issued for 25 lakh. We don't remeasure it, it's just last May SBPR to capital 25 lakh. 
2 lakh shares were issued for 25 lakh. Now we will have 40 lakh. 40 lakh maybe we are issuing 1 lakh 60,000 shares. So one share is issued at price of rupees 25. Clear with this? Okay, the check solution total PC is 225. Uh, first of all, a case we are going to give a fixed number of shares, so we do not have to subsequently remeasure it. And at the end, 25 lakh gets converted into capital. Okay, case number two, PC is 225. Later on, we are required to give a variable number of shares. So what we need to do, it should be measured at fair value. Difference goes in PNL. So 25 lakh we book. Now it became 40. 15 lakh is going in PNL. Now it became 40 and 40 lakh rupee I have to pay you. My one share today is worth 25. I will be giving you 1 lakh 60,000 shares. Shall I move it? Okay, next. Purchase price allocation. It's simple. Assets and liabilities acquired. I need to record. I need to record them at acquisition date. Fair. Coming to intangible assets. Now, many intangible assets are also coming to me. Like you had some good ride. You had some patent. That all is coming to me. We are talking other than goodwill. Ignore goodwill. Other than goodwill, whatever are your intangible assets coming to me, I can record that intangible assets in my book. I can record that intangible asset in my book, provided they meet the definition of intangible assets. And I'll be recording that intangible asset at what value? Same. Acquisition date, fair. Now, it is possible that intangible asset was not recorded in the books of acquiry. Your bookmate was not there, doesn't matter. If it meets the definition of intangible asset, I can record it and I will record it at acquisition date. Fair value. For example, simplest. Uh, say, for example, HUL has taken over a company called as Indulekha Private Limited. Indulekha Herol, you might have heard this word. So, to grow your hair. <laughs> so, Indulekha Hair Oil, that company, that company had created a brand. And if you might have seen their hair oil, small bottle cost around 250-300 rupees. Like parachute ka bottle will cover 10 rupees, 20 rupees. This bottle is 300 rupees, the same quantity. So the point is they have created a brand name because of which they are able to sell the product at what? Very higher rate. Now, whenever HUL took over that Hindu Lekha, they were not interested basically in their plant. HUL says we have a better manufacturing plant. So what they were interested is only the brand. Now, for Indulekha Private Limited, can I say the brand name was internally developed, internally generated? And we know internally generated brand name, internally generated goodwill cannot be recorded. So, when HUL took over at 400 crores, out of 400 crores, they recorded 360 crores as brand name as asset. So, brand name was not there as an asset in the books of Indulekha. But can I say brand name is recorded as an asset in the book of HUL? So, I can record an intangible asset provided it meets the definition of intangible asset. I'll record it acquisition date fair value. It has nothing to do with whether it was there in your asset or not. Okay. So, when do I say I'll record the intangible? It meets definition. And definition of intangible is it's an identifiable non-monetary asset without physical substance. The question comes, sir, what is an identifiable identifiable when do i say asset is identifiable if it meets any of the following criteria one contractual legal criteria or separability criteria contractual legal criteria is it arises it arises out of what a contract or a legal right you have a legal right or a contractual right then that's a intangible asset and second one they are telling is separability either any of them is fulfilled it's identifiable separability means it's capable of being sold rented exchange individually or with some related asset or with some related asset it's not like it will go with the business only goodwill doesn't go individually goodwill always goes with what business goodwill doesn't go individually goodwill will go always with business so goodwill is not an identifiable asset but uh, if i have a copyright if i'm able to sell my copyright individually or if i'm able to sell my patent individually or rent it so then in that case they are identifiable so they are meeting the definition of identifiable Okay, so if it is an identifiable intangible, I can record in my book at acquisition date fair value. Whether it was there in your book or not, I don't care for that. Take fine. Next, reacquired right. Okay, reacquired right is nothing but the right which I have given to you. Imagine uh, McDonald's, McDonald's India Limited has given a right to South India Limited. There's a company called as South India Limited, which has a chain of McDonald's stores in Southern India. So, can I say the McDonald's India Limited gave them the franchisee right? 
Okay, who is having the franchisee right right now? South, South India. And can I say they got a franchisee right for 10 years, so they will show that franchisee right as an asset in the book. Now, McDonald feels that we want to run our own stores. So, pale they were giving franchisee, but now they want own stores. Okay, if they want own stores, can I say one option they create own stores or they can buy the stores from their franchisees only. So, what they did is they took over this company called Southern India Limited. Now, when I took over that company, Southern India Limited, they have a franchisee right. As, that franchisee right is nothing but, can I say, given by me only. If I take over that company, that right is coming back. This is called as reacquired right. Now, whenever that right is coming back, franchisee is an intangible asset. Question, can I record a reacquired right as an asset in my book? Yes. yes. The reacquired right, you can record. It's an intangible asset. You can record it in your book. At which value? Acquisition date, fair value. But now, normally, tell me one thing. You have a franchisee right 10 years, but it can be further, it can be further renewed for another 10 years. So, its fair value will be more or less. You have one right which cannot be renewed and you have another right which can be renewed for another 10 years. Which right will have more fair value? Which can be renewed. Uh, reacquired right, if the right is coming back to me, you had a right wherein it was renewable, but I will fair value it without considering the renewal option. Reason, I cannot renew to myself, no. So, even though your right was with renewal, wala, when I am determining fair value, I will determine the fair value without considering renewal option. Did you understood? So, I can record it. It is identifiable. It meets the separability criteria. You only had sold that things. Uh, but you have to recognize on the base of remaining contractual term without considering the effect of renewal. Okay. Now, settlement of pre-existing relationship. Uh, this is something... A student feel bit difficulty. Now, what is this pre-existing relationship? Okay, is it possible? I have sold goods to you in past, or I have given a loan to you in past. So I have to receive money from you, or I purchase goods from you, I took loan from you, so I have to pay to you. So before our business combination happened, can I say there's already some relationship, debtor creator, lender borrower, kind of that. So imagine I already have to I already have to pay you 5 lakh rupees. I already have to pay you how much rupees? 5 lakh. Now, if I take over your business, can I say my 5 lakh liability will go away? Because now you become me only, I take over your business. I already have to pay 5 lakh rupees before business combination. Now if I take over your business, can I say 5 lakh is now not payable? So now what happens is whatever is PC, out of PC that 5 lakh is towards the settlement of pre-existing relationship and remaining is the PC. 5 lakh is towards settlement of that liability and that asset of yours will not come to me. That asset of yours will not come to me. I will show it as like I paid you 100 rupees. So 5 rupees liability paid off. In my book already liability was there. 5 is liability paid off and 95 is PC and your assets and liabilities other than that loan which you had given to me, that all will be coming to me. This is basically a pre-existing relationship okay there can be other pre-existing relationship also like a litigation like you had filed a case against me if you had filed a case against me so can i say i may have shown it as a liability in my books or i might have just shown it as contingent liability two things i might have done a provision for loss or i might have just shown as contingent now uh, that case is going on but now if i acquire your business can i say that case gets settled if i acquire your business the case is getting Settled. So now suppose the fair value of litigation today is 20 rupees. The fair value of litigation today is 20. Now if I acquire your business at 100 rupees, out of 100, that 20 rupees is towards the settlement of litigation and 80 is only the PC. Okay, the so 20 I am paying for settlement of litigation. Now in your books, if liability was not there, your liability you had not created, you had shown as what? Contingent. But you are paying 20. The 20 will become loss. But if you already had a liability 20, you are paying 20, then the loss will be 0. But if your liability was 10, you are paying 20, 10 will be 0. So what is loss or what is gain on settlement? It will depend on asset or liability which is already booked. Aapki book mein kya hai? You already have a 0 liability, 20 you are paying, full 20 is loss. You already have 20 liability, 20 you pay, 0 loss. But you have a 10 liability, you pay 20, 10 is a loss. Okay? So, this is basically a settlement of pre-existing relationship. Now, one is non-contractual, 
they are measured at fair value. Like litigations, etc., they are measured at which value? The fair value of litigation. Second one they have written is contractual. Now tell me, I have a contract to buy goods from you at a higher rate. I have a contract to buy goods from you at a higher rate. I am not able to cancel it. If I cancel, I have to pay some penalty. But now if I acquire your business, can I say now I don't have to buy from you? I can buy it from outside only. So that contract to buy from you at a higher rate, can I say it was a kind of negative for me? Contract to buy from you was a kind of negative. It was unfavorable to me. There was some amount by which it was unfavorable. If, if I didn't want it to continue with the contract, can I say I would have settled it by paying some penalty? So what is the pre-existing relationship ka payment? So one is unfavorable amount or if I cancel it, the penalty amount, say whichever is low. So I can, one thing is, I can continue contract, I can pay you extra 10 CR. Or second option was I could have cancelled it 8 CR. So rather than continuing contract, better would be for me to pay 8 CR. So now when I acquire your business, the contract is getting cancelled. Assume out of that 8 CR is for that contract, remaining is for CC. Okay, so contract unfavorable or the settlement provision, whichever is less. If contract is unfavorable of I, you can settle at 2. The out of PC, how much basically is for that settlement of contract 5 or 2? Contract is unfavorable by 5, but I can settle it for 2 lakh. The out of PC, how much is for the settlement of contract 2? And remaining will be treated towards PC. Fine. Now, gain loss will depend on previously recognized asset or liability, which I already told you. Now, check this question. P limited is being sued by R limited. So can I say R has filed a case against P? Who has filed a case? R. R has filed a case against P. Fine. And now P has recognized 10 million liability. There is a 10 million liability in book. P acquired R. Okay. R had filed a case. If I acquire them, can I say case one? They had filed a case against me. Now I acquired them. So case is gone. And I acquired them for 500. Now, so can I say in 500, there is something towards settlement of pre-existing relationship. The fair value of settlement is 20. So, out of 500, 20 is towards the settlement of that litigation and 480 is towards PC. Okay, 20 towards settlement of litigation. How much is the liability already there in books? 10. Book may liability 10, but I am paying 20. Can I say extra 10 will go to P? Any doubts? Anybody with this? Next one is measurement period. Now, what is this measurement period? Uh, see, Indias is telling that assets and liabilities are to be recorded at acquisition date fair value. Now, to find out the fair value, can I say we need to go in detail and search for some factors, parameters, etc. So, sometimes it's not easy to find out the fair value. So, can I say on the date of acquisition, the fair value might not be readily available. The exercise may go on later also. So, what do you do? On day one, I don't know the fair value. So I will record it at provisional value, provisional. So I don't know the exact fair value, fair value determination is going on. So I have recorded at a provisional amount and they give you a measurement window of how many year? One year. Within one year, you try to find the final figure, but the final figure should be based on facts and circumstances which were prevalent on acquisition date. You cannot have a fair value based on some new facts. It should be based on facts and circumstances prevalent on equation. So, if at all, first day they are not ready, you have done on a provisional basis recording and they give you a measurement period of one year and you need to see facts and circumstances that existed on equation. Okay? So, based on that, if later a fair value, you recorded a fair value 100, later you found out the actual is 110. So, adjust the fair value. So, if it is asset, asset ka fair value 100 ki jaga 110, asset went up. So, indirectly what happened, net asset went up, PC is same, goodwill will go down. But imagine it was a liability. Liability we recorded 100, fair value came 110, liability went up. So, net asset went down, PC is same, the goodwill will go up. So, corresponding effect will come in goodwill or capital. But it's only when, it's only when, when that facts and circumstances were prepared. If some new fact came up later and because of that the fair value changes, that will not impact your goodwill or capital. Yeah, the clear?
लेटर ना लेटर ना तो देन बेसिकली यू फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल हैव टू रिकॉर्ड इट व्हाट वाज द फेयर वैल्यू एंड एक्वेशन डेट बेस्ड ऑन दैट यू चेंज गुडविल कैपिटलिज्म एंड यू चेंज द एसेट वैल्यू एंड देन इट इज डिस्ट्रॉयड यू रिकॉर्ड डिस्ट्रॉयड वाला सेपरेटली व्हिच विल गो इन योर पीएन ना पीसी कहां से चेंज होगा Dear measurement window is only for facts and circumstances which were prevalent on acquisition date. Whether on acquisition date asset was destroyed? No, it was destroyed later. You were not knowing fair value. Whenever you come to know about fair value, you change the asset. You change goodwill capitalism. Now, if asset is destroyed, so asset hundred you made it as one twenty. Now asset destroyed one twenty you take it in P. Clear? Okay. After the measurement period ends, suppose one year ke baad you are able to find out anything, then in that case it will not be accounted as per index one o three. It will go under your index eight. Change in accounting policies or estimate, usme it will go. ठीक है. Now check the question. You acquired some hundred percent of a company. You recorded a net asset hundred, and PC is one fifty. Can I say you recorded fifty rupee of goodwill? Now they have a carry forward losses on which DTA. If I have a carry forward losses, can I say future? I don't have to pay taxes. So that's an asset for me. I don't have to pay tax. Even if I earn, I don't have to pay tax. So I have to whenever I feel profits will be there in future. But can I say we don't record DTA? So it was not recorded. Why DTA was not recorded? Lack of convincing evidence. तो डेट व्हेन आई एक्वायर डीटीए वाज नॉट रिकॉर्डेड बिकॉज़ आई फील फ्यूचर में इनकम्स विल नॉट बी नाउ लेटर दे गॉट अ न्यू कॉन्ट्रैक्ट लेटर एंटिटी वॉन अ न्यू कॉन्ट्रैक्ट एंड नाउ वी फील दे विल हैव इनकम एंड नाउ वी फील दे विल हैव इनकम तो कैन आई से नाउ वी कैन रिकॉर्ड डीटीए आल्सो ओके तो वुड इट बी वुड इट बी एडजस्टेड इन गुडविल कैपिटल रिजर्व नो रीजन न्यू कॉन्ट्रैक्ट वाज नॉट देयर ऑन acquisition date to so, can i say acquisition date that profit was not feasible only this is a new circumstance is coming up it's not accounted as per 103 ha huh. now you can record dta but that impact will go in pnl it will not affect your goodwill or capital is okay next is contingent payment to employee shareholder now see the word written employee shareholder to so, can i say i am acquiring some company i am acquiring some company i have to pay to them So to their shareholder, I have to pay. Now that guy is a shareholder of other company, and that guy also employee of other company. For example, simple, I tell you. Uh, say for example, Adani Limited acquires Reliance Limited. <laughs> so Adani became bigger, na? So suppose Adani is acquiring Reliance. ठीक है? तो can I say Adani has to give money to the shareholders of Reliance? Okay, who is the shareholder of Reliance? Mukesh Ambani. So Mukesh Ambani or Ambani family. Okay, so he is a shareholder, and can I say Mukesh Ambani is also a CEO of Reliance Industries Limited? So can I say he is a shareholder of Reliance as well as employee? Now Adani says we are going to pay you this much. Now is it in capacity as a shareholder to you, or is it in capacity as employee? After is in capacity as a employee. If it is in capacity as employee, it is not covered here. It will go where? It is either in one zero two or in day is ninety. Take employee benefits. It will go under in days one or two or nineteen employee benefits. But if it is in capacity as a shareholder, if it is in capacity as a shareholder, whether Mukesh Ambani stays or not, after three years, if profitability is this, we are still going to pay. Whether he stays as CEO or not, we are still going to pay him. So can I say we are going to pay him as a shareholder of the selling company? So this is nothing but a contingent consideration. So then in that case, the fair value of contingent consideration has to be included in PC. So if it's an employee shareholder, so I need to understand the payment which is being done to Mukesh Ambani. Is it as a shareholder of Reliance or is it as a employee over there? If it is as an employee, then it is basically out of one zero three. If it is as a selling shareholder, then in that case it's a contingent consideration. Okay, check question number seven. KKV Limited is hundred percent interest of Viva, a company owned by a single shareholder who is also a uh, kmp in the company for a cash payment 20 million acha there is only single shareholder and can i say who is also a kmp so guy who is selling the business is a shareholder also is a employee i am giving 20 million cash 
and a contingent payment 2 million contingent payment 2 million is ebitda has to cross certain thing and the shareholder has to continue to be there for 2 years okay is it as a shareholder is it as an employee okay. employee so this is not to be included in pc so this is not to be included in pc the so pc is only 20 million Next, acquirer share base payment award exchanged. Now, what is this acquirer share base payment award exchange? A limited took over B limited. Now, imagine B limited is shut down. I took over their assets and liabilities and B limited shut down. Now, if B limited had already given ESOPs to their employees, now if B limited shuts down, what happens to the ESOPs of their employee? Can I say their employee becomes our employee now? And now I will give my ESOPs to them. So to the employees of B Limited, A Limited is giving their ESOPs. This is known as Acquirer Share Based Payment Award Exchanged. I took over B Limited. B shareholder had the ESOPs of B. When I took over them, B shut down. So their employees came to me. So instead of B's ESOP, I am giving them my ESOPs. Yeah, the clear? Now the problem is, imagine, I am giving my ESOPs to them. Now, suppose the shares were to, when B had given the ESOPs to them, it was going to waste after 5 years. Out of 5 years, 2 years was over. So, can I say B has recorded expense for 2 years? And now, I, it was 3 years pending. Now, when I take over, can I say now I have to give them shares after 3 years? I will record expense for 3. So, B recorded expense for 2 years and I will be recording expense for 3 years, but I will be making payment for 5 years. I will be making payment of full. So, now problem is, they have recorded two years, I have recorded three years, but I am paying for five years. So, how do I do over here? What do I do over here? So, over here, I need to understand whether the agreement, when I acquired you, can I say there will be agreement between us? Whether agreement is making me obligatory, mandatory. Whether it is making me mandatory to convert your employee's ESOP into my ESOP or am I just doing it voluntarily? Two things, huh? One is agreement says that my employees ke ESOP you convert into yours. I am mandatorily required to do it. And second is I just do it. Okay, chalo. I'll make you happy. I'll give you my ESOPs. That I'm doing it voluntary. If it is mandatory, if it is mandatory, then in that case you have to find out two figures: pre-combination period, post-combination period. You have to find out two figures: pre-combination, post-combination. This is whenever it is mandatory. Now to find out the pre-combination period, what is the fair value of original award today? Original option what they are having, uska fair value today. Into wasting period completed, 2 years divided by total wasting period, 5 years. So can I say 2 fifth? So 2 fifth, see Mary book may expense was coming for 3 years, I was paying for 5 years. So can I say 2 years expense was not coming? Now I will include it. How it will be included? It will be included as a part of PC. It will be included as a part of PC. Now, I have not yet paid, so it cannot be to bank. So, I will be including in PC asset scheme, liability scheme. It is not to bank, it will be to SBPR. It will not be to bank, it will be to SBPR. So, two years ka, two years basically, which they have already covered over here, it will get included in my PC. And remaining three years, I will book a expense, SBPR comes in my book, and then payment will happen. That all is fine. So, 2 years ka SBPR was not there, total I am making payment for 5 years, how do I include it as a pre-combination period? How to find out pre-combination period value? Fair value of original option at acquisition date into wasting period completed divided by total wasting period. Now, over here there is something given, total wasting period is the wasting period, the original terms or total wasting period under the revised terms, whichever is higher. Total wasting period under original terms or total wasting period under revised terms, whichever is high. Take care. This you got pre combination period. Now, this is pre combination period. Now, I am giving you my ESOPs. There will be some fair value of that. So, whatever is fair value of my ESOPs minus the pre combination period, that becomes post combination. Did you understood? Fair value of original option today into wasting period completed divided by total wasting period, that is a pre combination. Now, whatever ESOPs I am giving you, uska fair value minus pre-combination becomes post-combination, which I have to book it over the remaining wasting period. Which I have to book over the remaining wasting period. So this is when their shareholder, well, their employees' ESOPs are exchanged through my ESOPs. Again, this is only when it was mandatory as a part of agreement or as per law. But if I do it voluntarily, 
if i do it voluntarily just their employees case so if i convert to mine it was not mandatorily required then in that case pre combination period is zero nothing so whatever is the fair value of my esop which i am giving you fully will be recorded as post combination in whatever is the remaining period okay check question over here example uh, fair value of original award on grant date is 50 wasting period 5 years business combination done at beginning of third so can i say 2 years are over beginning of third now fair value of original award today is also 50 okay what is the fair value of original award today 50 Into wasting period completed two divided by total five. So can I say twenty rupees free combination? Okay, twenty is free. Now the new one is also worth fifty. New one is also worth fifty. Fifty minus twenty free. Can I say thirty will be post? But if new one is sixty, if new one is sixty, so sixty minus twenty was free. Forty will be post. So here we have thirty is post. Here we have forty is post. Did you understood? Okay. Now. Suppose the fair value of original award is not fifty today. Fair value of original award is fifty-five. Uska grant date fifty tha. I am not concerned with grant date. What is the fair value of original option today? Fifty-five into number of years completed two divided by total five. So fifty-five into two by five twenty-two is free combination. Twenty-two is free combination. And now new one which I am giving is of sixty rupee. So sixty minus twenty-two thirty-eight is post. the pre combination is included in your pc the post combination is accounted like your esops over the remaining wasting any doubts anybody with this shall i move it okay now if the wasting period is already over if the wasting period is already over so now wasting period already over so what to do imagine wasting period is already over their employees had a esop they had not exercised they had not exercise but now i am giving my esops to them now two option they can directly exercise or i add in one extra wasting period even though wah pe it was completed so if there is no extra wasting period so what will happen is everything will be what pre so whatever basically they had uska fair value was 50 into wasting period completed and total will remain same so it will become pre but ha uh, their value was 50 i am giving them worth 60 then 10 will go in post and they will be booked immediately because the wasting period is complete but if they have to serve for one extra year if they have to serve for one extra then in that case 50 into they have completed 3 total now becomes 4 that will be pre combination and balance will come in post which will be recognized in that one extra fine check this question of green limited green acquired pollution and at the acquisition date they already rendered 2 years total was 5 rendered 2 and now they have given the replacement award the wasting period is reduced to 2 years okay so can i say total was 5 2 was completed 3 was pending instead of 3 pending now it's only to the original wasting period was 5 years the revised wasting period is 4 years fine and market based measure market based measure is nothing but the fair value of option fair value of option today what is the fair value of option today fine original option today is worth 500 into wasting period completed is 2 divided by total wasting period original me 5 niche currently it's 4 whichever is higher 5 so 500 into 2 by 5 pre combination will become 200 And mine is worth six hundred, so six hundred minus two hundred, four hundred will become post combination. Pre combination two hundred will be part of PC. Post combination four hundred will be recorded as an expense over the remaining two years. Okay. Next, non replacement award. Now, sir, what is this non replacement award? Uh, imagine A took over B. If B shut down. If B is shutting down, so can I? Who is going to give them the shares? B is only going to give them the shares. Now, non-replacement award means the problem comes where in CFS. Now, what happens under CFS is it's fine. Two years they've already booked expense, they already have SBPR, but their SBPR doesn't come in my book. Now, next three years, next three years they will book expense in CFS also. Expense will come. The expense in CFS comes only for three years. First two years left out. I need to include now. How do I include it? I include as a part of PC. I include as a part of PC, but problem is there. I am not going to give the shares. So tell me, 
subsidiary shares are going to be issued to someone else their employees subsidiary shares are going to be issued to someone else so can i say my holding in subsidiary will go down subsidiary is going to give shares to someone else so what i will be recording is i'll be recording is nci so here i'll add it to nci the pre so if it's a non replacement award the pre combination period is taken as part of pc but part of pc may it is not credited to as it will be credited to nci same way same way later on third year subsidiary recorded expense and cfs also expense will come cfs also expense will come but cfs may sbpr cannot come instead of sbpr what we have to write is nci clear with this so for non replacement award it will be nci which will be written everything else will remain same okay check question number 9 p is a real estate company acquires q contingent liability so it is not like contingent liability is always a possible obligation contingent liability can be a present obligation under two cases it can be a present obligation under two cases one outflow of economic resources is not probable i know i'll lose the case i know i'll lose the case but is it possible judge may tell me just a reminder or warning and no outflow comes possible na judge may just give you a reminder next time don't do it So can I say outflow is not? I am going to lose the case. It's a present obligation, but outflow is not probable. Or outflow is probable, but I am not able to make a reliable estimate. So in that two cases, contingent liability can be which obligation? Present obligation. Now imagine there was a contingent liability with acquiree. They had a contingent liability. It was a present obligation. They were not able to measure reliably. If they were not able to measure reliably, can I say they did not record? But if I am able to measure reliably, can I say I should record? So contingent liability, which is a present obligation, they did not record. But if I am able to measure fair value, then I should record at the fair value of that liability. But it has to be which one? Present obligation. But if there is a contingent liability, which is a possible obligation, then in my book also it will continue as contingent. Okay, the so contingent liability, which is a possible obligation, will continue as contingent liability in our books. But contingent liability, which was a present obligation, they did not record because they were not able to measure reliably. We, if we are able to measure reliably, we will record it at fair value. We will record it as actual liability in our books. An opposite effect automatically will go in goodwill or capitalism. Okay. Fine. Now, what about contingent assets? Do we record contingent assets? no contingent assets are not recognized in our books contingent assets are not recognized in our books acha one more thing Subs, uh, contingent liability we recorded at acquisition date fair value if it was which ob obligation present obligation we are able to measure now later on usme fair value changes later on the fair value of contingent liability changes where that will go pn that will go always in pn i told you fair value change in liability always goes in pn No need to think only anything. It always goes in PL except own credit risk. It goes in OC. Okay. Now uh, sometimes what happens is like we have just one minute. Need to check live stream is working or not. Okay. Now, sometimes uh, we have some contingent liability which we recorded as actual coming to us, but it might be indemnified by someone else. Like this company we acquired, they have some contingent liability. It was a present obligation; they were not able to measure. We are able to measure. We recorded it. But the thing is, if the payment comes from their supplier, we'll be getting some reimbursement. If reimbursement will be coming, so can I record that liability net of reimbursement? can i record the liability net of reimbursement answer is no the reimbursement asset has to be booked separately as an asset the so reimbursement receivable that you show it separately the indemnification 
the indemnification asset you show it as separately at the fair value of indemnification but our indemnification asset cannot exceed the liability which you have booked if i book the liability 1 crore the indemnification asset can be maximum what nci now how do we have nci under our india's 103 they are telling normally what happens if i acquired 80 percent so 80 percent assets and liability belong to me can i say 20 percent assets and liability belong to nci so whatever is 20 percent assets and liability that i should show it as nci but that is known as proportionate net asset so one option is you show nci at proportionate net asset okay question proportionate net asset will be the carrying amount in the books or the fair values at which we are recording those fair values fair value so it is fair value of proportionate net asset see the word what is the word fair value of proportionate net asset the so second option is india tells you that you can record nci directly at fair value of nci there's a difference between fair value of proportionate net asset and fair value of and say fair value of nci is nothing but like they hold 20000 shares out of 1 lakh we have 80 they have 20 20000 shares what is the market price going on of that company you multiply so that is the fair value of NCI. So, did you understood fair value of NCI and fair value of proportionate net asset? Both the ways we can show. Now, if if NCI is at proportionate net asset, so can I say asset side 20 belongs to them and we are showing them at 20. So, if NCI is at proportionate net asset, there won't be any goodwill capital reserve related to their share. Because their share of asset is 20, they are shown in liability side also at 20. But if they are shown at fair value, their share of asset is 20 and the fair value of NCI based on the market price of the shares what they have it's 25. So, unke share of asset is 20 but we are showing them at 25. So, can I say extra 5 rupees shown? That 5 rupee will go in goodwill. So, if NCI is at proportionate net asset, goodwill is only related to our share. But if NCI is at fair value of NCI, then in that case goodwill will be related to our share as well as NCI share. Yeah, the clear? Okay, now question, if good if NCI is at fair value, do we fair value them every year? If NCI is at fair value, do we fair value them every year? Answer is no. They are fair value on, they are fair valued only on acquisition date. Acquisition date, they are fair value. So, we start NCI with the acquisition date fair value. Later on, whatever is their share of post acquisition profit or loss, that is only added or deducted from NCI. Even if it is at fair value, NCI is not to be fair valued every year. It is to be fair valued only on the date of acquisition. Any doubts? Anybody with this? Shall I move it? Okay. Now, how to find goodwill or capital reserve? Consideration by acquirer. This is basically for our 80%. NCI. This is for the 20%. NCI may be either at proportionate net asset or fair value based on information given in question if question doesn't give fair value of nci we will take it always at proportionate net assets so can i say this is for the 100 percent okay compare the 100 percent net assets so fair value of identifiable assets and liabilities of acquiry 100 percent net assets this 100 percent net asset this 100 percent is basically the value difference is basically goodwill or capital so positive will be goodwill negative will be gain on bargain purchase now what do we do with the gain on bargain purchase if re is clear it comes in oci from oci it goes to capital reserve if reason is clear like i know he was under a stress to sell it urgently if that company was under a stress to sell it urgently can i say they would have sold it at a lower rate the reasons are clear if reason for gain on bargain purchase is clear it will come in oci from oci it goes to capital reserve. if reasons are not clear it will go directly in capital reserve did you understood reason clear oci oci to capital reserve reason not clear directly in capital reserve check november 18 question you acquired 70 percent for 5 million nci is a proportionate share of fair value of net asset okay just can i say proportionate net assets fair value so it's not fair value of nci it's fair value of proportionate net assets and the net assets are 10 million so can i say nci will be 3 million 30 percent Okay, so what our share 70 percent is we paid 5, 70 percent is 5, NCI is 3, total 8, and the net asset coming is 10. So, can I say it is coming negative 2? So, there's a gain on bargain purchase of 2. Now, the thing is, if you see this question, question kya likha hai? 
state whether the procedure followed by A and the resulting measurement are appropriate or not. Can I say this is a theory question? And then the second question is gain on bargain purchase. Now, whether procedure followed by basically A is fine or not, so I tell you, normally, normally under business combination, gain on bargain purchase should not come. If someone is selling business, it's established business, we pay more or less. So generally, gain on bargain purchase doesn't come. So whenever gain on bargain purchase comes, in days 103 says you become double sure. Whenever gain on bargain purchase comes, in days says what? Be double sure. How do we double sure? So by we need to check out the fair value of assets and liabilities is calculated properly. The fair value of NCI is calculated properly. Everything which should be taken under business combination is taken. If something was not to be taken, remember there is a settlement of pre-existing relationship. So out of 120 was towards settlement of case, it should not be taken in PC. So something not to be taken in business combination, don't take it. Something to be taken in business combination, take it. You be double sure and check all things are done properly. If you have done that thing properly, the procedures are correct. So see, so we have to see, and here they have written, A performs a review, determines that business combination does not include a transaction which are to be accounted separately. So can I say they have checked all that things? So are there any transaction to be accounted separately? Check whether the fair values are proper, fair value of consideration transferred is proper, fair value of NCI is proper. If that all thing is done properly, the procedure is proper. The procedure is proper and then comes your gain on bargain purchase 20 lakhs. Next is step acquisition. Okay, what is a step acquisition? Control comes when? Second step may or first step may? Second step. Okay, first step only I have a control, it doesn't fall here. The first step only, like I acquired 60 and now I acquire another 20. 60 plus 20 doesn't fall here. But 20 plus 60? False. Second, second wala is giving you the control. First may you did not had control. If control was not there, now the control is coming to you. What do we do? So whenever we are finding our goodwill capital reserve or whenever we are preparing our accounts, the previous, the previous whatever investments we are having, they are to be remeasured. Okay, that remeasurement is only for CFS. It's not for SFS, it's only for so now. Tell me one thing. Uh, investment in equity. Investment in equity, it's a financial asset. Normally, it's FPT, PNL. If at all, we have chosen a irrevocable option, FPT, OCI. But for investment in subsidiary associate JV, there's one more option. You can show directly at cost. Cost. This is only for investment in subsidiary associate JV. If there's an investment in subsidiary associate JV, there is India's 27. India 27 is separate financial statement. And as per India 27, separate financial statement, investment in subsidiary associate JV can be either at cost or as per 109. 109 is FBT PNL or irrevocable option, the FBT OC. So mostly what people follow is they will continue at cost in SFS. They will follow cost in, but cost is allowed only when it's investment in subsidiary associate JV. If I have a normal investment, I cannot follow. Cost wala, I have to follow in days 109. Yeah, the clear? Okay, so now in your SFS investment in subsidiary associate JV, can I say normally you recorded cost? Okay, now suppose it was 30%, it was associate. Again, you acquired another 30, so it will again be cost only, it is added to investment. So in your SFS, it is investment to bank. Nothing to be done, no remeasurement. Remeasurement is only for the purpose of CFS when we are finding goodwill or Capitals. Goodwill capital reserve does not come in SFS, it comes only in CFS. Okay, so now in CFS, what happens is the previous interest what we have, it is to be remeasured, it is to be brought to current value. And current value brought on a bath, the difference. If it was measured at cost or FPT PNL, the difference goes in PNL. If it was carried at FPT OCI, it will be carried, it will be taken in OCI. So in SFS, if it is at cost or FPT PNL, pe remeasurement gain will go in PNL or loss will go in PNL. But if it was basically FBT OCI in SFS, then in that case the remeasurement gain loss goes in OCI. Yeah, the clear? Cheek. So previous it's remeasured, this is how it will go. Now, one more thing. Uh, imagine when I'm finding goodwill capital reserve, when I'm finding goodwill capital reserve, can I say I had 20 plus I got 60, total now minus 80, and can I say now, tell me one thing, earlier it was associate, 
If earlier it was associate, can I say we would have followed equity method? Earlier it was associate, if we would have followed which method? Equity method. Equity method, can I say our share of profit or loss we include? Our share of profit or loss we include in our PNL. Now, I told you that if basically it is in days applicable, that a subsid that associate also would have two sets in PNL, normal and OCI. Our share in normal PNL would add in normal PNL. Our share in OCI will add in OCI. So earlier it was associate. Our share in OCI we would have added in OCI accumulated in other equity. But now it's no longer associate. So whatever is lying in other equity, what should I do? Remove it. Repeat. Remove it as if that associate is sold off. As if that associate is Okay, if that associate is sold off, what will happen? If that associate is sold off, what will happen? If it's item reclassified to PNL, it will go in PNL. If it's item not reclassified to PNL, it will go in retained earnings. It will go in retained earnings. Or simple words, if it was basically an investment in equity over there, and suppose in standalone book it was FBT OCI. In standalone book it was FBT OCI. Standalone, it's fine, it's continued like that. But in CFS, can I say investment goes away? In CFS, investment goes away, their assets and liabilities comes in. Now, it was FPT OCI. So, can I say there is some OCI reserve which is also there? What do I do with that OCI reserve? That OCI reserve will be removed as if that investment in equity is sold off. And remember, investment in equity is item which is not reclassified of equity interest in OCI. Take okay, our share of OCI wala thing, that all. If the amount was recognized in OCI, it shall be recognized on same basis as you have directly disposed of the previous equity interest. Means as if you have sold off the associate. So whenever it is basically kind of sold off the associate, if its item reclassified to PNL, it goes in PNL. If its item not reclassified to PNL, it will go in retained earnings. But uh, suppose there was investment in equity only, which was at FBT OCI. Investment in equity is item not reclassified. It will go directly to retained Okay, now this question is very important. May 19. May 19. Okay, first April 2001. 1st April 2001, you acquired 30% and can I say 30% it was associate, if it was associate in your CFS you would have followed equity method, okay you acquired for 8000 using equity method, using equity method you have recorded following your share of profit, your share of exchange difference, your share in your books, okay is it in SFS or is it in CFS, CFS, in your CFS it is 8850, now this is there. Now you acquired remaining 70. Okay, so we already had 30, we acquired remaining 70. Is the first 30 to be remeasured? We had 30, we acquired 70. Can I say it's a step equation? So earlier 30 is to be remeasured. Okay, what's the carrying amount? 8850. Okay, remeasure karke, now it is 9000. So can I say difference is 150? Okay, now 150 will go in PNL. 150 will go in PNL. If I just go over here, we remeasure, uska gain is 150, investment debit to PNL 150, but it's only for CFS. Yeah, that clear? Okay, now coming to calculation of goodwill capital reserve. Okay, this identifiable assets basically are 30,000 and we acquired 70% for what? 25. Okay, we acquired 70% for 25. Okay, and earlier one is remeasured to 9,000, 25 plus 9, can I say 34? NCI is nil, 30 plus 70, 100% we have. So, 34 and we are getting a net asset 30, goodwill will come 4000. So now, check goodwill is coming 4000. This is journal entry. This is journal entry. Net asset comes in 30. We are paying 25 and old investment goes away now 9. After remeasurement, they were 9. NCI is nil, balancing figure is goodwill. Yeah, the clear first one remeasured now equation entry done now question earlier 30 percent it was associate can i say now it is no longer associate 
So whatever previously we had recognized in OCI, tell me how much we had recognized in OCI. This was recognized in PNL. This too, this too was recognized in OCI. Share in exchange difference. Exchange difference is item. Reclassified, not reclassified. Exchange difference. Reclassified. It's item reclassified to PNL and revaluation reserve. Not reclassified. Now they have to be removed. Now nah. we can't still continue. Associate is not there. So I cannot have a OCI reserve of associate. So that needs to be removed. So 100, 100 I need to remove it, take it in PNL. 50 I need to remove it, take it in retainer. So if you check over here, this 100 goes to PNL. Era and this 50 goes to retainer. So how many entries did we do? Four. Old remeasured acquisition entry and then whatever was there in OCI now needs to be removed because it is gone. So one was item reclassified, one was item not reclassified. We did four entry. ICAI has done one entry combining all four. So if you open up ICI book, you will find just this one entry. ICI has passed a combined entry. If you directly read combined entry, you will not understand anything. Because there are actually four entries. Next, business combination without transfer of consideration. Business combination without transfer of consideration. I don't pay anything. I get a control. Good, na? I don't pay anything, but I get a control. What is it? How? Okay, one is basically imagine you were holding you were holding 40% in a company, 60% was held by someone else. Now that company comes out with a buyback. That company comes out with a buyback 25%. I don't give a single share in buyback, others are giving 25%. So mine was 40, others was 60. Now they give back 25% in buyback. They give back 25% in buyback. So can I say now out of 60, 25% given back, now their holding becomes 35. Okay, now total will become 75 minus 40, theirs is 35. Can I say now I have a controlling interest? So that company came out with buyback. Many shares nahi diye, others gave it. Now my percentage holding has increased. That's one. Second, uh, I was having 60%. I was having 60, others were having 40, but I had an agreement with them that I will not take any decisions alone without your approval for a period of five years. So can I say for a period of five years, I was not able to take the decisions unilaterally. Now five years are over. Can I say now I am able to take the decisions unilaterally. Now I am not paying anything, but now I got control. So minority ka veto power is lapsing. Or third, we just have a business combining. Like suppose I am doing very well. I am managing my business very well. You have lots of money, but you are not managing. So you have said that, sir, you control our assets and liabilities. Okay, you don't pay anything to us, but huh, you can share half of profits. So I control your assets and liabilities and I'll take over 50% of your profits. Now, decisions I am taking unilaterally. I have a power, I have a right or exposure or variable return and I can use my power to influence the return. So this is just an agreement. One company was very good in management. Other company had lots of assets, but they are not able to manage. So they told the good company to manage their company. The good company doesn't have to pay anything. Now, nah, I am not given any shares also. They are not giving me shares. But I will control your assets and liabilities. Profits I will share. Half. So that is also without consideration. Now, how do we account over here? How do we account over here? Now, first case. In the first case, can I say earlier I was holding 40%. Now, they came with a buyback and my control came up. Can I say earlier I was having something? He was having something. So, can I say the earlier control was not there. Now, control comes up. The previous interest is to be reinvested. Same account. Okay, second case. I was having 60% minority ka veto power lapsed after how many years? Five. Okay, so earlier I was having something. Na, so it has to be remeasured. Dono case mein it has to be remeasured. Third case. Third case, I don't have even a single share. I don't have a single share of them because I am good management. They are bad management. They just told me to manage the company and I am getting half profits. I don't have any share in that company. Huh. Because you are, you are controlling them, consolidation has to be done. Even though you don't have a single share, even though you don't have a single share, that company is your subsidiary, you have to consolidate. But then you show 100% as NCI. So in assets and liabilities, 100% is NCI. Profit may 50% is you, 50% is NCI. Clear with this? 
Okay, check over here. Now, Sita and Beta combine their business together for forming a dual listed corporation. Both the parties will have original listing and board of DLC. 10 members may say 6 members are of Sita. In that newly company DLC, out of 10 members, how many members are there of Sita? 6. So, can I say new company Sita will control? Okay, then indirectly, can I say Sita will control Beta? Okay, did Sita paid anything to Beta? No. Did Sita have any shares of Beta? No, I don't have any shares, nothing, but I'll get control over their business. I have to prepare a CFS. So, Sita will prepare a CFS. They will combine all things of Beta, but the thing is, I don't have any shares of them. 100% will be NC. So, check over here, consideration is 0. The net asset comes 70. NCI is 80. There will be a goodwill coming off 10. Taken. Non current asset acquired under business combination and held for sale. Now pay attention. Non current asset acquired under what? Business combination held for sale. What is this? Hmm. Suppose your PP comes to me, but your PP, I am not going to use it. Day one only, I am going to sell it off. Business combination may your PPE came, but I don't need your plant. So immediately it is classified as what? Held for sale. The non-current asset coming under business combination, but it is immediately classified as held for sale. It will not come at acquisition date fair value. It will come at fair value less cost to sell. It will come at which value? Fair value less cost to sell. That is as per in day is 105. Okay, check question number 13, November 2020. You hold 25%. And you obtain control when you further acquire 65%. So can I say previous 25% will be remeasured? Okay. And now you are holding 90%. Okay, consideration 59 lakh cash. And you are issuing also 1 lakh shares. 1 lakh shares, the price is 10. So can I say 10 lakh rupees? So 59 cash, 10 lakh rupee I am giving by shares. And post. I will be holding 5% of your mother. You will be holding 5% of my capital. So it is not a reverse acquisition. Fine. Okay. There is also a contingent consideration. There is a contingent consideration to pay rupees 7 lakh. If cumulative profit exceeds. Now fair value of contingent consideration is 3 lakh. So PC may 59 cash, 10 lakh by shares. 3 lakh is contingent consideration. And previous equity interest ka fair value. Previous equity interest ka fair value. Transaction cost will go in PNL. They say NCI is to be taken at fair value. Fair value of NCI is 750. Okay. If N fair value of NCI is to be taken, it's only on acquisition date. Later they are not fair value. Previously held interest. Previously held interest in our books it's 6 lakh. The fair value is 20. Okay. So if I see total consideration, Consideration by acquirer, it is 59 plus 10 plus 3. How is 59 plus 10? 69 plus 3, 72. 72 plus 20, 92. 92 plus NCI is 750. Total became 99.5 and net assets are 60. So, what is your goodwill coming? 39.5. 92 and goodwill is 39. Yeah. Next one, question number 14. Next one, question number 14. Balance sheet of professional and dynamic two companies given. Fine, I'll just go down. P acquired 70% by issuing its own share. One share of P for every two shares. Okay, one share of P for every two shares. We acquired how many percent? 70. Do one thing. How much are the shares in D. 400 is capital. 400 uh, rupees are in lakhs. Of rupees 100 each. So, can I say 4 lakh shares? Okay, total. Did we acquire all 4 lakh? 70 percent. What is the 70 percent of 4 lakh? 280. 280 we acquired? Okay, 280 we acquired. For every one, 2 shares of there, I will give 1. So, can I say I am going to give 1 lakh 40,000 shares? Okay, 1 lakh 40,000 shares I will give you and my 1 share is of 40. So, 1,40,000 shares into 40, your PC is coming 56. Is it coming 56 lakhs? Okay, PC 56, fine. Now, PP's fair value is 350. So, whenever I am finding net assets, PP has to be taken at 350. 
Okay, P Limited agreed to make an additional payment which is higher of 35 lakh and higher of 35 lakh and 25% of excess profits. And Dynamic has earned 10 lakh profit in preceding year, expecting to earn 20. So, can I say ex excess is 10? Last year was 10, this year we are expecting 20, the extra how much we are expecting? 10. Oh, extra 10 ka 25%, so 2 and half. So, they are going to pay me 35 lakh or 2 and half, whichever is higher. So, I will take what? 35 lakh. So, 35 lakh will be included. Fine. And one founder shareholder, I will pay 20 lakh if he stays. If he stays is towards selling shareholder, employee, employee. This will be accounted as per 109. Remaining period may future may is to be accounted. It will not affect today. So, this is cancelled. Okay, they have some share based payment which are replaced. Okay, replacement. Remember, I have to find pre combination, post combination. Okay, so what is the fair value of original option today? Fair value of original option is 5. 2 years completed divided by total wasting period is 4 years. So, into 2 by 4. 5 into 2 by 4 is 2.5 pre combination period. I will include 2.5 in PC. I'll include two points. It's a replacement. I'll give my shares so I can write SBPR. If it's a non-replacement, I cannot write SBP. So 2.5 to be included in PC. Okay, they have a lawsuit pending, dynamic. And 50 rupees. So dynamic has some lawsuit. They are showing it as contingent liability. They are not able to measure, but I am able to measure reliably. If I am able to measure reliably, I'll show it as actual liability. I'll show actual liability of five. And tax applicable is how many percentage? 30 percent. Now, over here, uh, all the other points we discussed. Uh, so, in your PC, what is to be taken? First is 56, then is basically your 35 lakh, which I have to pay it in next year. And then 2.5 is a part of SVPR or pre combination period. Now, assets are coming. I'll have all assets and liabilities which are there of subsidiary, but while I'm taking assets, the PP is to be taken at 350. Now, just take PP. How much was the value of PP? Fine. I'll take at 350. PP went down. Achha, uh, PP went down by how much? 150 rupees. 150 rupees asset has gone down, but loss I'll not get it now. I'll get it in future. I have to create a DTA. So, DTA is to be created. Now, tax rate is given. If it is not given, we ignore. 30 percent. 45 and uh, there is a liability coming of 5, extra 5 liability I am booking right now but again it will be allowed when I pay in future. So Again DTA is to be created 5 ka 30 percent 1.5, 46.5 will be the DTA which will be recorded. So if you check your solution which you have, if you check the solution, any material you referred this question will be there in all the materials. Yeah, so Any faculties material you referred it will always be there. So 46.5 will be the DTA when you are calculating net assets. Yes, please. Uh, deferred consideration over here. Are they giving you the rate of interest? No, not given. Though it is ignored. And that's why 35 will be taken. If question gives the rate of interest, the deferred consideration will take the present value. Uh, no need to assume. Unless they say better is follow what ICA is following. Okay. Next is CCBC. Okay. Three concepts are left. Actually, two. CCBC and reverse activation. Let us finish it, then we take a break. Okay. Now, CCBC is what? A common control business combination, wherein the entities or the businesses which are combining, entities or businesses which are combining earlier and now they are under the control of same party or parties. They are under the same party or parties and the control is not transit, not like just for a day, if it is just for a day and then it is sold to someone else, then it is not a CC, BC. So, earlier also, now also the control has to be with the same party or parties. Now, when I say party or parties, it is possible A and B together, A and B together were controlling A limited, A and B together are controlling B limited also. And now, if A, A and B, A takes over B or B takes over A, then it will be a CC, BC. Because earlier also they were under control of A and B. Now also they are under control of A and B. Fine. Now how do we account for CCBC? If there is a CCBC, the simple way over here they are telling is, you have to account it by pooling of interest method. Now under pooling of interest method, the assets liabilities will not come at acquisition date fair value. The assets liability will come at 
book well and it is assumed as if you are together since beginning it is assumed as if you are together since beginning so actually unke reserves the reserves are also included now normally what we include is only the assets liability here what will include assets liabilities and reserves everything will be included so can i say simple words may if i see your balance sheet asset minus liability minus reserve bacha kya capital what is left out is capital so now your capital doesn't come i am giving you my shares so my capital will come so instead of your capital in short my capital comes now if i am paying you more than your paid up capital if i am paying you more than your paid up capital it will come in capital reserve if i pay you less than your capital the paid up capital that will also come in capital reserve. if i am paying more you debit the capital reserve show capital reserve negative there is no goodwill come what will not come good actually if you are paying more you can write it in matlab if capital reserve is there you debit capital reserve else you should debit pnl but ici does what they show negative capital reserve तो यहाँ पे गुडविल कैन नॉट कम ओनली कैपिटल रिजर्व विल कम हाँ तो एसेट्स लाइबिलिटीज रिजर्व एवरीथिंग आर कम इन अवर बुक योर कैपिटल की जगह इट्स रिप्लेस्ड बाय माय कैपिटल इफ आई एम पेइंग यू मोर एक्स्ट्रा इज डेबिटेड टू कैपिटल रिजर्व इफ आई एम पेइंग यू लेस एक्स्ट्रा इज क्रेडिटेड टू कैपिटल एसेट्स एंड लाइबिलिटी केम एट बुक वैल्यू नाउ आई बी पेइंग यू हाउ डू आई पे इज इट पॉसिबल आई पे यू बाई कैश या इफ आई एम पेइंग कैश टू कैश Okay, is it possible? I am giving you shares. Yes, if I am giving you shares, shares are to be recorded at nominal value. If I am giving you shares, the shares are to be recorded as nominal value. Okay, if I am giving you asset, I took over your business. I took over your assets liability. I give you land. I give you what? Land. So land which I am giving. Land which I am giving. Your assets liability coming. They are at book value. Land which I give you. The PC is the fair value of land given. I repeat, assets and liabilities coming, book value. If I give cash, PC is the cash given. If I am giving shares, PC is nominal value of shares given. If I am giving some land, PC is fair value of land given. Land coming, like suppose you had some land that comes, that will come at book value. But I gave you some land now, that PC is fair value of land. Clear with this? Okay, the assets and liabilities are reflected at carrying amount. No adjustments are made to the fair value of assets. We don't record any new asset, any new liability. Uh, only to harmonize accounting policy, we may have changes in the fair value. Fine. Identity of reserves is preserved. In determining PC, in determining PC, if asset is there other than cash, asset other than cash, I gave you shares. So can I say it will be the fair value of land given? I gave you land, not shares. I gave you land. It will be. fair value of land given okay if at all i am giving you the securities shares the securities shall be at nominal value fine acha and one more thing imagine a limited took over b limited this or this year if a limited takes over b limited this year when i prepare a cfs can i say in this year these assets and liabilities are coming when the previous year's figures are restated do we include previous year may also be figure I repeat, I took over B Limited this year. If B Limited I took over this year, when I prepare a CFS, B K assets and liabilities are added in this year onwards. Previous year to nahi the. So under normal acquisition accounting, previous year figures will be without B. Current year will be with B. But under CCBC, previous year's figures will also be with B Limited. So the financial statement in respect of prior period should be. Restated as if the business combination has occurred from the beginning of previous year. So current year A plus B, previous year A plus B, previous year beginning A plus. B. Okay. So if it's an acquisition accounting, if it's acquisition accounting, I acquired this year. So this year is A limited plus B limited. Previous year is only A. But if it is a pooling of interest, CCBC, CCBC. So I have to think as if we are together since. beginning and effects are to be given from previous year beginning to so this year end a plus b previous year end a plus b previous year beginning also a plus b did you understood okay now check over here now this is previous year beginning also a plus b but now i have a question in previous year beginning we were not under common control only 
प्रीवियस ईयर बिगिनिंग आई वॉज नॉट अंडर कॉमन कंट्रोल ओनली प्रीवियस ईयर मिडल में वी आर अंडर कॉमन कंट्रोल देन वी हेव टू एज्यूम वी आर टूगेदर सुंस प्रीवियस ईयर मिडल बिकॉज तब कॉमन कंट्रोल था ही नहीं तो इट नॉट बी देर तो चेक ओवर ईयर कॉमन कंट्रोल एक्सटेंड बियॉन्ड द स्टार्ट ऑफ कंपेरेटिव पीरियड तो कॉमन कंट्रोल वॉज देर बिफोर द बिगनिंग ऑफ प्रीवियस ईयर तो हाउ वट आई डू दिस ईयर ए प्लस बी प्रीवियस ईयर ए प्लस बी प्रीवियस ईयर बिगनिंग ऑल्सो ए प्लस बी एंड यहां पर कॉमन कंट्रोल स्टार्टेड इन प्रीवियस ईयर लाइक फर्स्ट ऑक्टोबर नाइनटीन फर्स्ट ऑक्टोबर नाइनटीन ए लिमिटेड अक्वायर्ड एबीसी अक्वायर्ड डी एफ बोथ आर कंट्रोल्ड बाय शेयर होल्डर ए नाउ ए मेड अ इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एबीसी वेन ए मेड अ इन्वेस्टमेंट इन एबीसी वेन दिस इज टू थाउजेंड एट टू थाउजेंड एंड दिस इज टू थाउजेंड एट तो कैसे दे बिकेम कॉमन कंट्रोल कब से They became common control group. Say A has investment in ABC since 2000, and A has investment in DF since 2008. So can I say 1, 10, 2008? 2008 say they are the well, common control. Now, if I see over here, now acquisition happened on A acquired B or basically ABC acquired DF on 1409. So when I am having the figures, this is basically 910. 910 is ABC plus DF. Nine ten, but when I go to eight nine, I cannot have A B C plus D F for the whole time because common control was not there from first April. Then it will be only from October first two thousand eight onwards. First October two thousand. We say we are together since beginning, but yeah, it has to be there. Common control has to be there at beginning of previous year. If common control was not there at beginning of previous year. Common control came on one ten two thousand eight. So we assume we are together since one ten. 2000 okay the check over here the first question we are together since beginning so this year previous year previous year beginning everything is total but if at all i see this one march 20 we are together this year end previous year end also together previous year beginning will not be required because previous year beginning we were not together it is coming from 1 10 and yahan pe this year a plus b matlab x abc xyz full previous year ABC ka full year XYZ ka it's added only from one ten two thousand eight. It's actually one ten two thousand eight. This years are wrong, right? Here, pe. This is nineteen twenty. This is eighteen nineteen. This becomes eighteen nineteen. Clear with this? Okay, fine. Oh, D merger is also there. <laughs> Ten minutes more. Okay, now see D merger is uh, from one entity. We are splitting that into two or more. So earlier there was one entity with two divisions. Now that division is separated into a separate company. That's nothing but your D merger. Under D merger there are two parties. One is called as a D merged company. Other is called as a resultant. Like. Like there was a company called AB Limited. They had division A, division B. AB Limited, division A, division B. From AB Limited, division B is separated. So AB Limited is called demerged company. From where the division is getting out, and the new company B Limited that is called as a D, that is called as a resultant company. Okay, for demerged company, can I say assets and liabilities are going out one division? One division is going out, so they will pass entry. How my assets and liabilities go away? Now two things: my assets liability go away. The new company which is created, either they might give shares to me, or they might give the shares directly to my getting assets and liabilities. New company is getting assets and liabilities. Okay, new company gets assets and liabilities, and they are giving their shares. Okay, if they are giving their shares, they are getting assets and liabilities. Difference will go in goodwill or Capitalism, but 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 but, there was a guy who was holding sixty percent in old company. There was a guy who was holding sixty percent in old company. So in new company also, can I say that guy will be holding sixty percent? So that guy was controlling the old company also. That guy will be controlling still the new company also. Then it becomes CCBC. If it becomes CCBC, then in that case we can't have goodwill. Yada ya. We can't have goodwill, and the resultant company has to book everything at book values only. They will book everything at 
book value is only and the difference will go in capital reserve positive capital reserve or negative capital so when the demerger will be CCBC, when demerger will be CCBC, when there was one guy who was controlling old company, the same guy will also be controlling the, de uh, the resultant company as well. But if no one was controlling old company, if no one was controlling old company, can I say no one will control new company also. Old company, may there are many shareholders all holding 5%, 10%, 5%, 10%, 10%. So can I say no one controls old and no one will control new. Then it is not a CCBC. So whether it is CCBC or not, it will impact the accounting of resultant company. Demerged company's accounting will remain same. For demerged company, asset liability goes away. What goes away? Asset liability goes away. If I get the share, investment in equity shares debit. Difference is profit loss on demerged. If I don't get the share, just asset liability goes. Difference is profit loss on demerged. So whether it is CCBC or not, it is going to impact only the books of resultant company fine check when consideration is paid directly to the shareholders they pay directly to my shareholders can i say i don't get anything my asset goes credit my liability goes debit difference is profit or loss on demerge okay when consideration is paid to me my asset goes credit my liability goes debit i get investment in equity and difference is profit or loss on demerge now, books of resultant company, asset comes, liability comes. They are giving shares, equity share capital, securities premium. Difference is goodwill or capital reserve. But if it is a CCBC, then it will not be goodwill capital reserve. Then it will be only capital reserve. And assets and liabilities will come at book values. So, check. In resultant company, it doesn't make a difference whether the shares are given to demerged company or to their shareholders. I am giving shares. And demerger can be CCBC. One of the shareholder holds more than TK. Last topic is reverse acquisition. Last topic is reverse acquisition. Keep smiling. I'm standing. So I'll not like it. Enthusiasm doesn't come back. Okay, now coming to this uh, reverse acquisition. Normally what happens is, if A limited takes over B limited, imagine we are taking 80% shares of B. Now, by giving our shares, if I give my shares, I take over your shares, normally it appears A took over B. But yeah, suppose B was a bigger company. If B was a bigger company, then can I say A has to give much more shares. And when I am giving much more shares to them, the shareholders of B will eventually control A. So on paper, it appears A took over B, but legally, Actually, what is happening? The shareholders of B will get a control over A limited. That is called as a reverse acquisition. Now, do I account under reverse acquisition? So, legal acquirer is A, legal acquirer is B, but accounting wise, accounting acquirer is B and accounting acquiry is A. So, all the figures of B limited will remain same. B ka assets, B's liability, B's reserves, everything will remain same. So don't think that A took over B. Accounting is like B took over A. So to the figures of B, figures of A are added. To the figures of B, figures of A are added. Which value? Acquisition date, fair value. The assets and liabilities of A will be added at acquisition date, fair value. Did you understood? And difference will go in goodwill or capital. So check. So don't think that A took over B. Account it as if B took over A. So, accounting for reverse acquisition, accounting will be done as if B has taken over A. Accounting will be done as if B has taken over A. To the figures of B, figures of B will remain as it is. The fair value of assets and liabilities of A are added. And goodwill capital reserve will also be calculated as if B has taken over A. Okay, now check question 16. Two questions are there. Very good one. AX, BX, they form ABX. So, now... Accounting wise, for the legally if I see, can I say ABX is the acquirer, new company, AX and BX. But now they are telling, if I just go down over here, if I just go down over here, if they say both the entities are under common control, so can I say coming to ABX, it has to be at which value? So all figures of AX 14,000 and if you check number of shares in BX, 7, 7 and 14, so can I say? One share ka price is rupees 20. 
bx is taking over ax now i have to pay them 11000 my one share is worth 20 today so can i say i should give them 11000 divided by double zero shares so assume i am paying them 11000 equal to the fair value of their asset how i am paying i am giving my shares now abx is nothing but bx because that bx is controlling so think abx is nothing but bx so how many shares bx should give bx ka share is worth 20 i have to give them 11000 i should give them 5500 shares okay but now if you see solution So legally, ABX is acquirer, acquiree is AX and BX. But accounting wise, BX acquirer, AX is acquiree. And how it will be accounted? All the fi figures of BX will remain same, including reserves. The assets and liabilities of AX will be recorded at fair value. The shareholders of BX, so whatever is BX, that will remain same. No change at all. And PC for AX is the fair value of AX, that is 11,000 crores. Or 11,000. Now, it is discharged. We are going to give a request. If fair value of business was not given, then the fair value of net assets. Okay, next question. Value of non-current asset. Non-current asset is 1,500. All our others are same. If you just check non-current asset, it was 13. 13 ki jaga, it's how much? 15. So, assets and liabilities of A are added. Only assets, liabilities, not reserves. So, your retained earning of A is not added. B's retained earning will remain same this all b ka figure is ditto copy paste now a's figure are added is may all these figures will be added this will be added at not 1300 this will be added at 1500 tk now what should be the consideration now check over here a ka share is worth 16 now accounting is not a taking over b accounting is b taking over a b taking over a now a may there were 100 shares so don't think that a took 100 percent of b accounting as if B took 100% of A. It's not A taking 100% of B. It's B taking 100%. Okay. If I take 100% of yours, you have 100 shares. What is the market value of your share? 16. So, can I say your company is total worth 1600. So, PC is 1600. PC is 1600. Accounting is done not if as if A takes over B. Accounting is done as if B value of A's business what is the fair value of your business? You have total 100 shares which are worth 16 rupees. You have total 100 shares which are worth 16. So, PC becomes 1600. Did you understood PC 1600? PC 1600 and now assets and liabilities of A are already given which are coming in. Usme this 1500 difference comes of shares. Should be from A's perspective. But now I have not done that way. That's why number of shares, face value. If you see IC, I will not write anything on they will not write off how much rupees face value will be missing. It's basically like just a k value that is to be done. When we are finding goodwill capital reserve, 45 percent clearly I paid something right now. Previous investment ka today's fair value is to be taken. Fine. Now they have given this thing. These will be coming at which value? Fair value. Take care. Now, if you see here, cash held in functional currency 4 and here, 4.5. Uh, this is actually wrong. Cash in my pocket, your pocket, it has to be same. And both the con both the companies have a functional currency, rupee only. So, it's not like one may rupee is there, other may dollar is there. So, it is not like that. It has to be 4. This is a typing mistake. Okay, just change it. Correct. What is their capital given? 12 lakh. Okay, 12 lakh percent you do. Fight on the fact which came up after the DOA, it cannot be there in business combination. Wo PC mein nahi aa sakta hai. Then that increase 3.5 becoming 4, 3.5 becoming 4, that will be accounted as per the separate index. And currently, we are doing only business combination accounting, so we are ignoring it. So, customer relation intangible asset ka value increased. Now, intangible asset value is increasing. Two options if you are following cost model. You cannot take the increase, but if you are following a revaluation model, you will take the increase. Otherwise, it will be ignored as per in day is 38. Okay, 31st December, you have got all information. They are not related. Tax is this. Okay, all question we already covered. Any doubts? Anybody with this?
we are done with business combination and again we take a break of 15 minutes 15 minutes break and then we'll finish off consolidated financial statements 515 we are meeting back online people 515 sharp we are meeting back Okay, hi, welcome back. Now, last session of the day, uh, we finished consolidated financial statements and if time permits, we will do one or two standards, but it's highly doubtful. <laughs> Let's see. It's 5.15 now. We will take till 7 o'clock. Okay, now. Uh, let's begin with consolidated financial statements. No noise, please. <clears throat> now, uh, unit one is just an introduction to consolidated financial statement. Financial statements are of three types individual, separate, consolidated. Individual are for those who do not have a subsidiary associate JV. Separate financial statements are for those which have a subsidiary associate JV, but they are accounting for that subsidiary associate JV as per India is 27. As per India is 27, investment in subsidiary associate JV can be either at cost or as per India is 109. In India is 109, investment in equity is either FBT PNL or if you have chosen an irrevocable option, then it will give FBT OCR. And consolidated financial statements are the financial statements of a group as a whole presented as a single entity. Okay, fine. Now, a uh, parent is an entity which controls one or more entity. Subsidiary is an entity which is controlled by someone else. Joint venture is an entity where someone is having joint control. Joint venture may people are having joint control. And associate is an entity where you are having a significant influence. Now, if I have a subsidiary, if I have a subsidiary, we are required to prepare a consolidated financial statement. That will be as per India's 11. Zero. That is as per India's 110. Now, joint arrangement is an arrangement where we have a joint control. The investors are having joint control. Now, joint arrangements can be of two types joint operation, joint venture. How to account for joint arrangements? We have India's 111. Okay. Now, if it's an associate, how to account for associate? That's India's 28. Plus, if it is a joint venture, if it's a joint venture, how to account for joint venture in your CFS? Joint venture and associates both are accounted by equity method. That equity method is given under your India's 28. Okay, India's 27 is separate financial statement. Under your India's 27, they've just mentioned one thing. If you have an investment in subsidiary associate JV, in your SFS, you can record it either at cost or as per India's 109. And India's 112 is related to disclosure. If I have an associate, JV, subsidiary, uske related, some disclosures are to be given, which is given under your India's 112. Exam angle, this India's 112 is not relevant. Theek. Now, this is a kind of a bit summary. Okay, If I have a control, can I say it's a subsidiary? If it's a subsidiary, accounting has to be as per India's 110. So if control is yes, 110. Okay, if control is no, so control is not there, then check whether we have a joint control. If joint control is there, yes. So see the type of joint arrangement. Is it a joint operation? Is it a joint venture? 
is it a joint operation or is it a joint venture if it is a joint operation accounting is 111 if it is a joint venture sfs you account as per 111 cfs you account as per india s 28 equity method okay if there is a no joint control okay control is not there joint control is also not there control is not there joint control is also not there so then then what should i do then i need to check out is there a significant influence if there is a significant influence equity method will come in days 28 but if i don't have a control don't have a joint control don't have a significant influence can i say it's just a normal investment normal investment in equity share accounted as per indias 109 it's just a financial asset theek okay. hai now let's go to unit number 3 unit number 2 is definition that's fine unit number 2 is definition that is fine Just a minute. This is not appearing. I need to. Okay, now unit number three is basically your NDS one one zero. NDS one one zero tells you when do we have a control. The control is defined under unit number three. Yes. So Companies Act section one twenty nine. In your section one twenty nine, which is on financial statements, subsection three says if you have one or more subsidiary associate or JV, you are mandatorily required to prepare CFS. So Companies Act has made it mandatory you have to prepare. CFS. Is there any exemption for preparing CFS under your Companies Act? A intermediate subsidiary who is exempted? Yeah. Intermediate, intermediate subsidiary, or you call it as intermediate parent. They are exempted provided there are certain conditions. Which are the conditions? One, you are a wholly owned or a partly owned subsidiary of someone else, like it's A to B, B to C, which is an intermediate one. B, B is exempted provided B is unlisted. B is unlisted. Ultimate parent A, A is preparing CFS. Which are basically as per the NDS or which are filed with ROC and the other shareholders of B. Suppose B is not a wholly owned subsidiary of A. A holds sixty percent in B. There are forty percent others. Other shareholders of B do not object of B not preparing CFS. So other members have been intimated in writing. They do not object. Second, it's not a listed or in process of listing. And the ultimate holding company is preparing financials consolidated, which is filed with. ROC. All three conditions are fulfilled. Then this intermediate B is accepted. Simple words mean unlisted intermediate parent or unlisted intermediate subsidiary having Indian parent is accepted. If it's an Indian parent, they will file as per the India's over here. If the parent is foreign, if so imagine A is in foreign, can I say they will not prepare CFS as per India's? So then in that case, exemption will not be available to be listed. Okay. Now, what does AS twenty one say? Now, AS twenty one is not relevant for us. So, as such, basically, only we are having NDS. AS twenty one doesn't tell you when to prepare CFS. It just says if you are preparing CFS, prepare as per AS twenty one. And AS twenty one has given two exemptions. Accounting standard twenty one has given two exemptions. If a control is temporary, subsidiary you acquired, but you are going to sell it off within twelve months, such subsidiaries are not to be consolidated. Or subsidiary operates under a severe long term restriction. Which significantly impair ability to transfer funds to parent. Like I have a subsidiary in Ukraine. Now, basically, would I be able to control that subsidiary in real sense as of now? No. And if my funds are stuck up over there, and suppose now we are not able to get our funds also over from there, so it is operating under a severe long-term restriction. If restriction is long-term, it will be there at least twelve months, and such subsidiaries are not to be consolidated. ठीक है. Now, requirement of India is one one zero. One one zero says each parent 
each parent has to present a CFS. So can I say if you are a parent, you have to mandatorily prepare CFS. So in days 110 also says prepare mandatorily CFS. TK. Now question. A L L P. A L L P holds 60 percent in B. Whether A L L P has to prepare CFS? A L L P holds 60 percent in B. So can I say L L P? L L P became a parent, na? No? Okay. Whether Companies Act applies to L L P? No. Okay. Second. Whether India is applies to L L P? Whether India is applies to L L P? No. India are only for companies. So India doesn't apply. Companies Act doesn't apply. Can I say they have to follow normal accounting standard? A normal accounting standard AS21 doesn't tell you when to prepare CFS. AS21 just tells you if you are preparing, prepare as per AS21. The question whether this ALLP has to prepare, answer is no. Companies Act don't apply, in days 110 don't apply. Now, exemption for preparing CFS under your INDAS. In days, in they said every parent has to prepare. CFS, if you are a parent, you prepare CFS. Exemption is one, the same one which is given under your Companies Act, that is your intermediate subsidiary, unlisted one having an Indian parent. They are exempted. And if you are an investment entity, if you are which entity? Investment entity. And you are measuring your investment in subsidiary at FBT PNL. If your investment in subsidiaries are shown at FBT PNL, then that is exempted. Now, what's an investment company? I'll come to it later. And third, entities which are specifically created for post-employment benefit. Now, what is this post-employment benefit? Gratuity, that is a post-employment benefit. The so, Infosys created an Infosys Gratuity Trust. So, that Infosys Gratuity Trust is not to be consolidated. Fine. Now, A Limited to whom Indies, A Limited which follows Indies did not consolidate B. A Limited who are following in days did not consolidate be on the ground that we are going to dispose of in near future is it valid it's held for temporary control only the temporary control exemption is given only under as not under in days so answer is no temporary control exemption is not there under in days under in days one is that intermediate subsidiary second is investment company and third is entities which are there for post employment benefits <coughs> Okay, question number one is a good one. X has a subsidiary A, 100%. A has a subsidiary B and C, they are also 100%. Okay, there is an intermediary in between? A. Intermediary in between is A. Now check. Company X is listed in India. X prepares CFS as per India. So can I say ultimate parent prepares as per India? A is unlisted. A is unlisted. Not in process of listing. And company X does not object A not preparing CFS. So can I say A does not, company A may, there are no other shareholders only. Who is the only shareholder in A? X. If other shareholders are there, other shareholders should not object. So that objection while well, a point is gone. Okay. A is unlisted. Ultimate parent is preparing as per India. So is A exempted from preparing CFS? Is company A exempted from preparing CFS? Yes. So, whether company A is required to prepare CFS, answer will be no, not required. Second case, same fact, assume X is a foreign entity. Company X is not in India, company X is in foreign. So, can I say they will prepare CFS not as per India because they are abroad. So, now my ultimate parent is not preparing as per India. So, now in that case, is exemption there with A? No. So, now the exemption will not be available. So, they cannot avail exemption. Third case, assuming the fact that scenario A, 100% investment in A is held by individual X rather than company X. So, it is not company X, it is Mr. X. Okay, now Mr. X is an individual. Can I say individual are not covered under Indias? So, can I say again, they will not be preparing CFS. If they will not be preparing CFS, which are as per Indias. So, can I say again, who has to prepare? Company X. So again, can I say the exemption cannot be availed. Shall I move ahead? Yes, no. Thank you. Now, scenario A, company A, they have two subsidiaries, company B, company C. And C has a subsidiary X. Okay, which is the intermediary over here? C. This is an intermediary. This is an intermediary. A to C and C to X. Now, the thing is, in C, how much percent is held by A? 60. So, can I say there are other shareholders, 40 percent? Others should not object. Second, C should be unlisted. 
and third a should be preparing financials which are as per in days three conditions now let's see a is a listed company a and they prepare cfs as per the in days fine c is unlisted that is also fine 40 percent is held by outside investors 40 percent is held by outside investors can i say that 40 percent should not object they've written a does not object a does not object me what we have to see is other 40 percent people should not object okay to so check over here answer company c should inform other 40 percent and if they do not object if they do not object then you can avail exception okay second case the balance 40 percent are with c okay to balance 40 percent 60 percent is with a and 40 percent kiske paas hai not c b 40 percent of c is held by b okay so now 60 percent a holds 40 percent is held by b but can i say b is 100 percent subsidiary of a so can i say indirectly that 40 percent is also held by a so can i say indirectly total 100 percent is held by a if 100 percent is held by a so can i say there are no other shareholders so do we have to ask to anyone objection wala no the objection point will not come so c is not required to inform b because ultimately b is also under the control of a and they can avail exception okay that's it this is over next control uh, control the definition first is given as per as21 as per as21 when do i say it's a control uh, you have directly or indirectly ownership of 51 percent of voting not 51 percent more than 50 percent voting right ownership directly indirectly of more than 50 percent voting power now the question comes over here what do you mean by the word indirectly directly is you hold indirectly is via your subsidiaries indirectly does not include your associates and jv so i hold in jv and jv holds your no 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 it's you hold or through your subsidiaries hold. fine or you control the composition of board of directors now i have a question i hold 40 percent of voting power so can i say i don't fall in a but i have a power to appoint majority of your directors so can i say i'm controlling the composition of b or D. and word written is what or any of them is fulfilled then i have a control if i have a control that can that basically entity is my subsidiary i'm required to prepare cfs Achha, is it possible two entities one entity is a subsidiary of two company i repeat one entity is a subsidiary of two companies there are two two parents is it possible now now suppose a limited holds 60 percent in b a limited holds 60 percent in b and z limited holds 40 percent in b so can i say a holds 60 can i say a has more than voting power but now there's agreement between a and z that majority director in b will be appointed by z so can i say z has composition of board of director so a is fulfilling the first category z is fulfilling second category so b will be regarded as subsidiary of a also b will be regarded as subsidiary of z also so b will be consolidated by a also b will be consolidated by z also this is possible only under as not under indes so both the enterprise need to consolidate now coming to indes under indes the definition is not like this the definition is kind of principle based the investor has a control over investee if and only if all the following are present <clears throat> we already discussed your power over investee you have a right or exposure over variable return and you can use your power to influence return it's a principle based which is to be interpreted based on facts and circumstances what is relative holding of others others are small small people attending board meeting not attending whether they attend board meeting contractual agreement with others i hold 60 but i have an agreement with others that i will not take a decision unilaterally i'll always take your confirmation so then with 60 person also i don't have a control so that all things are to be seen you hold 40 percent does do you have a power over b now maybe may not be if others are small small they don't attend meeting then with 40 person i may have a power okay now potential equity shares uh, what do you mean by potential equity shares options can i say they will convert into equity okay so whether potential equity shares are considered while determining control so i hold 40 percent actually and plus i have a right to buy some shares in future so potential equity shares are to be considered when if if they are currently exercisable 
Now, actually, word is not currently exercisable. If they are exercisable at the time when the relevant decisions are to be made. Now, suppose decisions always are taken where? Decisions are always taken where? Meeting. And remember, meeting ke liye 21 days clear notice. Now, I have some options which are exercisable within 21 days only. So, if at all some decisions are to be taken, meeting is called. Can I say by the time meeting comes, my options would have been exercisable. So, can I say one is they should be exercisable when the relevant decisions are to be taken. And second, they should have economic substance. Suppose you have a right to buy the shares, but the thing is the right to buy the shares is you have to pay five times the market price. Are you going to pay five times the market price? No. So, can I say then that right is worthless. So, then they are not considered. So, potential equity shares are considered when one, they should be exercisable at the time the relevant decisions are to be taken and they should be substantive right. Substantive means it has some economic substance. The holder must have practical ability to exercise the right and if at all exercise price is very high, you are not going to exercise, so they are not regarded as substantive. Okay, now the word was power over investee. You should have a right or exposure to variable return. And third, you can use your power to influence return. Now, what do you mean by power over investee? Power over investee means you have an existing right that gives you ability to direct the relevant activities unilaterally. So, whatever are their activities, you are able to direct the activities unilaterally. Now, power, there can be two things. One is called as a substantive right. Second is called as a protective right. Now, imagine. As such, you can take all decisions. As such, you hold 60%, you are able to take all decisions. But company has also taken a loan from bank. So if you want to take extra loan, you have to take bank's permission. Or if at all, you want to distribute dividend to shareholders, before distributing dividend, you have to take bank's permission. Okay, so now as such, I can take all decisions, sales, purchase, etc., etc., I can do. But few decisions, I cannot take, I have to take the permission of bank okay do i have a control yes because the right which a bank has it's not a substantive right the bank car right is which type of right protective they have given money they want to just safeguard themselves so they have put some condition before you distribute money or before you take new loan take our permission so substantive right gives you control protective right does not give control who is having protective right bank Protective right does not give control to them and protective right does not take away someone's control also. Protective right does not give control to bank. And protective right does not take away someone's control as well. The substantive right gives power. Protective right do not give power. Substantive right relate to the relevant activity. Protective right are just to protect. So, right to be substantive, there is a practical ability to exercise. There are some barriers. Many times you might not be able to exercise the right if there is a high exercise price or something like that TJ. for a right to be substantive it should be exercisable when exercisable when the decisions are to be made. my right is not exercisable today but yeah decision is also not to be done today if any decision is to be taken can i say minimum 21 days notice and in 21 days my right is exercisable then i say my right is substantive provided there are no other problems like if exercise price is too high then again it is not substantive Okay, protective right is fine. Now, franchisee. Now, whenever you take a franchisee, you know, the franchisee owner means the one who has given you the franchisee. They want that you should have a kind of similar interior in all the shops. They want the employees to wear a t-shirt with a logo. <laughs> so, the point is... <laughs> the point is, like, the franchisee main who is the owner of that franchisee that person is making it mandatory for that the one who took the franchisee to follow certain things so is it like that guy is controlling that franchisee no they are again which type of right protective so that brand owner that brand owner wants to protect the brand they want a certain level of <laughs> things which are to be maintained which is to be done and based on that basically they put some rules and regulation but uh, that is only to protect their brand Business is run by the one who has taken the franchisee, how to sell, whom to sell, etc, etc. Money comes, doesn't come. That is all their risk. And that's why this is just which right? Protected. TK, check. ABC is a branded garments, brand X. PQR has taken a franchisee of brand X. 
And now PQR will be selling brand X. But can I say PQR has to have uh, PQR will set up a retail outlet, own fund, decide capital structure, hire employees, remuneration, etc. But there are some SOPs given like interior, uniform, other guidelines, etc. So it doesn't mean that ABC is having a control over that unit. Who is having a control is only PQ. Uh, ABC has certain rights which are just a protective right. <clears throat> Exposure or right to find link between return is also fine. Okay. Now, uh, when person, chalega? Nee, exposure has to be proper exposure. Now, what is a proper exposure? Is they say at least twenty percent. How much is proper exposure? At least twenty percent. Now, what happens is there is a fund. In a fund, mutual fund is there. Now, mutual fund ke under we all people have given money to mutual fund. Now, mutual fund people appoints manager who will manage that funds actually fund manager or we call it as AMC something like that so they appoint a manager now who is taking all decisions what to buy what to sell manager manager okay so now question arises whether whether the fund manager has a control over the fund he has a power but second option is what he should have a exposure or right over variable return if that fund manager is getting only the fixed salary can I say exposure is not there or is getting fixed salary plus profit ka 5% or profit ka 10% still exposure is not there. What should be the relevant exposure? 20. Huh? But now tell me that fund manager has also put the money in fund. But he has put 1% money in fund. That is also not okay. He should hold at least how much fund? 20%. So exposure has to be a relevant exposure that is around 20%. Check. There is a fund manager. Now, the fund manager has made 10% pro rata investment in fund. Okay, if it is a 10% pro rata investment, does he have a sufficient exposure to variable returns? No. So, pay, he will be treated as an agent. He does not control the fund. Minimum 20% should be there, right? Next question. If you see over here, again, there is a fund manager. Uh, he takes all the decisions. Fine. He receives a market-based fee and 20% of fund's profit if specified profit is achieved. And this is commensurate with service. Now, can I say this agreement, like if at all you achieve more than this much, extra my 20% yours, can I say that agreement I have with my employees also? I have many times the employee go bowling, if you achieve target, upar jo achieve kiya, 20% profit belongs to you, 20% commission in that. Normally 5% commission, target upar, 20% commission. So that doesn't make him a principal. Still is a employee, still is a agent. But huh, he has... He has the fund ke and the shares. He holds the unit of the fund. But how many units he should hold at least? 20%. Yaha pe 20% of profit is getting if profit exceeds certain level. That doesn't make him a principal. Fine. The fund manager is paid fixed and performance related fees which are as per the services. The remuneration basically is 9 to the we are required to determine. Fund manager also has 2% investment in fund. No. He is agent. Fund manager is more substantial pro rata investment, more substantial, assuming it is 20% or more, then I can say he is a principal. And third wala case, achha, isme I just take one more thing. Investors can remove the fund manager by majority vote, but only on bridge. Okay, investors can remove the fund manager. If investors can remove the fund manager anytime, then the right is which type? Substantial. But if they can remove only on bridge, the right is protective. Protective right doesn't take away someone's control. So in your case B, he does not control, no control because he holds only two persons. Second case, he controls, he controls. Others have a protective right. Others having a protective right. Does it take away control from him? No. So here he has a control. Third case, he holds 20%. He holds 20%. Now, the fund has a board of directors and the board of directors, they appoint the fund manager annually. And if they do not review you, they do not renew you, you are gone. So, can I say they can remove you whenever they want? So, can I say now in this case, the other people are having substantive right to remove me, then there is no control. Are you clear? Okay, next. Now, control over specified asset. Now, this is only for mutual funds. What is this control over specified asset? You might have seen under mutual fund, there are so many different types of scheme. 
वन म्यूचुअल फंड दे हैव डेट स्कीम दे हैव इक्विटी स्कीम दे हैव बेसिकली स्कीम विच इन्वेस्ट ओनली इन बैंक कंपनी स्कीम विच इन्वेस्ट ओनली इन आई टी कंपनी तो डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ बेसिकली द फंड आर क्रिएटेड तो अंडर वन म्यूचुअल फंड डिफरेंट स्कीम आते हैं टोटल में इफ आई इन्वेस्ट इन अ डेट स्कीम तो दे विल इन्वेस्ट माई मनी ओनली इन डेट इफ आई इन्वेस्ट इन इक्विटी स्कीम दे विल इन्वेस्ट ओनली माई मनी इन इक्विटी इफ आई इन्वेस्ट इन अ बैलेंस स्कीम दे विल इन्वेस्ट इन बोथ नो क्वेश्चन इफ आई चूज अ डेट स्कीम दे पुट माई मनी इन डेट स्कीम डेट स्कीम डिड वेल बट इक्विटी स्कीम डिड नॉट डू वेल कैन दे टेक अवे माई मनी एंड गिव इट टू दैट इक्विटी स्कीम पीपल तो कैन आई से दैट दैट्स वन एंटिटी बट वन एंटिटी में देर आर टू थ्री पार्ट and every part is such that asset and liability of that part is only the asset and liability of that part which cannot be used by anyone else so then that part can be treated as a separate business wo ek part ko kya bolenge separate business so it is possible that that part is controlled by someone other part is controlled by someone else you consolidate only that part so the word written is control over specified asset that's only a part they call it as silo silo is slice or a piece the investor treats a portion of investee portion part as a deemed separate entity if all the following are met so when can i treat that as a deemed separate entity the specified asset of investee are the only source of payment of liability of that investee parties other than with the specified they do not have a right or obligation to the specified asset so debt wale asset can i say equity people cannot use it equity wale asset debt people cannot use it and his returns are only the return to them they cannot be paid to anyone else so in substance all assets liability equity of the deemed separate entity are ring fenced only for that part For example, investee is a mutual fund. There are multiple sub funds: debt-oriented fund, equity-oriented fund. So I have to see if I have invested only in debt fund. Debt fund's money is only theirs. Unka asset, unka liability is only theirs. If someone controls debt fund, that guy will consolidate only debt fund ke assets liabilities, not the entire mutual fund. So वहाँ पे the part of the entity is treated also as a business. Did you understood? Next. they are told that investment entities are exempted provided the investment entities are valuing the subsidiaries investment in subsidiary at fair value through pl what is a investment entity for investment entity first we have to check three conditions first we have to check three and all three has to be fulfilled what are all three one see if i invest my money i am not investment firm i repeat if i am investing my money i am not investment firm but uh, if i take funds from you and i manage your funds then i am a investment firm to so see you obtain funds from one or more investor you commit to investor okay you gave me money i'll give you return in form of capital gain dividends kind of that way theek hai to investor commits matlab you commit to investor the returns which are solely by capital appreciation investment income or do i commit you any other benefits i commit you capital appreciation investment income or both and you measure and performs the matlab whatever investments i have done i'll show that investments at which value fair value these are the three condition if the three conditions are fulfilled then you go to characteristic if three condition may say any of them not fulfilled if three condition may say any of them not fulfilled i am not a investment firm now i'm just taking again the point 2 one i have taken money from you second i have told you that return will be solely in form of capital gains or investment income now imagine you gave me money i invested somewhere now if that guy i invested somewhere if they come out with a new technology you will all get a benefit of that technology okay so can i say now you are getting some other benefit then in that case i am not a investment did you understood so imagine a limited gave money to me a limited gave me a huge money now i invested somewhere and now that is a research company whatever research of there become successful it will go to a so can i say that a is getting some extra benefit then they are not then i am not a invest because investment company gives solely the returns by way of capital appreciation or investment income theek okay. hai first three conditions now coming to characteristic which are the characteristic one i have done more than one investments 
I have more than one investors, people who has invested to me, then I have done more than one investment. Investors are not the related party. And fourth, fourth, you gave me money. What will I give you? I'll give you my equity shares or I'll give you units. If I'm a mutual fund, you give me money. What I give you is units. So that is basically equity, or the entity has an ownership interest in form of equity or similar interest. Achha, now, this four characteristic need not always be present. Like suppose I started managing people's money. Till now, there is one or two people only who has given me money. Do I have more than one investor? If only one person has given me money till now, I don't have more than one investor. But can I say I just started more than one investor as well? Come up, to chalega. Same way, I got money. I have currently invested only in one company, but I am going to invest in other companies. Okay, today two people gave me money, but two people are my relatives only because they know me, they trust me. So today my investors are what related, but I am trying. I am trying to get funds from non-related parties also. So then in that case, still based on substance over form, still I will be regarded as investment company. So, three conditions are mandatory. Characteristics are not all four characteristics present. You are investment company. One of the characteristics or two of the characteristics are not present. Then you see substance over legal. Next, investment company always has some exit strategy. If exit strategy is not there, then you are not said to be investment company. But if one investment company invest in other investment company, one investment company invest in other investment company, then in that case you might, then you don't need an exit strategy because that investment company will already have an exit strategy. When they exit, automatically your money will come back. So that is basically given. Earnings, we already, other benefits are there. It is not to be counted. Now check over here. HTF was formed by T to invest in startup companies. Okay, so there is a T limited, T formed HTF. HTF will do invest in so many companies. HTF will do investment in so many companies. Okay. Now, the other 30%, this is 70% T holds in HTF, 30% is held by someone else. Now, T holds option to acquire investment of HTF. Okay. So, HTF did investment. The investment can be acquired by T. If that company where HTF has invested, they do some good research or something like that. So, can I say that T is having an option to get some other benefit? If T is having option to get some other benefit, so I am committing in basically returns which are other than capital appreciation and investment income. The question whether HTF is an investment entity, answer is no. This provides a benefit in addition to capital appreciation and plus the question is also written, they do not have an exit strategy. No plan of existing the investment. Investment entity should have a exit plans. Now, exemption to investment entity, they are exempted provided they measure all their subsidiaries at fair value through TM. Achha, exemption is given to investment entity, not to the parent of investment entity. I repeat, exemption is given to investment, not to the parent. Like suppose in this case, HTF was investment entity, who is the parent of HTF? T. So, HTF is given exemption, T is not given. Okay, so check over here, parent of investment entity. They will consolidate everything. Investment entity, they are not required to prepare basically CFS provided they are showing their investment in subsidiary at which value? Fair value through PNL. But I tell you one thing over here. Uh, investment entity has invested. They have a subsidiary. Now, subsidiary is such which is basically related to their business. Like I tell you, if I do investments, can I say before doing investment, I have to do research? Without research, I invest nahi karunga. So, I have to do research. For doing a research, I acquired a subsidiary. So, can I say that subsidiary is related to my business? So, that subsidiary has to be consolidated. That is not accepted. If investment entity acquires a subsidiary, but the subsidiary is a kind of extension of carrying out their business only. Where extension here carrying out the business, then that subsidiaries are to be consolidated. Clear? Okay, check over here. This question, there is a PQR non-investment company. They hold 100% in XYZ investment. Now, XYZ is having two subsidiaries, 100% wale. This is a non-investment for carrying on the services related to investment activity. And this is just a normal investment. Okay, the investment company is whom? 
X, Y, Z. Now, investment company gets an exemption. Ultimate parent PQR, do they have any exemption? No, the PQR has to prepare CFS, consolidating everyone. PQR has to consolidate everyone. PQR has to prepare CFS. Did you understood? Now, coming to XYZ, whether XYZ is exempted? Now, two things. If you say XYZ is an investment entity, the investment entities are exempted provided they carry the subsidiaries at fair value through PL. But if there is a subsidiary which is just an extension of carrying on the business only, that subsidiary is still to be Okay, so which one is still to be consolidated? A limited will still be consolidated. If, if basically XYZ says I am an investment company, they will consolidate A and they will measure B at FPTP. But there is one more option. What is one more option? XYZ can take an exemption not of investment company. XYZ can take an exemption of intermediate subsidiary. Remember intermediate. If they take intermediate subsidiary, then they don't have to prepare CFS at all. If they are taking exemption for investment company, they will consolidate A, B will be exempted. But if they take exemption of intermediate subsidiary, then they don't have to prepare CFS at all. So over here, there is one more option. Since the ultimate parent is preparing, they are eligible for exemption from preparing because PQR is preparing which are as per NDS. Now, this is important change in status from investment to non-investment or non-investment to investment. Okay. First one is when you cease to be investment company. Okay. If you are an investment company, can I say exemption was given to you? Now you cease to be investment company. Can I say now you have to? Now I have to consolidate. Okay. Now I have to consolidate. So what will happen? Assets comes in, liability comes in. Asset comes in, liability comes in. And investment, what is there in my books, that will go away. Asset comes in, liability comes in, NCI comes in, investment goes away, difference is goodwill or capital. So, fair value of subsidiary at the deemed acquisition date. Okay, so the thing is, if suppose you are changing the status today, today is which date? 15th October. Now, you would be fair valuing nor normally every year end. If investment entity carries subsidiary at FET PNL, they will be fair valuing when? Every year end. But date of change of status, again you have to do a fair valuation. So can I say now your investment will appear at today's value. Now investment appears at today's value. Now you have to consolidate. So what will happen? Asset comes in, liability comes in, NCI comes in. Your investment goes up. And the difference will be profit or loss. But can I say I have to take which value? Today's fair value. Okay. Check. A cease to be investment company from 1st April. Okay, you are holding 80% of B. The carrying amount of investment is 4 lakh. <laughs> carrying amount of investment is 4 lakh. And the fair value of NCI on the date of change is 1 lakh. The fair value of identifiable net asset on the date of change is 450. Okay, so can I say now net assets 450 will come in? Net assets 450 will come in. Okay, plus NCI comes in is credited and my investment goes away. What is the value of investment today? This 1st April only. So yesterday only it is remeasured. 4 lakh. Okay. So investment 4 lakh goes away. Investment 4 lakh goes away. It will be credit. Okay. Net assets coming in. 450. NCI coming in. Credit. Difference is good. Did you understood? Simple words is investment will be remeasured as per today and then the investment goes out assets and liabilities comes in difference goes in good shall i go ahead next if you become an investment entity oh if you become an investment entity what happened earlier you had consolidated if earlier you had consolidated can i say you were having assets of subsidiary liabilities of subsidiary nci goodwill capitalism whatever all the things you were having now you don't have to consolidate to remove all of it remove all of it and what will come in investment investment will come in at today's fair value investment will come in at today's fair value. difference is profit or loss which will go in pnl its difference is profit or loss which will go in pnl check you cease to consolidate you cease to consolidate and you have to apply the concept of loss of control. It's like in subsidiary is sold off. When you sell off a subsidiary, assets goes away, liability goes away, NCI goes away, goodwill capital is a 
goes away. Now, what is coming in? Investment. Which value investment comes in? Today's fair value. Difference is profit or loss. Which goes in? PL. Okay. So, you had 100% subsidiary acquired for 20 lakh. Net assets are 16 lakh. Goodwill is 4 lakh. It becomes an investment entity on March 03. And now, now the fair value investment ka is 25. So, can I say 25 investment comes in? Okay. On the date of change in status, the net asset excluding goodwill are 19. So, net asset we have is 19 today. Goodwill, how much we have? 4. So, 23. Net asset other than goodwill, 19 goes away, goodwill 4 goes away, NCI is nil because it was 100%. So, 29, uh, 19 plus 4, 23 net asset goes away, investment comes in 25, 2 rupees gain which will come in your PL. Then come to next unit, unit number 4. Okay, now unit number 4, see last unit we just understood who is required to prepare CFS, whether we have a control or not, if it's an investment entity they are exempted, that all we learned. We did not understood how to consolidate. This is basically how do we consolidate, take it. So consolidation, just one minute, I need to check whether this online stream is working or not. <laughs> Is the live online stream working? Okay, now coming to unit number four, how do we consolidate? This is consolidation of subsidiaries. Now, consolidation process, consolidation starts from the day we obtain control and consolidation will be there till the date we cease to have a control. Now, suppose the control goes away today. If control goes away today, that is on 15th October, whether in 22, 23, current year is 22, 23, do we have to prepare CFS? This year control went away. Do we have to prepare CFS? Yes. Okay. March 23 balance sheet. We don't have a subsidiary assets, etc. will not come. But can I say till today, unka as, uh, sales, purchase, expense, income, profit will come. So you are required to prepare CFS till the date you cease to have control. Now, how do I prepare a consolidated balance sheet? How do I prepare a consolidated balance sheet? Now, consolidated balance sheet is basically one item by item basis. To the assets of parent, the assets of subsidiary are added. To the liabilities of parent, the liabilities of subsidiary are added. Take it. It's item by item basis. Okay. Even though I am holding 80% of the investments can i say what will happen is 100 percent assets and liabilities will come in assets and liabilities of subsidiary comes in what goes out investment in your sfs in your sfs you have an investment in subsidy that investment goes out assets and liabilities of subsidiaries are coming in even though you are holding 80 percent how much assets and liabilities will come in 100 percent opposite we are required to show nci fine this is done nci can be at two ways either at proportionate net asset or it can be at fair value of nci if NCI is at proportionate net asset, net asset of NCI is 20, we show them also at 20. But if they are at fair value, net asset of NCI is 20, but we show them at 25. So in this case, the goodwill capital reserve will be of our share also, NCI share also. But if it, they are there at proportionate net asset, the goodwill is only related to our share. That's fine. Uh, now, investment goes out, net asset comes in. But can I say investment is nothing but what we had paid? 
we might have paid more or less. So we need to calculate goodwill or capital. So the goodwill or capital is how do we calculate? It's consideration by acquirer that's ours say 80% and NCI which is 20% and now compare with 100% assets and liabilities difference is goodwill or capital. Okay, now there's a question. We acquired 80% for 90,000. We acquired 80% for 90,000. In your SFS, can I say investment is 90? While preparing CFS, CFS is always prepared from SFS. There's no separate books of accounts of CFS. I repeat, there's no separate books of accounts of CFS. It is prepared from SFS of parent, SFS of subsidiary. From there, we prepare CFS. Fine. So, what will happen from your SFS of parent, the investment 90 goes away. Okay. Now, what is the net asset of theirs? 1 lakh. 1 lakh net asset is coming in. So, asset side, 90 investment goes away. 1 lakh net asset comes in. But out of 1 lakh net asset, can I say 20 belongs to NCI? And difference is good. Now, just tell me, NCI is at proportional net asset. So, can I say goodwill is not related to them? They are at proportional net asset. Asset side, 20 for them. Liability, we put them as 20. Now, our share of asset was 80, but I paid. Our share of asset was 80. 1 lakh ka... 80%. Our share of net asset was 80, but we paid 90. That's why there's a 10. Good. Let's see, goodwill is only related to our share. Are you clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, this is on DOA. This is on which date? Date of acquisition. Date of acquisition, investment goes away. Net asset comes in. Even though we hold 80%, we included 100% net asset. Opposite comes what? NCI and difference went in. Good. This is on date of acquisition. Now, suppose on date of acquisition, this was the situation. Now, after one year, can I say subsidiary ka asset would have increased? Assets, liabilities, subsidiary's net asset increased. Now, why does net asset increases? Due to post acquisition profit or if net asset has gone down, it's due to post acquisition loss. Now, after one year, net asset of subsidiary is not 1 lakh. Net asset of subsidiary is 150. After one year, net asset of subsidiary is not 1 lakh. Net asset is so now when I'm consolidating, after one year when I'm consolidating, I'll include a net asset, not 1 lakh. I'll include a net asset, 150. So can I say extra 50 net asset I've included? Now extra 50 net asset, subsidiary net asset went up by 50 is nothing but their post acquisition profit. Now subsidiary is post profit. 80% belongs to me, 20% belongs to NCI. 20% belongs to NCI, I add it in NCI. So NCI was 20 on DOA plus the share in post profit, 50,000 ka 20%. 10 add and my share of profit I'll add it in my PNL. See, once you took over, once you acquired, can I say now their sales, purchase, expense, income will come in your consolidated PNL? So in your consolidated PNL, the post profit 50 comes. 50 may say 10 you gave it to NCL. 40 will continue in your profits. So it will go in your retained earnings. So now in your reserve surplus, the share in post profit is coming. Share in which profit is coming? Post profit. Everything else is remaining same. Goodwill is not changing. But afterwards, their net asset from 1 lakh became 150. So today when I am consolidating, I am adding 150. Okay. Now out of 1 lakh, 80 was basically my share of net asset. Against that investment was 90. So 80 net asset, 90 investment went, 10 goodwill may was adjust. 20 net asset was related to NCI on DOA. Now, extra 50 net asset met, 10 belongs to NCI. 40 is the post acquisition profit relating to ours. Our post profit will come in our CFS. Okay, so simple words. Simple words. What happens over here is post acquisition profits of subsidiary, post acquisition profit related to NCI goes in. NCI related to us will appear in our consolidated financial state. So, after I acquired, I'll have the sales, purchase, expense, income. So, automatically profit comes in consolidated PNL. 50 came. Usme se 10 went to NCI and 40 will take it in our retained earnings. Okay. So, do we include, do we include the reserves of subsidiary in our books? No. Only which profit? Post profit relating to our share. That is included. But whatever reserves they had on DOA, that is not taken. Okay, so when I am preparing a consolidated balance sheet, capital is only of parent, reserve surplus is parent, plus subsidiary may post acquisition our share, only which 
post acquisition our share nci will appear if at all our holding is less than 100% liability parent plus subsidiary assets parent plus subsidiary investment will go out and goodwill and capital reserve will come in okay now come to question number 1 over here raja limited Uh, 60 percent shares are acquired by 25 lakh and total number of shares are 1 lakh so can I say acquired 60, 60 lakh shares 60,000 shares fair value of identifiable asset is 640 liability is 50 okay identifiable asset 640 liability 50 what is the net assets 590 okay 590 is net asset and market price per share of RAM is 775 find out what goodwill Okay, did they tell you NCI is at fair value, NCI is at proportional net asset? No. But now, can I find NCI at fair value? Yes, reason. I hold 60,000 share. They hold? They hold 40,000. And what is the share price going on? So, I can find NCI at fair value. Question is silent. We'll solve by both ways. So, if NCI is at fair value, what I have paid is 525. This is how many percentage? 60. For 40 percent, NCI at fair value. NCI at fair value is 40,000 shares into... 775 40,000 shares into 775 310 so this becomes 100 percent compare it with 100 percent net asset 100 percent net asset is 590 this is your good okay if nci is a proportional net asset so total net assets are 590 do 590 into 40 percent so what is 590 to 40 percent 236 so our basically is 525 this is 60 percent 40 percent nci is 236 and total net assets are 590 goodwill is coming 171 so here when nci is at proportional net asset goodwill is only related to our share but when nci is at fair value the goodwill is related to our share as well as nci share next steps to prepare a consolidated balance sheet we have the steps four steps are there this will be the four working notes which we always have in our material, we always used to have this four working notes. There can be extra, but these are the minimum four working notes. First, we do analysis of reserves and surplus of subsidiary into pre and post. Second, we used to calculate the NCI on the date of acquisition as well as the date of consolidation. Third, we calculate goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. Fourth, we prepare a consolidated reserves and surplus. And then we used to prepare a consolidated balance sheet. The first four steps are the four working notes. And fifth one is basically our batch okay now this is question given we have an equation when middle of the year okay step number one what's the step number one analysis of reserves and surplus of subsidiary into pre and post okay so now just see these are the reserves of subsidiary which is given yeah both but these are the closing this is balance sheet at december we acquired on one seven so pre and post opening are given to us one one lakh opening is pre now, 1 lakh become 4 lakh. Can I say 3 is increase? Half year is pre, half year is post because we acquired on 1st of July. And it's a calendar year. If you see, it's a December wala year. So, opening 1 is pre, 1 becoming 4, 3 increase. 3 may half pre, increase basically is 3. This is half pre, half post. PNL may opening 1 is pre and increase may half pre and half post. Did you understood this? Okay, we got the total. Now, whatever is the total reserves of subsidiary, can I say it belongs to me as well as minority? So ours is 70%, NCI is 30%. Ours pre, minority pre. Ours post, minority post. Now, our share post. Now, if you remember, our share of pre will be used to find goodwill capitalism. But our share of post profit is included in our profits. Now, when I say it's included in our profit, if they have in PNL, I'll include my share in PNL. If they have in general reserve, I have to include my share in general result. So our share post is to be further bifurcated. Our share, sirf our share ka post, not everyone. Our share post is to be further bifurcated. Now, our share post is 2.8. Our share post is 2.8. 70% right out of 4. Now, what was post PNL? Post PNL is 1.5. So, can I say our share post PNL will be 1.5 into 70%? So, can, that is coming 1.5 into 70% is 1.5. 0, 05. Our share post PNL and our share post general reserve 2.5 into 70%. So that is coming 
0.75. Our total post is bifurcated into general reserve and PA. Now coming to second working group, that is your NCI. Now, if NCI is a proportionate net asset, proportionate net asset, how do we calculate? We don't have asset minus liability on DOA. First July was DOA. Do I have assets and liabilities of first July? No. So there's another way of finding net asset. What is the another way of finding net asset? Capital plus reserves. Now I have capital of that day, I have reserves of that day. Okay, capital has not changed. So whatever is capital given today, capital on that day was also same. Okay, the capital of subsidiary, check the question, capital of subsidiary is 10. What is NCI ka share? 30%, so 3 rupees is proportionate capital. And now reserves, what is the pre-reserves belonging to NCI? 1.8, so this is basically the minority interest on or NCI on TO. Uh, plus, now you add their share in post. If I add their share in post, it becomes NCI on DOC. Achha, in your balance sheet, which one will come? DOA bal uh, NCI will come or DOC will come? DOC will come. But our DOA will be used to find goodwill or capital. Because goodwill capitalism is found out on date of acquisition. Okay, now in the balance sheet, you will find your investments. Investments appearing at 9. So, this is 9. NCI on DOA I need. 4.8. Eight. So, this is your share 70 percent, this is 30 percent and I need net assets on DOA. Okay, how do I get net assets on DOA? Total 100 percent. So, capital on DOA and total of pre-reserves. Okay, capital on DOA is 10 and pre-reserves ka total is 6. Can I say it became 10 plus 6 is 16. This is your goodwill or capital. Now, coming to consolidated reserves and surplus. Consolidated reserves and surplus may your reserve surplus plus which reserves and surplus post coming from subsidiary post coming from subsidiary is post pnl and post general reserve so this is already yours plus share in post of b is coming from there this is your reserves and surplus which will come in balance sheet and now you can just prepare the balance sheet assets are total assets are total liability may capital only parent other equity may be already prepared the consolidated reserves and surplus. In that, one more we have to add is capital reserve. So, if you see here, this two was 6.5, 8.75 and this is capital reserve is 2.2. That three total you will do, you will get the other equity. NCI is coming up on date of consolidation one. Liabilities are just the total. This is how we prepare our consolidated balance sheet. Step number one, analysis of reserves and surplus of subsidiary. Step number two. NCI calculation. Step number three, goodwill capital reserve. Step four, consolidated reserves and surplus. And last is consolidated balance sheet. Okay, now same question. If they say that NCI should be at fair value, if NCI should be at fair value, can I say fair value is always on DOA? It's not to be fair value every time. And they've given the fair value on 17 is 6 lakh. 31st December fair value is of no use. Okay, so what is the fair value on DOA? 6 lakh. So earlier, how did I found DOA? Earlier, how did I found DOA? Proportionate capital plus their pre-reserves. Now, don't do that. Proportionate capital and their pre-reserves, don't do. Uske badle directly take 6. 6. DOA ko, it is 6. And then I have to add their post-profit, which is 1.2. Now, now, it will become 7.2. Now, earlier pre was 4.8. Now, pre became 6. So, can I say NCI increased by 1.2? Opposite 1.2, what would have increased? Goodwill. Okay, if I just go down here, you will see it comes basically this is 6 and then post their share added total becomes 7.2. If this becomes 6, automatically your goodwill will increase by 1 point, sorry, uh, NCI has increased. So, can I say net asset, uh, we have a NCI, goodwill will go up or capital reserve will go down. So, capital reserve was 2.2, 1.2 goes down, it becomes any doubts? Okay, now come to fair valuation of assets and liabilities. Fair valuation of assets and liabilities. Now pay attention. See, uh, whenever we acquire control, the assets and liabilities coming in are of which date? Acquisition date fair value. Acquisition date, fair value. So, can I say I need to take that acquisition date, fair value, and net assets? 
when I'm finding goodwill capital reserve, that net assets are to be taken. But the problem is, I don't have assets and liabilities ka detail available of that day. So I am not finding net assets by asset minus liability. I am finding net assets how? Capital plus reserve. Now, when I take capital plus reserve, this is the book value. If asset has gone up, I have to add it in my pre column. If asset has gone down, I have to deduct from my pre column. Liability has gone up, I have to deduct from my pre column. Liability has gone up, I need to, sorry, liability has gone down, I need to add it to my pre column. Reason why pre column? Because it impacts the net asset on the date of acquisition. So, whenever there is a fair valuation done, we are finding net assets by equity plus reserve. When I take equity plus reserves, it is book value. If assets have changed, so that thing also has to change. So, increase, decrease in assets and liabilities, I need to take it in my working note number 1. Increase, decrease, I have to take it in my working note. What? Asset going up, I add it in pre. Asset going down, I deduct in pre. Increase in liability, deduct in pre. Decrease in liability, add it in. Did you understood this? Now, why I am doing it in pre reason is I want to change the net asset on the date of acquisition. That's why the effect is taken in pre. Now, suppose if it's a depreciable asset. Suppose if it's a depreciable asset. So, what happens is when I'm taking capital plus reserves, I'm taking capital and reserves of subsidiary from their SFS. If I'm taking from their SFS, can I say it's all based on their book value? Now, in CFS, if I change the value, if asset ka value is changed, so can I say depreciation should also change? Now, asset value is changed on the date of acquisition. On DOA, we change. So, can I say depreciation comes after that? So, in CFS, asset increased. So, can I say in CFS, the depreciation should also increase? If depreciation increases, so can I say profit will go down? But that additional depreciation impact will come only in post period. Okay, so check over here if there is a depreciable asset. The depreciation in CFS will be different from SFS. If there is an increase in depreciable asset, we have to have an additional depreciation which will come in post working note 1. If the asset has gone down, can I say there will be a reversal of depreciation which will be also coming in post. Okay, so increase decrease effect comes in pre column. Because of that, additional depreciation or reversal of depreciation that will come in post column. Increase decrease happened on DOA. Depreciation will change after that. That's why it comes in post. Okay. Plus impact will come up. So deferred tax impact will come. If asset has increased, assets have increased, the profit is there, tax will be there in future. DTL. Asset goes up, DTL. Asset goes down, DTA. Liability goes up, DTA. Liability goes down, DTL. Did you understood this? So that impact is also to be given. Plus one more thing, because of because of additional depreciation, increased asset, you increase the asset, DTL was created. Now you give more depreciation, that much DTL will get reversed. You reduced asset, you reduced asset, DTA was created. But now you reverse depreciation, that much DTA will get reversed. So because of that additional depreciation or reversal of depreciation, the DTA, DTL which was created is getting bit reversed. Okay, if tax rate is not given, do not take the deferred tax impact, you ignore it, no need to assume tax rate, ignore the deferred tax impact. If question says, then only you take it. Now, mutual indebtedness, mutual indebtedness is coming on which date? It's always on the date of consolidation. On the date of consolidation, if a subsidiary has an amount payable to or receivable from parent, so that becomes a kind of mutual indebtedness. Now, if I say subsidiary has to pay to parent or parent has to pay to subsidiary, group ke liye, can I say I have to pay to myself? So, when I am preparing CFS, it's not of parent, it's not of subsidiary, it's of the group. I cannot say I have to receive from myself, so that needs to be eliminated. So, parent ka liability or asset and opposite subsidiaries liability or asset that will get knocked off. Now the thing is mutual indebtedness does not affect any of your working note. Mutual indebtedness will directly affect your consolidated balance sheet. We just have to remove that asset. We just have to remove that liability. But uh, when it is mutual, when it is payable to us within the group. Now imagine there is a bill receivable, bills payable. 
पेरेंट रेज बिल ऑन सब्सिडरी सब्सिडरी एक्सेप्टेड तो पेरेंट का बिल रिसीवेबल सब्सिडरी बिल पेबल ना पेरेंट डिस्काउंटेड इट विद बैंक ए पेरेंट डिस्काउंटेड इट विद बैंक तो कैन आई से नाउ पेरेंट डजंट हैव दैट बीआर now is it a mutual indebtedness no reason now the subsidiary does not have to pay to parent now the subsidiary has to pay to bank so now it's not payable within now it's payable outside the group okay now unrealized profit in stock what is this unrealized profit in stock imagine parent has sold goods to subsidiary or subsidiary has sold goods to parent at profit at profit and the goods remain unsold at year end when parent sold to parent would have book profit if subsidiary sold can i say subsidiary would have book profit so in sfs profit is already there but for a group as a whole can i say goods are still within us the so goods are sold at profit and the goods remain unsold at year end with the other party other party ke paas the goods are remaining unsold the so group as a whole the goods are with us only if goods are with us only the profit which has been recognized is said to be unrealized now how do i eliminate the unrealized profit okay if parent sold it So can I say profit is there in parents' book? But if subsidiary sold it, profit is there in okay. If parents sold it, I have to remove from parents' profit and I have to remove from stock. Okay, parents' profit is coming in working note four. So working note four consolidated reserves and surplus. We start with parents' profit and then we add our share in post profit of subsidiary. That we do. So if parent made a profit, remove from parents' profit and opposite to remove from stock. So working note four and balance sheet stock. But if subsidiary sold it, subsidiary's profit we take it in working note. Okay, which profit of subsidiary have to remove post? Which profit have to remove post? Reason is unrealized profit is known on which date? Last date on the date of consolidation. Last date it is known. So I cannot change goodwill which was recorded on date of acquisition. So it has to be done today. So we will always eliminate it from the post profit of subsidiary, and subsidiary's profit goes down automatically. Subsidiary's profit is shared by whom? You also, minority also. If it goes down automatically, your share, minority share, will go. The simple words: if it is sold by parent, remove from working note number four. Opposite, remove from stock. If it is sold by subsidiary, remove from working note one post column, and opposite, remove from stock. This is basically how we do it. Now, journal entry. If journal entry is there, journal entry is basically not like this. Ye working may it become simpler. But if question asks journal entry of removal, if journal entry is asked, what will happen is can I say sales is also there? One party sold it, and profit is to be eliminated, right? Stock may say it is to be removed. Stock may say profit is removed. So can I understand stock is to be credited? Now profit is to be eliminated. How do I eliminate profit? Is you do one thing. You remove sales. You remove cost of sales. So revenue removed, cost of sales removed. Net what is removed is profit. Okay. So check the question. Parent A owns sixty percent. Subsidiary sells inventory to parent. Subsidiary sold inventory to parent for how much rupees? Thirty-five. Makes a profit of fifty. Now can I say it's there in CFS? Subsidiary sold it. It's there in the sales of subsidiary. If it is there in the sales of subsidiary, can I say subsidiary sale is also there in when I am preparing a consolidated P and L? It's my sales plus their sales. So sales me thirty five came. It's a mutual sales. So I'll remove it. And a cost of goods sold me. It is basically how much is the cost? Twenty thousand. So cost me say it's removed. Twenty sold it. Subsidiary. So can I say it is a subsidiary's profit? When subsidiary's profit is there, it will be allocated in sixty forty. But if parent sold it, journal entry same. If parent sold it, journal entry is same. But allocation into sixty forty will not be there. Hundred percent, it has to be deducted from parent. Yeah, the in CFS when I prepare a consolidated P and L, we have parent plus subsidiary. Then total profit comes. Then we allocate profit attributable to parent, profit attributable to NCS. So if unrealized profit was of subsidiary, it's automatically allocated to both. If unrealized profit is only of parent, it's allocated only to parent. Wow. Same question. They have just given another. Basically, parent sold it. Parent makes a sale. The journal entry is same, but if you see, here, it's entirely allocated to parent. Okay. One more thing. Uh, if there is an unrealized profit, so can I say in CFS the stock went down? SFS में stock is not down. Okay. 
A limited sold to B limited. So can I say for SFS, A has made a profit. B will have a stock of 120 only. CFS maybe are making a stock again. How much? 100. The stock went down. Actually, the stock is up. So what will happen is again a deferred tax impact will come. So in your CFS, you have reduced the stock. Asset has gone down. But the loss, they are not allowing it today. Thing is, when asset goes down, we are required to create a DT. A for it, but only if tax rate is given. So if you just see next question, they have given a tax rate thirty percent. So goods costing two hundred were sold at two forty lakh. Fifty percent are lying. Okay, so total profit was forty. Is the unrealized profit forty? No. Fifty percent is lying. So can I say unrealized profit is twenty? So I'll eliminate unrealized profit of twenty. So if you see reduced consolidated profit by twenty, but now on that twenty stock is also reduced. 20 ka 30 percent will be DTA created. 20 is 30 percent is 6 rupee. We are required to create a DT. And when I create DTA, entry will be DTA debit to PL. DTA debit to PL. Yes, please. See, when I'm preparing a consolidated PL, what will happen is it's there in my sales, it's there in your purchase. So it will be eliminated from both the places. Practically, what happens is it is not like this. Practically, it goes in increase, decrease in stock, changes in inventory. The stock went down. So can I say increase, decrease in stock will also change? Pele stock was basically increased by 20. If you reduce the stock by 20, so automatically increase, decrease in inventory will change so practically it will come over there but if they ask journal entry we will be writing like this okay uh, and again i tell you there is as such no books of accounts of cfs to cfs mein koi journal entry hota nahi hai. practically there is no journal entry of cfs it is just for understanding purpose it is given practically it went down from the stock 20 rupees automatically wahan pe increase decrease in stock mein the effect will come now, accounting for dividend proposed for no entry when it is declared retained earnings to dividend payable. It is not PNL to dividend payable, it is retained earnings to dividend payable, and when you pay, it's dividend payable to bank. Now, uh, now, what is the entry for dividend received by parent? Parent is getting dividend from subsidiary. Now, in your NDAs, all the dividends go where? In your NDAs, the dividend income always goes where? PN. There's nothing called as pre acquisition yeah. pre acquisition dividend. There's nothing called as pre acquisition dividend. Nothing goes to investment account. All your investment income, dividend income, will always go in PN. So you will recognize the dividend in PNL when? One, you have a right to receive dividend. Right to receive is established when it is declared. It's probable that future economic benefits will flow to you and the amount can be measured. Relax. Three conditions. Fine. Right to receive is basically through AGM. All dividend income will go to PNL. Nothing goes in investment account. There's nothing called as pre acquisition dividend. Now, how what is the effect when we are preparing a consolidated balance sheet? Imagine subsidiary has paid some dividend. So, in working note 1, remember we are analyzing the reserves and surplus of subsidiary. In your working note 1, when you are analyzing reserves and surplus of subsidiary, what do you do? Profit of subsidiary before dividend, you bifurcate between pre and post. I repeat, which profit? Profit of subsidiary before dividend. If they already declared dividend, the closing PNL is after dividend. Closing PNL is? After dividend. How do I get the profit before dividend? When I am comparing opening closing, that is after dividend, add back dividend. So, profit before dividend you bifurcate in pre and post and dividend you deduct in the period in which it is declared. Okay, Date of declaration falls in pre, deduct in pre. Date of declaration falls in post, deduct in post. Okay, How to account for dividend? When we are preparing a consolidated balance sheet, working note number one, subsidiary's profit before dividend is to be bifurcated in pre and post and then the dividend, if the date of declaration falls in pre, deduct in pre, if the date of declaration falls in post, deduct in post, taken.
Now, if parent has declared dividend but not recorded, parent has declared dividend, they don't record, so we have to record. Okay, what is the entry for dividend? Retained earnings to dividend payable. Now, parent had not recorded. Can I say it's parent's dividend? So, retained earnings of parent, working note, 4. And dividend payable will appear under your liabilities, other financial liabilities. Okay, if subsidiary has declared dividend but not recorded, subsidiary has declared but not recorded, again, so we will have what? Retained earnings to dividend payable, subsidiary ka. Subsidiary is coming in working note, 1. Okay, sir, so where I should take it? In the period in which the date of declaration falls. If date of declaration falls in pre, deduct in pre. Date of declaration falls in post, deduct in post. Okay, subsidiary has declared dividend, parent has not recorded. Subsidiary declared dividend. Can I say parent will have a dividend income? So, sub parent has to record dividend income. Parent has to record dividend income. So, entry will become dividend receivable to PNL. Okay, so parent has to record dividend receivable comes in balance sheet to PNL. PNL will be working note 4. Parent did not record, parent is record. Now, one more thing dividend receivable of parent and dividend payable of subsidiary will get knocked off. Mutual indebtedness. Dividend receivable of parent, dividend payable of subsidiary gets knocked off. In your balance sheet, which dividend payable appears? Dividend payable of parent. Parent declared dividend that is payable to someone outside. Subsidiary declared it is payable to whom? Parent only. But a subsidiary's dividend which is payable to NCI, that will also appear in consolidated balance sheet. It will not appear under NCI. Reason, once you declare a dividend, can I say dividend has to be paid within 30 days? Once declared, it has to be paid within 30 days. So, dividend payable of subsidiary related to NCI will appear as dividend payable in CFS, not under NCI. Okay. So, dividend payable in CBS will represent two things, dividend payable of parent and dividend payable of subsidiary relating to NCI. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Now, this question is subsidiary is holding shares of parent. Now, subsidiary holding shares of parent is called as cross-holding. Uh, cross-holding is actually not there in your syllabus. The better is we don't discuss. And practically what happens is, uh, subsidiary is not allowed to hold the shares of parent unless the shares were acquired before I become your subsidiary. Before I became your subsidiary, I had acquired some shares. I can continue to hold that, but I am not allowed to have any voting power in parent. That, But practically, this will not be there. So, theoretically also, cross-holding is not there. Okay, now check the question. You purchased 80% shares. For 140, issued capital is 1 lakh, that day PNL is 60. So, can I say that day net assets are 1 lakh plus 60, capital plus reserve, 160. And the profit earned is 20, they paid a dividend 30. Profit earned is 20, they paid a dividend 30. Okay, if they paid a dividend 30, would I get full 30 or would I get only 80%? 80%. 24,000 dividend comes to me. Okay, 24,000 dividend, I have to take it only where? PNL. 24,000 is PNL. Now, they earned a profit 20. Can I say dividend would have been declared after the year is over? Year over, then it is proposed, then it is declared, then it will be paid. Now, fair value of NCI is based on per share amount of purchased interest. Fair value of NCI is based on per share amount of purchased interest means 80% we purchase for 140. 80% we purchase for, so can I say 20% will be how much? 80% is 140, so 20% will be how much? 35. So 35,000 is the fair value of NCI on TUA. TK, and the fair value of net asset is 1,50,000. How should dividend entry be recorded? Whenever it is received after approval. So it's not received now. Whenever it's received in future, how will we record? Bank to PNL. It's bank to PNL will get 24,000. Clear? Whenever it is received. Second question, what is NCI day of acquisition and closing? Okay, day of acquisition, NCI fair value, 35,000. We already calculated. 80% is 140, 20% is how much? And second question is closing. Closing is, so on date of acquisition, it was 35. Now, I need to add their share of post profits. Okay, they earned a profit, 20,000. 20,000 got 20% is 4,000. So, NCI closing will become 30. Nine. Dividend is not yet declared. Dividend will come up in future after the year is over. So, 
So this is 35 on DOA. Closing is basically 30. Okay. Next question, 8th one is very good. Next question, 8th one is very good. Now, you acquired 100% shares of XYZ. You acquired 100% shares of XYZ. Both the company's balance sheet is given. Retain earnings of XYZ. Showed a credit balance 3 lakh on 1st April. Okay, the retain earnings XYZ. Today is 820. Today is 820. On 1st April, it was how much? 3 lakh. The opening was 3 lakh. And you acquired on 1st October. Now, 1st October, so it is 6 months, 6 months. We have a calendar. Uh, we have a financial year so april may june july august is uh, april may june july august september six months is pre october onwards is post okay the opening was three lakh is pre now three lakh became 820 520 520 may half becomes free half becomes post but 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 there's a dividend paid dividend is paid on first november can i say it's already paid if it's paid on first november the retained earnings on march is it after dividend or before dividend after so, retained uh, dividend is already paid. November may pay ho gaya. So, March balance is always after dividend. Now, I told you, if there is a dividend paid, how to account, how do we do it? I have to have a profit before dividend. So, 3 lakh becoming 820. 520 is profit after dividend. Add back dividend. 10%, 10% of capital. 2 lakh. 2 lakh. So, can I say profit became 720? 720, you divide 360 and 360. Done. And now 2 lakh dividend you deduct in the period in which date of declaration falls. Okay, date of declaration 1st November. When did we acquire? 1st October. So, can I say 1st November comes in post. So, deduct full 2 lakh in post. So, check over here the solution. The profit opening is 3 lakh is pre. Current year profit before dividend. Before dividend becomes 720, half pre, half post. And dividend we deduct only in post. Did you understood this? Okay, this is important. Next, uh, the fair value of plant and machinery on 1st October is 20 lakh. Okay, fair value of plant and machinery 1st October is how much rupees? 20 lakh. Now, this fair valuation, can I say it's only for CFS? SFS, mein to still which values are there? Or oh, book values are there? Now, if I see the plant and machinery, can you find 1350? 1350 is closing and they have given 10% depreciation. So can I say opening would be 15, opening will be 15, closing is 1350. Now the thing is over here, we have done a revaluation. Revaluation is done when? On the date of acquisition. On the date of acquisition, the value is 20 lakh. So I need to compare what is the book value on date of acquisition and what is the revalued amount. Revalued amount is 20, book value is not 1350, 1350 the closing air. I want on 110 and 15 lakh is also not on 110, 15 lakh is on 14. So, 1.4 is 15 lakh, deduct 6 months depreciation, 75, can I say 14.25, 14.25 has became 20 lakhs, 14.25 has became 20 lakhs, so there is an increase, how much, 5.75 which I take it in pre, now asset has gone up, additional depreciation, check out the rate of depreciation they had given, 10%, now the thing is, 1st October, now it is coming 20 lakh, can I say now 1st October onwards 20 lakh Q per depreciation should come? Now don't take additional depreciation directly on 525. Reason. Reason. Now it should come on 20 lakh. In your books, depreciation is provided on 15 lakh for whole year. First half, second half. Books may kaise provide wada? 15 lakh whole year. So can I say in your books it's provided on 15 lakh for second half? It should be on 20 lakh. So additional depreciation should be on. 5 lakh. 5 lakh into 10% into 6 by 12. 25,000 is additional depreciation. We will deduct it in post. Did you understood? Don't take additional depreciation 575 into 10% into 6 by 12. No. Books may the depreciation is given on 15 lakh for whole year. The second half also 15 lakh per is given. It should be on 20 lakhs. Done. Next, there is some increase in fair value. Directly increase is given. There is an increase in fair value compared with book value on date of acquisition. So, trade payable is going up, liability going up. Can I say I need to deduct from net asset? 
लैंड एंड बिल्डिंग गोज अप इन्वेंट्री गोज अप दैट आई नीड टू एड तो यहाँ पे टेन लैक एडेड वन फिफ्टी एडेड वन लैक डिडक्टेड so now you have this totals then the bifurcation is fine i'm not going into bifurcation now inventory is still unsold trade receivables are still not settled this point is very important inventory went up inventory went up we took it in which period pre okay is it sold or still not sold unsold theek okay. hai now when i'm preparing a consolidated balance sheet if i add this to inventories this to inventories this are the book values this are which value uh, some inventory had gone up but can i say it is not reflected in sfs so while preparing cfs i need to add it to my inventory so whatever we added in pre column how much we added in pre column inventory went up by 1 lakh 50 so in our consolidated balance sheet inventory 12 lakh plus 364 plus 150 same way for trade payable trade payables are still not settled so can i say that trade payables are still there but in your sfs that trade payable appear at book value cfs mein they will appear at fair value that will be 471 plus 174 plus 1 now the question if if that inventory was sold off okay pay attention very important if that inventory was sold off if that inventory is not sold pre may be added opposite we added in balance sheet like i just go down i'll show you over here okay if it is not sold or not settled pre may if it goes up add if it goes down deduct and opposite effect will come in consolidated balance sheet but suppose suppose that inventory is sold off now If inventory is sold off in post period, can I say in SFS the profit came in post? SFS the profit has came in post. But the problem is in CFS we have already increased the inventory. We recorded profit in which period? Pre. So in CFS we have already recorded profit in pre. SFS me the profit is coming in post. So now I am using the SFS profit only. If CFS me already add one lakh. It's also there from SFS. So can I say now it becomes? Two times so in CFS, I have to remove it from post. In CFS, I have to remove from post. And now that inventory is already sold off. So does that inventory appear in balance sheet? No. So balance sheet me whatever inventory are given are some other inventory, and they will continue at their cost. So if it is sold off, if it is sold off, so what will happen? whenever on date of acquisition we fair value it there will be some profit loss coming in pre if it is sold off or settled in post may period opposite effect will come in post so whatever was given in pre opposite effect in post so pre may 150 added post may you deduct 150 and nothing to be done in balance sheet because balance sheet may the inventory which are appearing are some other inventory they are not to be fair value okay so if it is not sold not settled if it is not sold not settled effect coming in pre opposite will be in cbs if it is sold or settled effect coming in pre opposite effect you put it in post nothing will come in cbs did you understood yes, same way trade payable okay trade payable they say it is not settled so can i say trade payable still remains when i take from sfs it's the book value but in cfs it has to be fair value that's why i added in balance sheet but if trade payable is settled okay if trade payable is settled can i say in post period i would have settled it by paying more money but in cfs we already taken the loss in pre i cannot have again the loss in post so that's why the post may the loss will be added back so pre may be deduct so post may be add opposite and now in balance sheet whatever trade payable appears that is which trade payable other usme to kuch fair value hai nahi so no adjustment comes in cfs Clear with this? Okay, next. Now, H uh, uniform accounting policies. See, parent and subsidiary are having different accounting policies. They should have a similar accounting policy for like transaction and event in similar circumstances. If the transactions are not same or similar circumstances are not there, then they can follow a different policy. Uh, if like transaction and event for similar circumstances there were different policy then subsidiary's financial statement will be adjusted to bring it in line with 
पैर सब्सिडी के फाइनेंशियल को एडजस्ट करो एडजस्टेड फाइनेंशियल ऑफ सब्सिडी विल बी यूज फॉर कंसोलिडेशन नाउ हियर दे गिवन अ क्वेश्चन वेर इन वन इज फॉलोइंग फीफो मेथड अदर इज फॉलोइंग वेटेड एवरेज मेथड नाउ इफ यू रिमेंबर इंडियस टू यू नॉट डन टूडे बट इंडियस टू में देव सेड दैट इफ द नेचर बेसिकली ऑफ इन्वेंट्री इज डिफरेंट दे कैन फॉलो डिफरेंट कॉस्ट फॉर्मूला नेचर ऑफ इन्वेंट्री इज डिफरेंट दे कैन फॉलो डिफरेंट कॉस्ट फॉर्मूला तो इंडियस टू एज क्लियरली सेड दैट डिफरेंट कॉस्ट फॉर्मूला मे बी जस्टिफाइड इफ दर डिफरेंट नेचर और यूज तो यहां पर इफ द नेचर और यूज इज डिफरेंट देव गिवन एंगेज इन डिफरेंट लाइन ऑफ बिजनेस Engaged in different line of business. So can I say nature of their inventory will be different? If nature of inventory is different, one guy following uh, FIFO, other guy following weighted average is absolutely fine. No adjustments are required while preparing CFS. Did you understood? We need to make adjustment if at all different accounting policies are there for like transaction and event in similar circumstances. Okay, reporting date. If at all parent follows a different accounting year and subsidiary follows a different accounting year, year ending is different. What do I do? To so see if there is a different accounting year, the subsidiary has to prepare one more set of financial statement matching the financial statement ending of parent. But what if they don't prepare? If they don't prepare, imagine subsidiary's financials ended in December. They are abroad and we are ending in March. So can I use that December figures? can i use the december figures answer is yes we can use the december figures gap cannot be more than 3 months and one more thing uh, we need to adjust the financials of subsidiary for what significant events and transaction which has taken place during 3 months only significant not the normal sale purchase significant events and transaction which has taken place during that 3 months we need to adjust their financials and the adjusted financials of subsidiary will be used for the purpose of consolidation acha now question uh, imagine subsidiary's year is over subsidiary's year is over in march uh, sorry in december they have some collection which is going to come not in this january next january year ended in december not in this january but next january can i say after 12 months so they would have shown it as non current but now for cfs purpose the year ending we have taken is march so should that liability still appear as non current in cfs answer is no for cfs purpose you need to see the year ending of group group year ending taken is march so if the group year ending is taken of march then that is to be realized in next january can i say within 12 months it will be shown as current so in sfs of subsidiary it will be non current but in your cfs it will be current okay now changes in proportion of nci what is this changes in proportion of nci imagine you were having 80% out of 80% you sold 20% can i say still you have a control control was there control is there or you owed 80% you plus acquired 10 so can i say now it became control was there control is there this is called as change in proportion of nci only this thing only this thing yahan pe the profit loss goes directly in other equity here the profit loss goes directly in retained earnings it will not go in your pnl it will not go in your oci directly in other equity when there is a change in proportionate interest okay so whenever there is a change in proportionate interest imagine you sold okay if you sold something can i say i'll get money i sold i'll be getting money now If you hold eighty percent, or if you hold sixty percent, how much assets and liabilities you have to include? Hundred. So it doesn't matter if I hold eighty, if I hold sixty. Eighty percent, me I had hundred percent assets liability. Now also I should have hundred percent asset liability. Okay, control was there, control is there. So don't change goodwill capitalism. So assets will remain same, liability remain same, goodwill capitalism same. Only changes NCI. So you received something. Opposite, what goes up? NCI goes up. Difference you take it directly in other equity, other equity, not in PNL. ठीक है? तो when I'm selling, I'll get money. NCI increases. तो bank debit to NCI difference goes in other equity. Okay. When I'm purchasing extra ten percent, when I'm purchasing extra ten percent, so what happens? NCI will go down, and my money will go out. NCI goes down. NCI liability, na? Credit balance. It will go down. NCI debit. 
टू बैंक डिफरेंस विल गो इन अदर इक्विटी अंडरस्टूड दिस विल बी रिकॉग्नाइज डायरेक्टली इन इक्विटी ओके नाउ पे टेंशन ओवर हियर क्वेश्चन नंबर इलेवन यू ऑलरेडी हैड सेवेंटी परसेंट एनसीआई इज थर्टी परसेंट बेस्ड ऑन दैट एनसीआई अपीयर्स थर्टी परसेंट एनसीआई इज हाउ मच सिक्सटी नाउ यू अक्वायर अनदर टेन ओके इफ यू अक्वायर अनदर टेन हाउ मच यू हैड सेवेंटी तो द प्रपोर्शनेट कैरिंग अमाउंट ऑफ एनसीआई Okay, this is NCI on DOA. Actually, this is not NCI on DOA. NCI was sixty. Today, the NCI in balance sheet is ninety. Okay, thirty percent is ninety. How much you are acquiring? Ten. So can I say that much NCI goes down? Thirty percent was ninety. Now NCI will go down by ten percent. So can I say NCI will go down by thirty rupees? Okay, the NCI goes down by thirty. NCI debit thirty. How much did I pay? Thirty-two. Extra two will be debited directly in. Other equity. So entry is NCI goes down by thirty. I paid thirty-two. Two goes in other equity. Clear with this? And now the new balance sheet will be prepared. Next, you sell twenty percent in a wholly owned subsidiary. If I sell twenty percent, can I say I am getting money? So bank debit is how much? Hundred. Now NCI goes up. Okay. Now question: NCI goes up how much? I need to see net assets of today. I have to see what net assets of today. Now, question: If you remember, if NCI is at proportionate net asset, goodwill is only ours. But if NCI is at fair value, goodwill is theirs and ours both. Yada ya? Okay. Now, if they are at proportionate net asset, it is called partial goodwill method. If they are at fair value, NCI is at fair value, it is called as full goodwill method. Okay. And if question is silent, we assume it's full goodwill method. Question is silent, is we assume what? So goodwill is ours also, theirs also. Did you understood? So now twenty percent net asset will belong to them. Net asset is three hundred, including goodwill sixty five. Okay. If I assume it's a full goodwill method, if I assume it's a full goodwill method, so can I say they will also have a share in goodwill? What is the net asset including goodwill? Three hundred. Three hundred twenty percent. What is three hundred twenty percent? Sixty. NCI will come in. How much? Sixty. How much I got? Hundred forty will go in your other equity. Okay, now just see this line. How much increase in NCI? Increase in NCI is based on proportional net asset today. If full goodwill method is there, NCI appears at net asset plus their share of goodwill. So I'll take net asset including goodwill. But under partial goodwill method, goodwill is only ours. So NCI is share only in other net asset. Then I'll take the net asset excluding goodwill. But if question is silent, we assume it is full goodwill. Clear? Okay. Next question thirteen. Amla Limited purchase hundred percent subsidiary for ten lakh. Fair value is eight lakh that time. Now the parent sold forty percent investment to outside investors for how much rupees? Nine lakh. Okay, and they still have sixty percent controlling interest today. Today the net assets are eighteen lakh, sixteen and two goodwill. Okay, so today the net asset is eighteen lakh. How much are we selling? Forty percent. NCI will come up. Today net asset is eighteen, including goodwill. Usme forty percent. Eighteen ka forty percent, seven point two, and we sold it at nine lakh. The so bank debit nine, NCI comes at seven twenty. One eighty is the profit which will go in other equity. Next complete disposal. We'll just finish off this unit. Now complete disposal. Me, if I sell off my subsidiary fully, so what is there in my books? Assets, liabilities, NCI, goodwill, capital is a whatever we have in our books that all will go out. And what we are getting? Cash. We be sold now. We get a. Cash and the difference will go in PL. Only one thing goes in other equity. What is one thing going in other equity? Change in proportion of NCI. Control was there. Control is there. That's only thing going in other equity. Everything else will go in PL. Okay. So in your SFS, investment goes away. We get some money. Difference is profit or loss. SFS. In your CFS, we don't have investments. What do we have? 
asset goes away, liability goes away, NCI goes away, cap, goodwill capital reserve goes away and we got some money. Difference is profit loss. If I see from journal entry angle, net asset, asset was debit balance, it goes away, credit. NCI was credit balance, it goes away, debit. Okay, goodwill was debit balance, it goes away, credit. Capital reserve was credit balance, it goes away, debit. Cash we are getting, it's debit and difference goes in here, profit or loss. Okay, next, partial disposal of subsidiary. Partial disposal. Now, partial disposal may give many cases. Imagine out of 80%, you sold 20. So, can I say earlier it was subsidiary, still it remains subsidiary. So then it will be accounted as change in proportion of NCI, which we already did. Second, partial may after sale it become associate. Okay, so earlier it was subsidiary. So, assets, liability, NCI, goodwill, capitalism was there. But now if it becomes associate. Remember, associate ka assets and liabilities don't come. What comes? Only investments. So, do one thing. That all, assets, liability, NCI, goodwill, capital reserve, you remove. You got some money because you sold 40%. And for remaining 40%, what will come in? Investment will come in at today's fair value. Investment will come in at today's fair value. Difference is profit loss which goes in PFF. So check over here. I check the journal entry. Net asset goes away, credit. NCI goes away, debit. Goodwill goes away, credit. Capital reserve goes away, debit. We got some cash. Remaining 40% will appear as investment. At which value? Today's fair value. And the difference is profit or loss. Did you understood? Okay. This is after sale, it becomes associate or JV. So it will appear at today's fair value investment. And now onwards, equity method will be followed. What is equity method? Share in post profit will be added. Okay, after disposal, it is neither associate nor subsidiary. Out of 80%, you sold 70. So, can I say now only 10%? So, 10% becomes a normal investment. Okay, how do I account? So, earlier it was subsidiary. Now, just I have 10%. Net asset goes away, goodwill capitalism goes away, NCI goes away, we get some cash and normal investment will be there now. Normal investment, that investment will appear at today's fair value. But now it's a normal investment. Now onwards, it is accounted as per in days 1 on. So, this B and C ka accounting is as such same on the date of disposal. Uh, B may, it is still associate, so now onwards equity method. C may, now it is a normal investment, so now onwards it will be in day as 1 0. Clear with this? Okay. Question 14 is fine. Come to 15 is also fine. Now, I come to the 17th question. You have a number of wholly owned subsidiary. Number of wholly owned subsidiaries are there. And this is your consolidated financial. And in this, how much is the value coming from a subsidiary called as S? You have a number of wholly owned subsidiary. Consolidated may all subsidiaries ke amount are there. In this, how much is amount coming from S? Now, what happened? You sold 100% of S. If you sold 100% of S, can I say this assets, liabilities of S, goodwill capitals of S, everything will go out. NCI of S goes out and we get some what? Cash. We get cash. Difference will go in your profit or loss. So, this is basically NCI was anyway 0. Why NCI was anyway 0? 100%. So, sale we got this. Net asset including goodwill going away is 2560. Difference recognized in PL. Fine. Next. Okay. This is a good question. Uh, as at uh, beginning of current year, you hold 90%. Okay, out of 90%, how much you are selling? 70%. Okay, so now what happens? Net assets will go away, NCI goes away, goodwill capital reserve goes away, you get some money and investment will come in at today's fair value. Difference goes in profit or loss. Now, that is done. So, this is simpler part. Now, second part is, uh, whenever it was a subsidiary, Whenever it was our subsidiary, so can I say that subsidiary ka profit was included in us? Now, subsidiary had a profit in normal PNL, wo PNL mein tha. subsidiary had some profit in OCI, so that was there under OCI also, and usme accumulated OCI balance also might be there. We removed assets and liabilities. Did we remove the reserves? We removed assets and liability. Now, profit, our share of profit was there in our reserves. 
वो ठीक है दैट विल रिमेन बट द प्रॉब्लम इज अवर शेयर ऑफ प्रॉफिट इफ इट इज देयर इन रिजर्व बट इफ इट वॉज ओसीआई वाला प्रॉफिट तो कैन इट्स देयर इन ओसीआई रिजर्व इफ सब्सिडरी सोल्ड ऑफ कैन से दैट नीड्स टू बी रिमूव ओके चेक ओवर हियर तो डेट इंस्ट्रूमेंट थ्रू ओसीआई वॉज देयर टोटल ट्वेल्व उसका एफ बी टी ओसीआई रिजर्व हाउ मच इज एफ बी टी ओसीआई रिजर्व सिक्स ग्रुप बट हा सब्सिडरी का प्रॉफिट नाइनटी परसेंट बिलोंग टू मी कैन से टेन परसेंट बिलोंग टू एनसीआई तो सिक्स करोर में से इफ यू सी ओवर हियर 90% of above reserves are included in your equity balance 10% related to nci was there under nci so how much is there under your oci reserve under your other equity 5.4 now debt instrument through oci is item reclassified to pnl debt instrument is item reclassified to pnl subsidiary sold off uska related oci reserve also you remove it so this will be removed it will be transferred to pnl सेकेंड नेट डिफाइंड बेनिफिट लायबिलिटी उसका रिलेटेड मेजरमेंट लॉस इज थ्री थ्री में से टेन परसेंट इज गॉन टू एनसीआई अवर शेयर इज टू पॉइंट सेवन टू पॉइंट सेवन ये लॉस था दिस विल गो डायरेक्टली इन रिटेन अर्निंग सो वी रिमूव इट वी टेक इट इन रिटेन अर्निंग रिटेन अर्निंग विल बी डेबिटेड दिस लॉस विल बी क्रेडिट इक्विटी इंस्ट्रूमेंट थ्रू ओसीआई उसका रिलेटेड ओसीआई रिजर्व इज फोर क्रो टेन परसेंट बिलोंग टू एनसीआई अवर इज थ्री पॉइंट सिक्स This item not reclassified to PNL. This 3.6 I have to transfer to retain earning. Retain earning will be credited. Then we have this foreign currency translation reserve. Its item reclassified to PNL. Out of it, 10% was NCI 7.2. 7.2 will be transferred where to PNL. PNL will get credit. So check over here. Here. First. This goes to PNL. This one goes to retain earning. Third one goes to retain earning. Fourth one is going to PNL. Any doubts? Anybody till now? We keep it up till here. Okay. The remaining is to be done tomorrow. Loss of NCI will start tomorrow. Yes, please. That should have actually gone to retain earning that time only. but they said specifically that reserve was created that's why we will be transferring to retain earning right now otherwise that would have gone to retain earning on that time so okay, just one sentence for you uh, see the problem is uh, many times some things which happened in past we are not able to come out of it and we constantly try to think about that thing only so simply sentence it says is like you need to focus on the road in front of you if you are constantly looking in a rear view mirror it's going to make you crash you're driving and you're not focusing on road ahead but you're constantly looking back that is going to make you crash so just focus on things which are there with you what happened in past is gone you can't change it right now what is there in your hand is this remaining period yeah whatever remaining period 15 days 20 days one month whatever we are having we just need to ensure that this 15 20 days or one month goes the best one wherein i'm happy with my preparation each day of yours should be such that you're sleeping with a smile on your face and that smile will come only when you are satisfied with your efforts so just make sure you are happy with your efforts everything else will fall through in the right place see you tomorrow bye bye and take care tomorrow we have the same timing morning 9 o'clock to evening 7 o'clock but in case tomorrow it doesn't get over by 7 i may extend till 9 o'clock chalo